<clears throat> Good morning, everyone. It uh, occurs to me that it's uh, Tuesday and uh, we have some uh, items left over from yesterday that we will um, pick up on uh, that has to do with adopting stock assessments. Let me first see if Executive Director Chuck Tracy has any announcements. Thank you, Thank you. Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, just uh, just to give an overview of today's activities, we are going to pick up uh, um, G5, the Adopt Stock Assessments Agenda item. We're in public comment, which we have already started. We've got, I think, about six folks uh, still to testify, and then uh, we'll take up uh, council action. Uh, then we move on to today's regularly scheduled agenda. We've got um, harvest specifications and management measure planning to a just to adopt a schedule for that primarily, and then uh, opportunity to consider in-season adjustments for the groundfish fishery. Uh, then we have three uh, administrative items following that. Uh, the first being an update on executive order uh, 14008. Um, so we have uh, Sam Rauch joining us for that, uh, for that agenda item to uh, give an update on the uh, administrative's, administration's um, progress on that. Um, since Sam is joining us from, uh, from Silver Spring, we will do our best to uh, get that going at one o'clock uh, thereabouts. So uh, to the extent that we have to juggle things around a bit, uh, we, we might consider that um, to make sure that, uh, that we can time that for Sam. Um, then we've got a marine planning uh, agenda item and, uh, and a an update on our regional operating agreement uh, process to round out the day. So uh, that's what's on today's schedule. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back to you. All right, thank you very much, Chuck. So uh, we'll, uh, unless there are any questions for Chuck, uh, we will go right back to um, public comment and uh, we'll go from the top of the list, those who have not yet testified. So uh, Dan Platt, followed by Harrison Ibach. Yeah, good morning, council members. Can you hear me? Good morning. Okay, uh, so my name is Daniel Platt. I am a Fort Bragg, California fisherman and the Southern Open Access Representative on the GAP. Uh, the data monitor stock assessments for copper rockfish and Quebec rockfish in California will be devastating to California fishermen if adopted. In Northern California, where I live and fish, if Quebec rockfish is declared overfished, it is likely that we will have to implement management measures that will put fishermen both commercial and sport out of business. This is not a decision to be taken lightly. I have been around the council process long enough to realize that these assessments are not bad science. I also know that there is data that the assessment authors were unable to use in this assessment because of protocol. I also realize that there are currently no proposed cutbacks to our fishery. However, I am not naive. I have lived with yellow eye and canary restrictions. I know how weak stock management works, and I know if quillback is declared overfished, the restrictions will be coming. We have fought long and hard to get where we are now. For our fleet to lose ground, and more fishermen on science that does not use all the available data is truly heartbreaking. Please remember your coastal communities and your fishermen when you are making this decision. Uh, thank you. I uh, that was my comments that I wrote up, and and I just uh, if I have some more time, I wanted to let you know that. Um, I had a chance yesterday to talk to both fishermen and buyers uh, in the Fort Bragg area here. And uh, what we're seeing on the grounds definitely doesn't support what 
the uh, assessment is saying. And uh, I think there's probably some people who are going to comment after me that will uh, add to that. But I, I just want to let you know that. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. All right, thanks so much, Dan. Are there questions of Dan? Louis Zim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, first, I want to thank you, Dan, for your many years of service uh, on the gap. And so uh, I want to ask you um, how important is this fishery to the big picture in uh, Fort Bragg? Is this a minor fishery or is this uh, one of the major fisheries in Fort Bragg? I'm trying to get a feeling for the economic hit of uh, any of our decisions. Thank you. Well, uh, Louis, in terms of the uh, commercial fishery, we have, uh, oh, probably approximately seven or eight deeper near shore uh, permits in Fort Bragg. And um, most of those are active. And you, as you well know, the uh, the other fisheries, or other fisheries, uh, salmon fishery and crab fishery and um, are, uh, have been restricted the last few years. And, and so, uh, so, yeah, in, in answer to your question, uh, you know, the uh, commercial fishery, yeah, it's important to our port, even though there was only a few fishermen they are some of the hardest working fishermen in the port and they uh, definitely keep our buyers and restaurants and community going. Um, you know, the other side of it is the recreational fishery. Um, but we have a, a lot of recreational fishermen here and, um, you know, they just recently have been moved out to uh, 30 fathoms, have been at 20 fathoms for a long time. And for them to, uh, to lose that ground, you know, would would hurt uh, the tourism interest industry and and also the uh, you know the charter boats and all the money that the recreational fishermen bring into the area. So I feel it's very important. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thanks, Dan. Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dan, thanks for the for thoughtful comments there. I, I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate your historical perspective. You've been around a long time and know a lot of people. You know, the one comment that Louie made that made me think was how important is this fishery, you know, to you? And it seems like in the, in the, in the, in the, the spectrum of all the, the fisheries, whether it be salmon or crab or you, the whole spectrum, it seems like it's hard to distinguish anymore what's important and which straw will break the camel's back because of all the regulations and restrictions and all the fisheries that you all participate in. So I just wanted to see if you had any comment on that and does that, does that make sense? It certainly does, Bob. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, as I mentioned before, most of these fishermen that are involved in this fishery, uh, some of them have, have just bought into it and uh, that was a, uh, you know, mortgage their houses or whatever, but these permits are not cheap. And uh, the reason they did was because they saw, you know, the um, what's going on in the other fisheries and were looking for uh, a way to stay in the water, so to speak. So, um, so yeah, the um, every, you know, that portfolio, of different fisheries that you can move to uh, um, when one fishery closes uh, is very important. And uh, so, yeah, I hope that answers your question, but. Yeah, it does. It confirms what I kind of thought. So I appreciate it. Are there any further questions of Dan? Thank you, Dan. Uh, Harrison Iback followed by Bill James. Um, good morning, Chair, Council. Can you hear me okay? Very loud and clear. 
Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Harrison Eibach um, with Humboldt Fishermen's Marketing Association in Eureka, California, and also a nearshore fisherman. Um, I'm going to be echoing a lot of what Dan said as well. Um, and I really just wanted to be here to let everyone know how critically important these species are for our near shore fisheries in California. Um, and especially for us up here in Northern California, I've personally made a sacrifice today just to be here. Um, I was actually supposed to be leaving yesterday afternoon and fishing today to actually be doing a near shore trip where both quillbacks and coppers were going to be my main target species. But I really want the council to know how critically important these species are. Um, they definitely make up the majority of our deeper near shore uh, species that we catch for our live fishery. Um, and as Dan said, they are critically important for the rec sector as well. I personally haven't been around for as long, but the data modern assessment saying that there's not so many of these stocks, but boy, <laughs> the time on the water uh, down around Gorda and Mendocino and whatnot, uh, there are, they are prevalent. <clears throat> there are a lot of coppers. And as Kenyon said yesterday, there's a lot of quillbacks. And they're not small. We're seeing all year classes, and we're just seeing these giant fish as well. Um, I've made some calls to some other fly fish fishermen that I knew uh, in neighboring ports, including Fort Bragg. And I had mentioned that we're having these issues with quillbacks and coppers. And the first thing they said was, well, how do we even avoid them? They're everywhere. And it's not just for the commercial sector. <clears throat> Or, or the commercial fishermen, excuse me. I mean, we have live buyers that completely rely on these fish as well. And not just in Northern California, but also Southern Oregon. Um, there's a huge, vast area that really, truly rely on the coppers and quillbacks. And as Dan had stated, if there are some regulatory changes to constrain these stocks, it's not just going to constrain coppers and quillbacks. We're going to have some major constraints with all of our near shore fisheries. And that would just be a devastating blow. Um, as Bob had stated, you know, we have the salmon fishery already extremely constrained. We have issues with our uh, crab fishery with lawsuits due to whale entanglement, demoic acid problems, low volume year, which is what we're just suffering coming off of. Um, and if we were to have a blow to our nearshore fishery, I mean, we will seriously lose fishermen. Um, we need opportunities. And it would definitely have a crippling effect to the fleet. Um, and mainly to a lot of the people that just bought in to these fisheries. As Dan had stated, these deeper nearshore permits, or any of these nearshore permits, shallow, deeper, um, they're very expensive, and it's a lot of the younger guys that have really sacrificed a lot and gambled a lot with purchasing these permits, looking for opportunity just to survive. And we really need to make sure that we have these opportunities for a lot of these fishermen um, in order to survive. Otherwise, we're going to lose them, and they're going to try to find something else to do. So, well, I guess that's all I have for now. I'll be available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Harrison. Any questions for Harrison? Uh, Louis Zim. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for your testimony, Harrison. Uh, your last statement brings up the question of what is there to do in uh, Humboldt Bay? Uh, besides uh, the fisheries that you prosecute, I understand that that logging and wood processing is uh, pretty much gone away. 
what can a younger man with a family do in that area? Thank you. Mr. Chair, Louie, thank you for the question. Um, obviously, there's some other fields of work that people can get into around here. But, but the important fact is that we do have a younger generation of fishermen in these northern ports um, and in southern Oregon, southern Oregon and northern California, Fort Bragg, uh, Eureka, Trinidad, Crescent City, uh, Brookings, Port Orford. I mean, we do have some younger fishermen. Um, the vast majority are obviously older and potentially on their way out. But we do have some younger guys that have very good work ethics um, that are trying to be involved and we need opportunity. We do not have a salmon fishery in the KMZ up here in Northern California. We get a little bit of wreck time here and there, um, but we have no commercial fishery. Obviously, Dungeness crab is our big one, um, but we do have ground fish and we have great ground fish stocks available to Northern California, um, which is evident by you know, one of our larger bottom trawl fleets that we have here, which is doing great. We have a lot of ground fish to catch. And <clears throat> we're also constrained by the weather. Um, I know Kenyon had mentioned yesterday that the that a lot of these areas where these fish reside um, are not necessarily targeted and because they're closed, both MPAs, RCAs, but we also have weather as a constraining factor up here as well. In a lot of these areas, we cannot even get to. Um, it's no walk in the park. You can't just stroll down to Cape Mendocino and Punta Gorda to go fishing. Um, so uh, I hope I answered your question somewhat there, Louie. Through the chair, uh, yes. Thank you, Harrison. It, it doesn't take a stretch of imagination to... Uh, uh, to think about the other industry that might be up in that area. Uh, I won't comment more on that, but I will comment that I have spent some time around Mendocino and uh, I saw fishing weather there once. <laughs> it's really a difficult place to access and it acts as almost a de facto MPA just from, uh, from weather. Thank you. Maggie. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for the testimony, Harrison. Uh, you started by saying you, you would have been out fishing for nearshore rockfish, uh, including coppers and quillbacks today. If you couldn't retain those, those species, uh, would you still be nearshore fishing? And if so, uh, what, what other species would you be likely to, to target and to bring in? <clears throat> Mr. Chair, uh, thank you, Maggie for the question. Um, to be completely honest, um, due to how many coppers and quillbacks that there are, I'm not sure that we could really be, in California we have deeper nearshore permits and shallow nearshore permits. Um, if you only had a deeper nearshore permits, to target blacks, blues, coppers, quillbacks. Um, no, I don't believe that you could be really participating in the live fish fishery. Uh, there's not the demand for black rockfish, the same, not nearly the same as coppers and quillbacks. Um, you would have to go shallower in order to target maybe some gophers, uh, cabazon, greenling, other species. But I don't know that you could actually get away from the coppers and quillbacks if you were to be fishing deeper. So if you were to take those species away, um, I'm not really sure what one would do. Thank you. Uh, any, uh, okay, Mercy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Harrison, for your testimony. Um, Maggie's question got me thinking a little bit about the uh, border um, management implications. I, I know that's a little astray from our stock assessment discussion today, but maybe you can um, characterize for us um, 
how many folks you're aware of, um, given you're the, the Northern Open Access rep, um, you're probably a, a pretty um, knowledgeable in this area. How, how many folks would you say have uh, hold both California and Oregon nearshore permits uh, that would be able, uh, for example, to um, not uh, to avoid fishing in California, but to be able to utilize uh, an Oregon permit um, in the event that we had um, significantly different management of our commercial nearshore fishery north and south of the California Oregon border. <clears throat> Through the chair, thank you, Marcy, for the difficult question. Um, <laughs> I'm not exactly sure how many dual permit holders there are for nearshore stocks. Um, I'm definitely aware of some dual permit holders for the Dungeness crab fishery, but it would not be easy for a lot of these fishermen that hold these deeper nearshore permits in California to flop over the line and fish in Oregon. That also takes uh, that increases a lot of overhead. Uh, you would need to find a place to stay. You'd have to move your, uh, you'd have to basically move your operation up to another state. It's time away from the family. Um, the vast majority of the smaller local boats don't travel. Um, there's not as many, it's, it's somewhat difficult for these smaller boats to just flop over from one state to another. It's also difficult because um, you'd have to figure out what your buyer would be doing. Uh, it, it's kind of difficult to just move your operation. Um, a lot of people rely um, on their buyer, per se, that, and whatever hoist that they use to offload their catch. Uh, it's difficult. You can't just flop from one buyer to another so easily. Um, there's a certain sense of loyalty when it comes to in those regards. Um, so to sum it up, it would be somewhat, it would be very difficult. It would, you would not be able to just flop over the line and continue to fish very easily. Thank you. Any further questions of Harrison? Thank you, Harrison. Uh, Bill James, followed by Kristen McQuaugh. Can you hear me now? Got you now, Bill. Okay, uh, my name is Bill James. Um, I'm speaking for Port St. Louis Commercial Fishers Association. What I would like to do is uh, continue on for the moment um, about what Harrison was just talking about. In Crescent City, there's a, a, the major buyer there of live fish is also the one that's out of Port Orford. And if California could not um, produce quillbacks and coppers in Crescent City, the buyer that has a semi truck that goes to um, San Francisco doesn't want just blacks. He would he would skip over Crescent City, and then the fishermen would have to go and take the fish by themselves to San Francisco, and that's an eight hour run. So that's really tough to set up for that. Kenny has done that is um, uh, because I've seen him do it, and it's a really hard on you. So uh, it would really devastate the guys across the city. Uh, going back to other things, um, the quarterback assessment I really think should be tabled and waited wait until we have a full to do a full assessment on it. Um, like other, tests, uh, other folks have said, um, quillback catches are increasing now. There's more of them. There's all kinds of them. I, sp I speak regularly with Kenya, probably once a week, and I fished with him for 10 years until just recently. Um, I've also fished before that out of Port St. Louis for 15 years. So uh, down there, coppers are very important to us, and it's a major, 
um, part of our fishery. It's something that, again, you have to get enough fish of besides the uh, blacks or blues to make it worthwhile for a um, buyer to travel up to San Francisco to sell. The live fish markets uh, in San Francisco and Los Angeles um, take most of our, uh, the, the live fish, whether it comes from Port Over or anywhere in California. And about 50% of that goes to restaurants. So let's just say a, a copper rockfish, a one pound copper or a one, one pup, they're bigger, but let's bring it down to one pound. If a fisherman gets $6 a pound for that fish, the, the restaurant, when it gets it up there in, in San Francisco, sells that, that one pound worth of fish at $24. I know this because Kenyon, myself, and I think Dan went to uh, San Francisco about 15 years ago with one of the meetings and he had a restaurant. So we bought a six and a half pound cabazon out of the tank and we had it prepared for us. And they charged us four, $24 a pound. It was $150 some dollars just for the fish. If you want to raise anything else, it was more. Our bill ended up being, without alcohol, over $225. That's just for three people. So it's a huge markup um, for the restaurant trade. Sales tax to the state of California is probably about $5 a pound um, by the time you get all that, um, uh, all, all the additives that people buying restaurants like like sodas and rice and um, other stuff. So it would be a huge loss to California, be a huge loss to their local ports because the fishermen make good money. And if they don't have this consistent fish, we've developed this market over 20 years. That would be very consistent. They need our fish. And it's, it's a big, it's a big deal for um, San Francisco. The live markets there are usually the cornerstone of a whole shopping center. That's why the Asian people go to those shopping centers because of that one market that has the live fish. So it goes beyond just the fishermen, but back to the fishermen, the small boat vessels have nothing really else to fish for besides near shore, hopefully we'll be able to get out into the shelf and take some pressure off of some of that. But I don't think that when we finally do a full stock assessments on both copper and quillbacks, you'll find that we don't, we won't need to reduce anything. The fish are doing very well. It's just the fishermen are at, at risk right now. So, most of the quill, back to the quillbacks again, they're caught in um, Fort Bragg, Eureka, Crescent City. And we had a whole thing for California, back down by Fort San Luis and Morro Bay. Very, 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 very few. I've never caught one down there. And some of the guys have caught one, maybe two. So it's a Northern California fish and it's prevalent up there, but it really stops about Point Arena. So you're, 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 if you put this into rebuilding, you're going to affect all the California nearshore fishermen for an area that's 215 miles of where the fish are. So naturally, the other um, 600 and some miles is not going to have it in Therefore, you're not going to see the land data or whatever, wherever they're going. So I, I really hope that you would reject this uh, this assessment, both for copper and quillbacks, and put them into full when you have the right data and make sure a fisherman is helping to make sure the data streams are what you need. So with that, I concluded. Thank you for allowing me to testify. And uh, I agree with the gap. Um, and Dan, and we're all we're all friends. So, is there any questions? 
Thank you very much, Bill. Are there any questions for Bill? Thank you very much, Bill. Kristen McQuaw. Hello, can you hear me all right? Yes, yes. loud and clear. Welcome. Great, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. My name is Kristen McQuaw. I manage both of the mothership and shore-based whiting cooperatives. We support the GAP statement regarding the spiny dogfish assessment. We're concerned that there are major management implications at stake for spiny dogfish that are largely being driven by a very uncertain bottom trial survey catchability coefficient, or Q. While the assessment assumes that the bottom trial survey catchability is 0.586, or in other words, covers 58.6% of the stock's population, the likelihood profile suggests that the data is uninformative and that there's actually a wide range of plausible Q values many of which are on the lower end of the score. The SSC identified four factors indicating that a Q value lower than 0.586 may actually be more realistic. These factors being the stocks, seasonal summer migration, the statistics, the distribution of the stock shoreward of the survey area, and the stock's overall availability to a bottom trawl given that they're semi-pelagic. We recognize that the data necessary to reduce the uncertainty associated with all of these components is not readily available and would likely require concentrated research efforts. However, a raw look at the fishery catch data indicates that there may be some existing data indicative of the stock seasonal migration that could be used now to better inform the survey's catchability estimate. For example, we observe increased fishery interactions with dogfish in the winter and off of Washington in the summer. We ask that further analysis be conducted, looking at the fishery bycatch rates to assess the seasonal availability of dogfish and further develop a weekly informative upper bound prior on cue as detailed in the SSC's report. One of the criteria for evaluating best available science is inclusivity. Here lies an opportunity to incorporate readily available data to reduce at least some of the uncertainty associated with the catchability coefficient and ensure that the stock assessment represents the best available science inclusive of all relevant data. Comparable methodology for developing a weekly informative boundary prior has been done before as referenced in the SSC report such that the assessment team would likely not have to completely reinvent the wheel in order to accomplish this over the summer. This analysis is needed now, as there are major management implications at stake. As the assessment stands, we're looking at about 36% reduction in the ACL come 2023. And if you include the deductions frequently taken off the top of the dogfish ACL, which would leave us with about 660 metric tons, we're looking at a 58% reduction overall. This poses a major constraint for not only the directed whiting fisheries, but for all ground fish fisheries, which recently combined to land a total of roughly 1,900 tons in 2018. <clears throat> Since the survey catchability is highly uncertain, yet it is essentially the single most influential factor driving the biomass scale, and the resulting outcome of this has serious management implications, we ask the council to not adopt the assessment at this time, but instead, request that additional analysis be conducted now and brought before the mop-up star panel review this fall. More specifically, we request fishery bycatch rates be analyzed to develop a weekly informative upper bound prior on cue and assess the seasonal availability of dogfish in an effort to reduce uncertainty and ensure that decision makers have the best available science. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much, Kristen. Are there questions for Kristen? Thank, thank you very much, Kristen. We'll next go to Tom Hafer. Welcome, Tom. You're muted on your end. Still muted. 
Okay. There you go. Okay. Good morning, Councilman and Council Chair. My name is Tom Hafer. Um, this is the first time I've ever addressed the Council. Um, I commercially fish near shore and deeper near shore out of Morro Bay, California. Um, I've been doing the near shore for about 27 years now. Um, we have about 30, pretty close to 30 near shore, deeper near shore permits in, in Morro Bay. Um, you know, the quillback rockfish, we really don't catch them very much. Um, when we're out in deeper water, deeper near shore, um, fishing with hooks, we, we, you know, we catch a few. I went back five years on my landings and, um, in 2020, I had five pounds in 2018, I had 3.1 pounds in 17, I had 1.9 pounds. And that's after catching thousands of pounds of near shore and deeper near shore. Um, and then I went back to the stats, the fish and game stats. Um, 2019, there was two pounds land landed in Morro Bay. 18, there was six pounds. 17, there was two pounds. But it looks like 2000 or 17 was two pounds. 2016, it looks like we had 27 pounds total for the year, which was a big jump. Um, and then 15 and 14, there was quillbacks weren't even listed on the report. So I guess what I'm saying is there's not a lot of quillbacks down here. And um, we, we never really, you know, I've talked to a couple of sport guys, sport captains, and they've caught maybe two, three in their whole sport career down here. That's off Peters Blancas in the open areas. Um, I talked to some near shore guys yesterday, deeper near shore guys that hold the permits. They haven't even caught one. So, so, you know, it's not, a, it's not abundant. There's, there's hardly any of them down here. So we don't, we don't have. So coppers though, um, we catch a lot of coppers in the deeper, deeper in, in the near shore. Um, I'm a trap fisherman and a hook and line fisherman. And on the near shore, that's from probably 60 into the beach. Um, we catch the smaller ones, the white bellies, coppers, um, you know, a pound, pound and a half. Um, and we keep them alive. You got to poke them the right way to keep them alive. But then when you got deep, we we catch them, you know, any anywhere from 30 fathoms to 37 fathoms where I fish usually for coppers um, with hooks. We catch all the big ones, you know, anywhere from two pounds to six pounds. Sometimes some bigger ones, but it's a pretty average, you know, four pounders. And it's hard to keep those alive, so we sell those as dead. Uh, but they're very abundant, and um, all the near shore guys get them down here. So, so I guess what I'm saying is that coppers are really abundant, and we don't see a problem with the coppers at all. I mean, all you got to do is um, set a hook and or set a trap, and you're going to get them. But the but the quillbacks, no, we don't have them down here. I think you know the. South Central, which is my region, there's just there's just not a whole bunch of them around. So, um, yeah. So thank you for letting me testify. You guys have any questions or anything? Uh, thanks very much, Tom. Let me see if there are any questions. Uh, Louis Zim, followed by Marcy Uremko. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and and thank you for coming and. And talking to us. Um, 
I wanted to ask you, uh, I know that your area has uh, MPAs and your pro I, I understand that you've been fishing there a number of years. When uh, the MPAs were imposed, how much of the copper rockfish habitat was incorporated into those MPAs in your opinion? Well, um, you know, the MPAs, I was, I was on the, the team for the South Central representing the near shore and spot prawns. And um, I mean, in my opinion, they took all the best reefs. They took Sir, which for years we fished Sir. I mean, that's probably one of the best reefs in California. Um, they took Peters Blancas, La Cruz area, which is another really huge reef that they took. And, you know, they were, there was a lot of, a lot of fish on those reefs and a lot of coppers and, 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 you know, they, they took the Prisma reef down there off, you know, above Anguello and a lot of the Avila guys fished down there and had a, caught a lot of fish in the day. But, you know, it's just the MPAs did some, did some damage to the, to the near shore and the deeper near shore. I mean, we've adapted now and we've, you know, changed our fishing habits. But that was a big hit for the near shore guys. And I think those reefs really supplied a lot of the fish that, that we caught back in the day. There was never a problem. I, I never saw a decline. You know, I'm talking when there wasn't quotas or, I mean, there was size limits on some of the fish, but they, they supplied the near shore fishery and the deeper near shore with a pretty good, pretty good amount of fish. I mean, now we're, we had to move different areas and, so yeah, I mean, we've all adapted. It's what is it? It's been 2007, I think, when the MPAs went in the South Central. We were the first guys to go. Um, so yeah, we've all adapted. We're all staying out of them. <laughs> so did that answer your question? Yes, it does. It gives a pretty good picture. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure. Uh, Marcy Uremko. Mr. Chair, um, welcome, Tom. Um, it's great to hear from you here today. Uh, by way of background, uh, Tom Hafer has been a longstanding uh, participant and advisor regarding California's commercial nearshore fishery and was instrumental in uh, providing advice to us on the development of our uh, commercial nearshore uh, fishery uh, restricted access program. Um, he is uh, one of the highliners um, and has uh, participated continuously to date. So um, appreciate him joining us today and sharing his experience with us. Um, Tom, you may um, be aware after reviewing the draft assessment for copper rockfish uh, that there appears to be um, not a lot of sampling data for the species from uh, the commercial fishery. I was just wondering if you can speak to um, your experiences with um, sampling uh, activities and how frequently you're sampled and how, um, how that process uh, works when you uh, deliver your fish to the dock. Well, thank you, Marcy. Um, so, you know, the, so I don't know how many years, maybe 20 years, um, we've been scheduled to take federal observers on our boats. I've taken one. Um, I, I can't say 20 years. I don't know how many years. It's been a lot of years. I've taken a lot of observers over the years. Back when it was, um, I think it was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Cabazon fishing. 
Um, for a year, I took an observer every every Cabazon trip I took that year. Um, I think it was Michael Lindley. You know, he's a federal observer. Um, but I mean, I was going to mention that 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 the federal observer data is really something to look at um, because they have so much of it, and we, you know, we've taken so many observers on the boats over the years. I haven't taken one this year yet. I was scheduled to take one. Um, I think it was last wave, but I was I was hauled out for two months. Um, but we all of us near shore guys have taken them for years and they have a lot of data out there that shows what we catch and how big and and then you know all the tagging studies I did that showed a lot of data but then also we have the girl at the dock she's not there every time we unload but she does you know I see her a lot when I go by the dock, she's there measuring fish. And um, when I come in, sometimes she's there. But so I think there's a, you know, the, the observed data is pretty good data to use. And it's, you know, pretty frequent if you're scheduled to take one or the girls at the dock. So all that information's being, being, you know, put away somewhere. And that, I think that would really show a lot of, um, catch per unit effort and in the near shore fishery and the deeper near shore fishery. So, yeah, I mean, I think we've been observed well over the years. Thank you, Tom. Uh, any other questions for Tom? Thank you, Tom. You're welcome. Thank you. And Heather Mann, welcome Heather. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Council Members. My name is Heather Mann, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Midwater Trawlers Cooperative. MTC members participate in rockfish fisheries as well as the shoreside and at sea whiting sector off the West Coast. The majority of MTC vessels are home ported in Newport, Oregon. And I'd like to align myself with the comments made by my colleagues both uh, late yesterday and then this morning. I've been around the council long enough that I recall the dramatic actions taken by the council and the agency in the late 90s and early 2000s based on stock assessments, which um, ultimately had significant economic impacts to recreational and commercial fisheries on a coastwide basis. Later assessment work and studies done ended up showing that some of the stocks considered overfished at that time may not have ever been technically overfished. Nevertheless, many businesses were lost during that time and many never came back. So that leads me to talking about, quote, best available science, end quote, versus simply, quote, available, end quote, science. In 2009, NIMS updated the National Standard 2 guidelines. National Standard 2 of the Magnuson Act states that fishery conservation and management measures shall be based upon the best scientific information available. The revised guidelines were intended to, quote, ensure the highest level of integrity and strengthen the public confidence in the quality, validity, and reliability of scientific information disseminated by NIMPS in support of fishery management actions, end quote. Further, the NS2 guidelines will, uh, were intended to strengthen the reliability and credibility of NIMS's scientific information, emphasize the importance of transparency in the scientific review process, and I think this is one is really important, improve public trust and benefit stakeholders through more effective policy decisions. So I don't want this to be testimony to be taken as critical of the SSC. It, it's not meant to be at all. What I do know about stock assessment science is what I have read or learned from people like Dr. Sampson or Ms. McQua. But I do know Magnuson and I do know the national standards. Uh, I do know about public perception of the council and agency actions. And I know very well the direct impacts that occur when fishing businesses try to shoulder the brunt of conservation burden especially when uncertainty is involved. 
I know that the council has the discretion to make recommendations that are different than what the SSC recommends. As you make your decisions today on whether to approve stock assessments for use in 2023, please remember the national standards. National standard one on optimum yield. For example, if you accept the spiny dogfish assessment, it could result in severe impacts and premature closures for the whiting fishery and their ability to achieve the whiting OI. National standard two, I think this is for all assessments, best science. Just because you have science available does not mean it is the best science. Um, National standard eight, which calls for management measures to provide for the sustained participation of communities and to the extent practicable, minimize adverse economic impact on such communities. We've been down this road before, and we know now with hindsight and improvements in science that some of the actions that were taken in the past were beyond what was necessary and people lost their livelihoods. Coastal communities were devastated. I think about places in Oregon like Garibaldi, uh, you would drive through on Highway 101 and all the businesses were boarded up. I still don't think that town's fully recovered. Um, you heard from Danny Platt and Harrison and others about the very real negative impacts that could occur in California. And we know these impacts because we've seen them and we've experienced them. For my organization, the whiting fishery generates tens of millions of dollars annually. We supply whiting to at sea and shoreside processors from May 15th, usually through October. We help processors retain their workforce and infrastructure in order to also be available to process seasonal fisheries. Please remember that one decision and recommendation by the council has more than one result. No decision occurs in a vacuum. If the whiting fishery closes prematurely because of spiny dogfish, the ripple effects would be huge. Many vessels rely on their income from whiting to finance their shipyard work. MTC members use shipyards in Toledo, Oregon, Reedsport, Oregon, Charleston, Oregon. Their crews are primarily from West Coast ports. They spend their money in Newport, Coos Bay, Astoria, Westport, Eureka, and everywhere in between. Fishing dollars turn over many times in our coastal communities. When those dollars are reduced or no longer exist, the pain is clearly felt across the community, not just contained uh, to the direct participants. So this morning I was reading a transcript from a congressional hearing held in front of a Senate committee in 2001. The PFMC chair at the time, Jim Lohn said, quote, problems in the groundfish fishery have far reaching impacts. Collateral local businesses suffer consequences. Many small local fishing businesses are in danger of failing or in, the, in this year or in the near future. And the national seafood supply is negatively affected. It is, uh, it is likely these negative impacts will continue for the foreseeable future. <clears throat> and while economic estimates of the total impacts are not currently available, it is safe to say the total is enormous and they did turn out to be enormous. We don't want to face these situations again, especially after all we have accomplished for conservation together on this coast. Now is supposed to be the time for building back up our robust businesses. We are facing so many challenges in the commercial and recreational industry from so many different directions. We weathered the rebuilding plans to get where we are now. We have weathered COVID. So I ask you to please remember the national standards when you make your decisions here this morning. Please think about the comments, the very thoughtful comments from the GAP and from others. Um, and and uh, as you make that decision, remember that one decision has many, many results. So thank you for the opportunity to comment and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Heather for your testimony and your perspective. Uh, let me see if there are any questions from the council. Thank you very much, Heather. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Well, that concludes uh, public comment and uh, takes us to council action, which you see on the screen there is to approve stock assessments for use in 2023 and beyond as appropriate. So um, this little one hour <clears throat> agenda item, uh, we're, we're now about five hours into it. So obviously it's a critically important uh, agenda item. It's going to 
um, drive the course of our ground fish specs for some time. So let's, let's get started on discussion. Chuck Tracy. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I've got a, maybe a question of clarification. I'd like to ask uh, the, uh, the Science Center, perhaps uh, Dr. Hamel might be appropriate or Dr. Hasty, but um, there's, uh, you know, based on the uh, uh, reports we've seen from the states and the advisory bodies and the public testimony, we've heard quite a bit about, particularly I'm thinking copper and quill back here, <clears throat> about um, the geographic separation of stocks and perhaps some consideration of uh, requesting some uh, additional work be done on uh, at least some of those uh, components. So my, my question is, um, it would, would doing something uh, like that uh, to uh, uh, consider some additional information, whether they're data streams or other analysis uh, or uh, whatnot, would that, would that involve um, uh, a change in the terms of reference? Um, and, uh, and also, um, if that was the case, uh, would that um, have any implications for the, uh, for the other components of the stocks that maybe uh, people currently have less concern about? Um, so I'm not sure, uh, you know, how exactly how the, the uh, you know, reconsideration of the uh, current assessments would work, but uh, I guess I would just, uh, just see if there's any concern uh, from the Science Center about uh, sort of the connection between uh, the, uh, the, the geographic components of the stock assessment uh, and uh, any revisions to one or more of those components, but not the others. So um, hopefully that's uh, something that uh, the Science Center might be able to provide some clarity on. Okay, well, we'll look. I see Kelly's hand is up, but I'm not sure if that's in response to your question of the Science Center. Uh, Jim Hasty. Hello, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Uh, good morning. Um, we've talked uh, since last week about different options for uh, what we might be able to do between now and the September meeting. Uh, one of the options that we've talked about is, would involve trying to assemble over the month of July information that would bear on the question of stock structure, either directly for copper and quillback uh, off California or uh, related or similar species and to then facilitate a, a follow-on conversation with the SSC's Grantors subcommittee at their August meeting on this question of the appropriate or at least acceptable geographic scales for determining stock status. And so I think the, that kind of activity is a very um, purposeful first action that could be taken. Obviously, um, in the in the case of copper rockfish, if the results from the two California assessments were combined for the purpose of about or for the purpose of determining a, a California-wide status. Uh, the result of that would be above the minimum stock size threshold. Uh, there would be a different set or a different scale of questions associated with pullback uh, based on the fact that the existing model uh, in the South already contains all of California. And so the question there would be, uh, is a coastwide scale appropriate for that? Um, and you heard some uh, comments yesterday about the 
concerns for near shore species, the, the transport of those and, and movement of those fish is more limited in many cases than for species that are normally farther outshore. So I think have, at least being able to have a, uh, a broader discussion with the ground fish subcommittee on those topics in August would be uh, very useful for this. Um, for for having uh, maybe at least some clarification on how to move forward on those questions uh, by September. Chuck, did that answer your question? Uh, partially, uh, but but I guess so. I guess my uh, my concern lies with uh, you know the possibility of uh, you know adopting some of the geographic. Uh, uh, separation of some of the stocks. Uh, oh, oh, I see. Uh, uh, relative, relative, yeah, yeah. At this point, and then, yeah. So, with that, is there any concern? I, I don't have any there? concern with that. I don't think any of us from the centers would have concern over that. Those models have been approved by the SSC for use in as BSIA and managing the fisheries and. Um, I don't think that there, I don't recall any comments for immediate or short-term modifications of those assessment models. So uh, I think that would be fine. Thank you. All right, thanks, Jim, for that response. Uh, Kelly. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik. I have two questions relative to data moderate assessments. The first would be, I think, a, a question to uh, Chantel or Melissa Monk. Um, my question is, are the data listed in SSC Table 2 sufficient to support full assessments for quillback and copper rockfish? Thank you, Ms. Ains. This is Chantel Wetzel. I'll go ahead and uh, attempt to answer the question. And if uh, Dr. Monk wants to add, that would also be great. Um, of the data types listed in uh, the table provided by the SSC for possible inclusion in a full assessment, there's essentially three types of data there. There's historical length data, there's potential recreational indices, and ROV. Um, abundance and length observation. Um, of these data, very few are anticipated to be highly influential in a full assessment. We would not anticipate historical length data having a large impact on the relative stock status estimated today. Um, and of those data that are presented in this table, I think there's a an important thing to note here that the potential of data sources available for pullback are relatively limited. Uh, uh, Dr. Monk looked into the CCFRP data for us and concluded that there appeared to be too few observations in those data to calculate in the index of abundance that could be used in a full assessment. Um, so that essentially leaves primarily the historical length data, which we wouldn't expect to have a large influence in the model, um, potentially some recreational indices, which also are often highly uncertain and are uh, have lower influence in many of our models relative to composition data such as length and age. Um, and so the data in the table we would probably anticipate a full quillback assessment looking very similar to the data moderate assessment, but there's really limited information there that could be brought to bear to create a new stock assessment. Um, the key data source that really would be highly influential and useful in our models are age data. And unfortunately, none of the data sources listed in this table 
um, to my knowledge, have age data. Um, and that's where I'll stop. And um, if Melissa would like to elaborate more, or if I if I answer the question. Thank you, Chair Veronik. It does not look like Dr. Monk is online, but I do see Dr. Field raising his hand. So yep. I'm not sure if, if he would like to elaborate. And, and I would like to thank Dr. Wessel for, for her response. Yeah, uh, thank you. And yeah, I noticed the same thing. So uh, Dr. Field, do you have uh, a comment here, an answer? Yes, thank you. I was really just going to agree with Dr. Wetzel. I, I think she summarized it uh, appropriately. Melissa did uh, take a look at what was available um, for these two stocks early on in the prioritization process. Uh, she was fairly convinced that the onboard indices and CCFRP were insufficient for quillback, but the, there were sufficient data for um, copper rockfish in California in both of these regions uh, to uh, informed a model. Uh, we did not, she did not look closely at the ROV data. So I would uh, say, I, but I would defer to Dr. Wetzel on her thoughts and comments on that. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly, did you have a second question? I did, thank you, Chair Gorelnik. I believe this question is probably best answered by John DeVore, but would would also leave it open if there are others who uh, would want to weigh in. I, I'm looking at CDFW report one, page two, and I'll let folks get that open. Um, I'm looking specifically at the third full paragraph, and it is the very first sentence that says, CDF and W would also like to highlight that analysis of length-based data moderate assessments. Sorry, hold on. CDF and W would like to highlight that analysis of length-based data moderate assessments was not completed during last year's methodology review, and a number of outstanding issues are slated for review by the Groundfish Subcommittee in the winter of 2021. So my question to, to John is, if he could just elaborate on what methods were previously reviewed, how that might influence our understanding of the current assessments, and then what the plan is for that groundfish subcommittee meeting in winter 2021. Um, okay, thank you for the question, Kelly. Um, when these these uh, new length-based as assessment methods were in, endorsed. Uh, it was recognized that there are uh, some outstanding questions that, that still need to be resolved. Um, and we'll uh, potentially be starting that discussion uh, this winter when we do our assessment process, uh, post-assessment process review, otherwise known as the post-mortem review. Um, but these, uh, these potential uh, pieces of um, or discussion items include uh, treatment of recruitment and estimating recruitment deviations, how you uh, would might best do that with these models. Uh, this concept of ensemble modeling, which um, was, was spoken to uh, earlier, um, uh, incorporation or, or considerations for incorporation of fishery dependent indices. And in that discussion, it was um, noted that uh, this could be uh, particularly important for the applicability to nearshore uh, species stock assessments. Um, they're considering for the next terms of reference on these methods, making sure that there's a section in the assessment that documents the potential data sources that aren't used. And then uh, finally, the, uh, um, the length and timing of a groundfish subcommittee review that should be put towards, uh, you know, in the future towards uh, these types of assessment reviews. So um, those, those points are all sort of teed up for uh, future discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly and John. Further discussion here? I know there's more. 
Marcy Remco. Yes, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you um, for the opportunity for a little more Q and A um, on these uh, points with the Science Center. Um, in some sidebar discussions over the last week, um, it's my understanding that uh, the ability of the Science Center um, is extremely limited in terms of what it can do on the timeline necessary um, for considering um, additional work both in August or possibly at the mop-up uh, later in September. Um, but I'm, I'm mindful that our specifications process is very long and we aren't actually adopting final specifications until next June. Um, I am just wondering, um, I know that the assessors certainly want a long time to do a good job. Um, and we've certainly heard um, overwhelming advice to proceed with full assessments on these stocks. Um, so I'm just hoping that somebody can speak to the question of whether or not um, we could consider embarking on full assessments for these stocks straight away um, in time to inform us uh, for final adoption of the specifications next June. And that question is to the Science Center. Uh, I see John DeVore has his hand up. Go ahead, John. Well, I, I do think you need to hear from the Science Center on their uh, capacity and ability to um, quickly do a full assessment. Uh, we've heard a little bit about that, but it's best you hear from them. But I do want to point out that um, when we have done, we haven't done it much because we learned our lesson when we do out of cycle assessments it's really disruptive to the specs process. I mean, uh, the, the way the statutory requirements are that uh, when you get an en endorsement that indicates a stock is below the minimum stock size threshold and, and, and that sort of thing, or if the new redone assessment still indicates that, um, you've got two years to develop, uh, to have a rebuilding plan implemented. And if you don't do that in synchrony with the rest of the specifications, you lose a lot because these rebuilding plans, of course, don't just um, concern access to the sp species that are um, part of that plan, but also co-occurring species and other fisheries. You know, the ground fish fishery is, uh, a mixed stocks fishery, as you all know, and there's a lot of uh, connections there that um, need to be explored in a specs process when you're developing a rebuilding plan. So it's it turns out to be really disruptive. And it, even if you were to cleave off the uh, rebuilding plan development from the specs process, a lot of the effects and whatnot are, are still going to be felt um, in other sectors of the fishery and other communities, and you don't really get a good picture there. So I'm very concerned about out of cycle assessments in general because of that. And I'll, I'll just leave it there. And, and I do think the more important uh, discussion is the one to be had with the Science Center. Uh, Jim Hasty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I'm, on the one hand, I'm, I'm very hesitant to volunteer uh, our staff to dive back into trying to create full assessments for uh, species in, in the way that would be envisioned by the SSC recommendation in particular, which would be to uh, consider something as close to a full assessment for all areas along the coast of these species, which was a recommendation for the next full cycle. I don't believe that there is sufficient additional information uh, 
available for Quillback to merit uh, over the winter assessment activity. I mean, the one the one issue that could potentially affect uh, the results of that assessment to some degree would be if we had age data from the for Quillback from California. Uh, you may recall mention of the fact that the growth curve for California had to be borrowed from the Oregon area because there just were in, an insufficient number of ages that were available for California. I don't have any idea whether that situation could be addressed between now and say October. Uh, one of the challenges, and I think the first three public commenters today uh, spoke to the importance of the live fish fishery uh, for both of these species in Northern California. And uh, it, one of the challenges we've had on the commercial side to getting otoliths is that those fish lose a lot of value when uh, they're killed and and removing otoliths will kill them. And as a result of that, um, and the fact that providing those samples is voluntary uh, in California, uh, we just don't get the ages from there. Um, we don't, we haven't been getting any ages to speak of, but certainly no routinely collected ages from the recreational fishery in California. And so if we could remedy that, that would at least provide some uh, additional information on growth. So um, it might be possible to run that through the existing model quickly and evaluate whether there was an opportunity for that to have an impact. Probably the one area where there would be enough additional information to warrant considering a full approach would be in the Southern California copper assessment. There, there were efforts by the staff to examine the potential impact of including uh, some of those recreational CPUE time series, at least uh, up to the prior assessment in 2013. And those were presented to the Grand Fish Subcommittee last Tuesday. Interestingly, inclusion of those did not dramatically change the, the steepness of the status decline in the 70s and 80s. Uh, it would be possible that extending those time series from 2012 up through the present uh, could provide greater increase in the biomass. So that's something that we could look at. I would not favor attempting to conduct a, a, a single coastwide assessment. Um, the point was made yesterday uh, by John Budrick that one of the challenges when you use more um, more of a spatial design is that you can lose precision because you're spreading your data thinner and that you get more effective data when you go to larger uh, geographic areas. Well, that's not always the case. And in this case, a coastwide modeling of the stock would not be able to include the Southern California hook and line index and, and the the length and age data that come with that index uh, are, are important to 
that area because there are very few ages that are available. The only other ages from Southern California, as I recall, were collected by the Charles Array. So um, it would be possible, I suppose, to try to expedite a more of a full assessment look based on what could be assembled quickly that would be conducted, you know, between sometime the summer and the winter. Noting that, you know, as we get into the January through March timeframe, we're also having you know, other competing processes going on for our time, uh, not the least of which is preparation for uh, next year's prioritization discussions, which uh, will likely be lively. Um, so I don't know if I fully answered that question. Uh, I think, you know, we certainly learned some lessons back around 2006 with yellow eye rockfish in terms of being careful that you have some idea as to whether you're going to be able to get um, a, a positive improvement from rushing into doing additional modeling before you do it. And I'll leave it at that for right now and, and we'll be available to respond to further specific questions as needed. Thank you, Jim. Further, uh, Kelly Ames. Thank you, Chair Goralnik. Uh, just a follow-up question for Jim, a point of clarification. When you mentioned the full assessment, were you speaking only to copper? or both copper and coalback? I was speaking primarily to copper because I think that there is, you know, there were more of the historical uh, CPFB lengths. <clears throat> I think it was something more on the order of a, several thousand rather than less than a thousand for coalback that would have been available. Um, and and the there is, we know from 2013 that we can develop uh, CPFB, recreational CPUE index in that southern area. So that would be an additional piece of information that was available. Uh, we would also be able to include directly the age uh, composition data to go along with the uh, hook and line index. So I think there's there's more information that could be added to that model. Uh, I, I don't see that there's much that what could be added. I mean, it would be possible if we can get a hold of the the earlier length data to add that to the, the California quillback model and see what it does. But that, um, if that's not going to significantly alter the finding, then I, I don't believe that justifies the, the effort to, to go through and, and I guess uh, try and have a star panel later on. Uh, there's a possibility that, um, you know, the, the ROV that uh, John Budrick is just mentioning uh, there, as I understand it from John DeVore, before it could be used as an index, needs to undergo further review and acquire a sufficient number of observations. There might be an opportunity if there's an ability to compare densities of quillback rockfish between reserve areas and areas outside that have been subject to fishing, then that might provide some useful information regarding 
scale, but I'm not sure how that would be incorporated directly into an assessment and provide a quantitative adjustment to uh, the level of depletion. So I, I would say that if we were to try and undertake something additional, it would, I would favor focusing on copper rockfish in the southern area and, and attempting to do the best job that we can to incorporate additional data there. Um, All right, thank you. Chuck Tracy. Thanks. Uh, so, uh, Jim, while we got you on the hook, so to speak, um, <clears throat> you mentioned a, a time frame uh, that, that uh, uh, you mentioned over the winter. So, uh, you know, just as a reminder uh, on our specs schedule, we're scheduled to uh, adopt final OFLs in, uh, at November. Uh, while we do have uh, an opportunity to uh, address corrections in June. That is obviously our final drop dead date and that and doing anything that late would severely impact the analysis of the management measures, which depend on having those OFLs. So uh, my, my question to you is uh, um, if that, if you were to do something for uh, uh, copper in Southern California, full assessment, that, we, that you've been discussing, uh, what sort of time frame are you looking at for uh, conclusion of that so that the council might get an idea of when they might have the results and be able to uh, incorporate that into Yeah, I don't, I don't see any opportunity to bring results from something like that to the council before March. Certainly, uh, I, don't, I don't see us being able to do all of that for November. And, you know, frankly, I need to give Chantel some time to decompress because she's led to uh, assessments here that have fully occupied her over the last nine months and um, has, so, and I think just getting all of the relevant information together, plus, you know, if, if the intent would be to hold a review that included CIE, uh, we have to plan those things far enough in advance. So I would say, in my mind, I think, you know, potentially January as a time when a review like that could occur. And then feeding into the March, that will, you know, mercifully nobody who would be directly involved in that is also involved in hate. So, which in that process is really coming to a head in the January, February, March timeframe as well. Thanks, Jim. All right. Uh, thanks uh, for that. Answer, further questions of the Science Center or further discussion here? Motions? Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Sandra, I've provided you with a motion whenever you're ready. Thank you. CDFW motion, defer approval of data moderate assessments today for stocks off California, copper rockfish north and south of Conception Quillback rockfish off of California and square spot rockfish off California. Two, direct NIMS Science Centers to re-engage the stats to do the following. A, 
the sensitivity analyses for all stocks requested in G5 CDFW Supplemental Report 1. B for copper, reconsider the stock delineation used at point conception for appropriateness. Determine if there is any information to support distinct copper rockfish stocks north and south of conception and whether a statewide assessment for purposes of determining stock status would be more appropriate. C, for quillback and copper north and south, evaluate if there are errors in point estimates of annual catch in the catch data streams for quillback, show clear outliers in table one and figure one of the assessment. CDFW has reason to believe these inputs are errors, as described in CDFW Supplemental 2, and which may be affecting scale, as described in the draft assessment. Resolve these errors and rerun the model if necessary. For copper, consider if including additional catch indices are appropriate to better inform catch, as described in CDFW Supplemental 2. Three, ask the SSC Groundfish Committee to re-review any revisions, either at the August subcommittee meeting or at the mop-up meeting, and then for review by the SSC before resubmission to the council for future decision-making. Thank you, Marcy. Is the language on the screen accurate and complete? Yes, it is. Thank you. Uh, I'll look for a second. Seconded by Bob Dooley. Please speak to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, lots to say here. Um, let me get going. Um, this motion, um, what I'm asking the council to do is press the pause button. Um, we need to uh, think about all of this further and rushing ahead with a decision today to approve these assessments would set us uh, on a course that um, there's, th we just shouldn't do yet. Um, in the council's request to um, add data moderate assessments using the length-based methodology uh, to the list of assessments for the 2021 um, assessment year. Um, unfortunately, painted us uh, here into a bit of a corner. Um, the goal of what we requested was to use um, a new length-based data moderate method um, as a, a quick um, substitute for a full. Um, th these methods don't include fishery dependent data um, and so they're much easier to, uh, in theory, <laughs> um, conduct uh, and document and review. And, and the council's goal uh, when we embarked on this process uh, was to create um, a, another tool to give us more information um, on a quicker timeline um, than we might be able to get otherwise if we uh, waited for a full assessment. Um, to wanna, this, this concept is outlined in CDFW1, um, fairly well on page one of our report. Um, it's clear that the SSC had determined that there was enough information to prioritize both copper and rock, uh, quillback rockfish as fulls for the next biennium, but um, based on the high productivity and susceptibility analysis scores and our recent catch uh, overages, of the contribution uh, to the minor nearshore um, prompted um, advisors and the council to um, 
pursue length-based data moderate methods to provide a better stock, uh, better information about stock abundance before the next assessment cycle. So um, our our intentions were were good. Um, they were consistent with the goals of Magnuson to get best available science and use it for management. Um, we identified these stocks as priorities because uh, we had information to work with and because um, there were some things that um, we saw in the catch data that prompted us to, to keep them on the priority list. But at the end of the day, the council recommended full assessments um, for other stocks uh, with good reason. Um, and we were very much aware of the limitations on the, the stock assessors and stat teams and the science centers to conduct more than three full assessments uh, this year. So we did prioritize, but um, then we added the data moderate assessments to the list in hopes that it would uh, get us some useful information um, readily uh, to be used for this current assessment cycle. Well, um, it was a valiant effort. Um, we've learned a lot. Um, one thing that is clear is that these, this particular data moderate method um, may be creating more questions than it answers. Um, I think that is certainly um, worth uh, review and future work and, and discussions on applicability. Um, I think there's a lot of information in the record suggesting that um, we look uh, at what the method for assessing nearshore stocks uh, really should be moving forward. Um, it appears that full assessments may be the path forward um, and that data moderates, um, because they only allow certain types of data and certain amounts of data, um, don't give us the best uh, look at stock status. Um, because of this um, and the uncertainty uh, surrounding the method and um, the, the clear um, recognition that there are other data inputs that uh, could be used to better inform uh, assessments on these stocks, um, I'm asking uh, that we not adopt these today and um, send them back to the science centers for more work. Um, also want to note that um, the method itself, that the SSC subcommittee um, had planned to do more review on the length-based data methods um, come this winter. And uh, as Kelly Ames pointed out in our report, we do um, indicate that, you know, what the, what was approved for use in 2021 was just really a first um, a first review of the method and its appropriateness. So um, there was document, documented need to continue those investigations. Um, and for all data moderate methods, um, there's no clarity in my mind which methods might be better um, than one another. And so um, it does appear that there's a plan for future work um, and I do hope that we'll be considering in that process whether um, it's worth exploring additional data moderate methods or what the best method is. And if, you know, in fact, full assessments um, are really the best and only way to proceed to get um, information that's suitable for management. Um, turning toward the specifics of the copper and the quillback assessments. Um, the issue of stock differentiation has been raised um, by the SSC, by the subcommittee, the assessment authors uh, with regard to um, the line that was drawn at north um, and south of California at Point Conception. Um, the SSC notes on page five of their report, there's limited evidence that these are actually distinct stocks. Um, Dr. Budrick's response about how these stocks were differentiated and his answer of inertia 
um, <laughs> troubling to me. Um, I, I, I think, you know, it's fair to say that that well may have been the case um, because there was a line drawn before, let's draw it again. Um, and I don't think there was very thorough uh, consideration of that question um, in the review. Um, I'm also troubled about um, the inclusion of the hook and line survey uh, in the copper rock fish assessment. Um, I heard that um, it was appropriate for Southern California, but you wouldn't want to apply it for Northern California because it wouldn't be appropriate to apply uh, that survey for the rest of the state. Um, but I, I question um, the value of including it at all, given um, the statement on page 17 of the draft, draft assessment, which notes that um, the index of abundance had relatively high uncertainty intervals by years, likely due to the limited observations of copper rockfish in the survey. So um, I have some questions about uh, what might be done to uh, remove that index since it's not appropriate elsewhere. I just question if it's appropriate at all. Um, moving to quillback. Um, there were questions posed by the stat as to whether the catch time series is accurate. Uh, this is described in the draft assessment on pages 19 and 21. Uh, and documented in the draft assessment under unresolved problems and major uncertainties, as well as research and data needs. Um, their words are that this affects model scale and therefore estimates of sustainable yield. Well, um, in the council process, we manage to those estimates of sustainable yield through our specs process. So we want to be sure that this number is as right as it can be. Um, the SSC also notes that uh, there's substantial uncertainty in the California quillback model given the sensitivity to assigned to assumed growth and mortality parameters. Um, so I think we've heard some responses um, back from Mr. Hasty that maybe um, we can look at other data that may be available. Um, it sounds like his, his responses today are, um, to me, leave open the possibility that there, there might be some additional discussions to be had about what is possible. Um, kind of getting to um, the uh, discussions about um, the, uh, excuse me just a second. Um, oh, the, the groundfish subcommittee notes that are appended to the SSC statement, um, they note that uh, on page 12, for data moderate assessments generally, one approach might be a preliminary review and one groundfish subcommittee meeting, followed by a second review uh, more than a month later. Um, similarly, the TOR itself speaks to multiple reviews um, on page 36 that a preliminary review prior to the subcommittee meeting may be beneficial. So um, I do think that um, those paths forward are available to us and allow um, folks to um, do a little more research about what else can be um, done or included. Um, I, I, again, I think we heard from Jim Hasty that there may be things we can do, um, though there was some uncertainty exactly what is possible at this time. So what that su suggests to me is that pausing for now um, is the right uh, decision and that you know there is no hurry to approve these assessments. I think we've heard a lot about the magnitude of uh, the decision today and the 
foreseeable impacts. Um, once, once we make the decision to adopt and begin the process of managing to uh, the new information, um, that is, uh, at least with this outlook, going to be a, a monumental uh, effort. So we want to make sure um, that we are doing this right. Um, I really want to thank Heather Mann for her testimony today. Um, it was <laughs> amazing. Um, reminding us, us of our role um, here in the council process and our um, ability to make decisions, um, of course, considering recommendations from the SSC, um, but that we, we do have some national standards to keep in mind as we move forward. And I believe that the decision today for the council to be able to adopt stock assessments doesn't mean that we must, and it also doesn't mean that we should. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't even have an ability on the agenda to make that decision. So um, I'm not, I think, in any way questioning the, um, the hard scientific uh, look that was taken in these assessments and the quality of work and the, um, the, the task that was uh, given to the assessors and the, the, conf the confines of the core. Um, the work was um, certainly uh, over a number of months. Um, there was um, a lot of good work done and within the confines of the tour, I, I do believe they turned over um, almost every rock, but we want to be sure and we want to be sure that um, there aren't flexibilities there that allow us to include um, additional data um, that may not have been considered uh, in this initial look. Um, also want to just note that, um, you know, this, this is really, um, in terms of public process, uh, we, we wanted a, a truncated um, review process. We wanted a truncated uh, both in the scientific realm and in the council realm, because, you know, that was really what our goal was with approving um, use of data moderate assessments was to get a, a look and um, have it be informative um, and then move on. But I, I don't think we contemplated um, how we would use the results of data moderate assessments procedurally. And, and there is um, a lot of question on that. Uh, there's been discussion uh, over the weekend. Um, a lot of folks have put a lot of energy into digging into the record. Uh, I really appreciate those efforts. Um, looking forward to hearing more about that. Um, I think at the end of the day, um, folks were scrambling to dig up meeting minutes from 2012 and 2013. and various flow charts that suggested one thing or another and sidebar conversations that did or didn't get into the motions or the minutes and there's a lot to dig into and a lot to tease out and um, appreciate uh, that folks have been willing to uh, start with those investigations and really explore um, what our process should be uh, forward with regard to applications of data moderate assessments for uh, stock status, um, OFL, and ABC. Um, also uh, noting that we appreciate um, the engagement on NOAA GC um, in those discussions about um, application of data moderates um, and recognizing that, you know, the, the information in our records and the discussions that uh, took place back in 2012 and 2013 we're uh, considering different data moderate methods than what we've had um, applied today with um, some of the newer uh, methods that we've now approved, including the length-based method. Um, in any case, uh, I want to also make sure that I point out at the end of the CDFW report um, how important um, it is that we get this right. 
um, we are potentially, um, would we adopt the stock assessments today for species that uh, appear to be overfished and embark uh, on a rebuilding plan? Um, that rebuilding plan would not have the benefit of information that would have been made available during a full star review, um, including uh, advice and uh, recommendations for future research and data needs um, that would come uh, from that week-long review process, as well as with input from the Center for Independent Experts. Um, So, you know, all things considered, um, you know, if we're going to um, approve science that uh, makes major course adjustments in management, um, it's our belief that the science should be comprehensive, compelling, and thoroughly vetted in more than just a brief SSC review and a single council agenda item. Um, where we, we didn't even receive a presentation on the assessments. Um, yes, we had an opportunity for Q&A, but um, this, uh, this, hasn't, this discussion hasn't been adequate um, for me to have any comfort in moving ahead with approval. Uh, so for those reasons, I propose the motion we have on the screen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcy. Are there questions for Marcy on her motion? Kelly Ames. Thanks, Chair Gorelnik. Not, not a question per se, so, so let me know if the time is right for this now or later. Um, but given the direction here to the centers and stat teams, if appropriate, I would like to hear from the center on their ability to accomplish the work that's outlined in Mr. Remco's motion. Sure. So, Jim Hasty or Chantel Wetzel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll I'll take this here. I'm just trying to get my notes visible along with the motion. Um, some of the aspects of this, I was, I was able to research a bit yesterday after uh, Ms. Uremko was kind enough to pass along the draft of this to us. Um, one of the, the issues that's raised in here is the extreme catch events for uh, or, or the, the few years in which Quillback, either commercial or recreational, have much higher than the surrounding amounts of annual landings. And in fact, the stat, Chant, Chant or um, Brian, uh, did a sensitivity test that is reported in the assessment document for the California model for Quillback, and where those high catch amounts in the selected years were lowered to be more in the range of the surrounding time series values. And when the document states that those events are important for the scale, um, I think there's been an assumption that those that leaving those events in has lowered the scale when in fact uh, the sensitivity analysis of reducing those catches resulted in a reduction of the status from 14% to 12% of the unfished level and uh, more importantly a 25% reduction in the F50 uh, harvest rate or harvest amount uh, from the base model. And so that, well, I'm all for uh, getting the data correct. Um, the results of finding that the true catches were really a lot lower than that are not going to 
improve the status determination situation for uh, pullback rockfish. I do, I, I really need to address the issue that's been raised. Uh, there seems to be a perception that we need to do a coastwide or a California wide model in order to assess status at a statewide level or establish an OFL at a statewide level. And that simply isn't the case. We have in many cases in the past added together smaller area models, uh, the results from those to uh, achieve OFLs or status results over larger areas. And I think that would be the best approach for, uh, you know, if, if we determine that a, a California-wide stratum is appropriate for determining status, or at least there are no uh, compelling arguments against that, that we're far better off going with the existing models than we would be in recasting this as a coastwide model. Uh, Chantel has done some exploration of that, admittedly, without the recreational CPUE data included, but as I mentioned in my prior comment, dropping the hook and line survey and the results from that modeling show the entire state of California to be below the MSST. Now, that's not a final answer, and as I said, it doesn't include all the data, but you know, hearkening back to the yellow eye situation in 2006, um, be careful what you ask for, because if you don't know the answer in advance, it may be worse than uh, what you're trying to move away from. Um, I do want to make a couple of comments on the, the modeling choices, because I think the perception that the, the California being modeled in two areas was simply inertia is completely incorrect. Uh, there were considerable discussions among the staff, which included a member of California Department of Fish and Wildlife, who in fact argued for maintaining a separate area south of Point Conception in part because of the additional data that were available for that area. This was not a decision that was made cavalierly or simply rolled over from the prior data moderate exercise in 2013. Let me see here in terms of the model. Uh, Jim, can, yeah. can I interrupt you for a moment? Yes. Um, I, I appreciate your thoughts, but I'm not sure that they're responding to the simple question that Kelly Ames asked. Um, could we could we get back to that? Well, I'm looking at that right now, Mr. Chair. I just, I, I don't feel that I can let, um, uh, and I don't feel that I should be compelled to allow uh, mischaracterizations of the science to persist. And if need be, I guess I can encourage Ms. Ames to ask me about the separately. Um, I, I will say in, in terms, uh, we, we would certainly plan to uh, look at these scale and scope issues and engage the uh, groundfish uh, subcommittee of the SSC in August on, on those to better evaluate um, the scope over which status can justifiably be uh, ascertained. I don't believe that I have any other specific comments on the motion. Uh, Kelly, did that answer your question?
Yes, thank you. All right, uh, back to questions uh, for Marcy on the motion, and if not, then uh, council discussion. And if I don't see any hands for discussion, uh, Louis Zim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Always eager to please and contribute to uh, the discussion as learned over the last three years. Um, I'm going to just switch to my notes here for a second. I, I'm going to try to give um, the council a view from the fishermen uh, on the water. Uh, I did operate and own uh, charter boats and now presently operate a 30 foot sport fishing boat that concentrates on ground fish is my passion. What, what I think what we have here is a classic case of depletion of inshore areas, which is brought out by the uh, information that uh, has been taken from uh, the, uh, the CDFW uh, surveys uh, on boats, half-day boats, that only fish close to the uh, to their ports because of the time. You only have four and a half hours to do this. And the difficulty of those same samplers to go on overnight boats, which actually sample, who actually fish offshore. And, and this is brought out... I, I, Many of our comments this morning about people dwell, uh, spending time in the AIS uh, things that uh, that you can get into. I spend a lot of time in the FRAM data warehouse, and I look at the trawl and I look at the hook and line thing. And if you look at the figures for the hook and line survey, of which there are about 15 stations that catch uh, copper rockfish, some regularly, uh, you can see uh, an illustration of, of what we experienced in the sport fishing fleet. And that is on the offshore islands that are overnight trips, uh, the sizes of the animals are much larger. Uh, I'm looking at lengths of 38 and 40 centimeters. And then the question is, well, no, that's you're sampling shelf species and such. So then I looked at the depths, and and I see the depths um, for this are mostly under 95 meters for reports of uh, copper. A, a few, a one that I found was at 125 meters, and a number are approaching 50 meters. So that's right in the ballpark of what we expect adult. Uh, coppers to do. We expect that the ones on the shore to be smaller, and then you got this ontogenetic movement of coppers offshore into deeper waters. So, so I think that illustrates what, what we have here is we have a, a stock that is uh, pretty healthy. We have the expected results from concentrated fishery along the shore, and then we have the spawning stock offshore um, contributing uh, to furthering the uh, stock status and, and the amount of uh, fish we actually have. Um, otherwise, um, that's the only disagreement that I would have with us, with Marcy's, uh, some of Marcy's approaches, but otherwise uh, I think she's right on. She, she certainly knows a much bigger picture than I do. I had this one small picture, but it's the picture from the fleet that's going to be impacted by these decisions. So. Uh, I do support uh, Ms. Urenko's uh, motion, and I thank you very much. Thank you, Louie, and thank you for your perspective. Uh, Phil Anderson? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. I'll be brief. Um, I particularly agree with um, 
point number one in the motion. I think it's premature based on what we've heard to adopt these. Um, I do have trouble with the first word under number two, which is direct National Marine Fishery Service Science Centers that we, we don't have the ability to direct them. I would rather have that word be request. Um, and um, I'll, uh, but I won't comment on the uh, subsections of the under number two, but uh, I agree with the general thrust of the motion and we'll be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands. So, um, well, now I do. Um, Kelly Ames followed by Maggie Summer. Thanks, Chair Veronik. I would like to make a motion to amend. Okay, please go ahead. Per Mr. Anderson's uh, comment, I would like to amend the item under number two and replace the word direct with request. Okay, is that uh, lang language, which is simple as it is, uh, uh, complete and accurate? Yes, thank you. And looks like Phil Anderson has jumped to second your motion to amend. Uh, any discussion or any comment by you on this? No, Mr. Anderson covered it well in, in his right. uh, points previously. All right, great. Any uh, discussion on this motion to amend? I'm not seeing any. I'll call the question. All those in favor of the motion to amend, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Okay, the motion to amend passes unanimously. We're back to the main motion as amended. Is there any, Maggie Summer? Thank you, Chair. Uh, maybe just, we've, I'm sorry, we've had so much discussion on this uh, and, and I may have lost um, any original verbal clarification, but um, is it, in terms of timing, this, the intent is that this would, um, at the latest, all be put, concluded by the November 2021 council meeting. And I'm just thinking about um, meshing with the specs timeline and, and workload implications there. So that would be a question for Marcy. Thanks, Maggie. Marcy? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes. Um, November uh, would be where we would take uh, action on the recommendations that come from the mop-up. So I defer to um, those involved with the Groundfish Subcommittee um, as to their pleasure as to whether they take these issues up in August or uh, at their mop-up. But my intent is um, that the work that uh, we're tasking here would be done Yes, and, and with expecting us to be able to move ahead with decisions in November. Um, noting that um, we will, I think, be guided by what comes back uh, in front of us. Uh, so I don't wanna be pre-decisional about what we would decide in September or November. Thank you. Any uh, further discussion or questions on this main motion as amended? Kelly Ames. Thank you, Chair Veronik. I am going to support the motion because I do agree that further exploration is needed. However, in response to Dr. Hasty's comments earlier under council discussion on this motion, I would like to hear directly from the stat team at the conclusion of this exploration specifically how we should interpret the results. So um, again, a request to hear directly from the stat team uh, versus going straight to, you know, the Groundfish Subcommittee and SSC reports. Um, I would like to have the opportunity to hear from them 
how we should take uh, this additional exploratory analysis into consideration. And, and Kelly, what would be the timing on hearing from the stat? Well, it sounded to me like the motion includes the groundfish subcommittee review in August or the mop-up meeting, and, and I assume that was intended to capture consideration for workload and, and capacity at the center. Uh, so, you know, if it did occur at the August subcommittee meeting, I would expect to hear from the stat team under the stock assessment agenda item in September. If it occurred at the mop-up, I would assume that would occur the council discussion would then occur in November. Okay, thanks. I just, for my own feeble mind, wanted to understand that. Um, further discussion or questions on the motion? Okay, I will call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Marcy, for the motion. We have additional business on this agenda item, but we've been at this for over two hours. Oh, yeah. So we're gonna take our morning break at this time. We will come back to conclude um, this agenda item. We'll be back at 1025. When I got out of high school, I jumped on dad's rig and it just gets in your blood. I didn't have a problem getting up and going to work every morning. I enjoyed being on the water. And when I found that the fishing regulations were so complicated, I was angry. It is really frustrating to not have a say in what is happening to you. It's not just will the fish live or die, it's will the fishermen live or die. Well, why is this happening, or why is this, or why is that, or they just want to shut it down, and... Am I going to be able to survive? It's hard. I first heard about MRAP from two fishermen. Got a hold of me and said, hey, I've got this great opportunity for you. It's a program that, that's by and for fishermen. I was very skeptical going into that meeting, and uh, very enlightened coming out. MRAP gives you the recipe. Where does the data come from? How do people use the data, the laws, and the steps that one goes through to translate into a regulation? I was afraid of the rulemaking process, but I think they listened to what everyone there had to say, including myself. MREP was really helpful in how I can be an active participant in the management of my fishery.
All right, welcome back. It is 1025. We're on agenda item G5 and we're in council action. So we have had a motion on California. So we need to keep moving. Maggie Summer. Thank you, Chair Grilnick. I'll move us northward. Um, Sandra, if you would put up, or Chris, ODFW motion one, please. Uh, Maggie, I think uh, we're searching for your motion. Um, Sandra says you did not have it. Uh, oh, I emailed it yesterday. If you hold on a sec, I will email it again. Yeah, please email it again. All right, apologies for the delay. It has just been sent off. Um, I will use the pause to note for um, you and other listeners that ODFW changed our email addresses at the end of April. Um, we all have new email addresses and uh, we have found that particularly with National Marine Fishery Service recipients, our emails uh, seem to be ending up in your spam folders unless um, you email us first. So if, if you are expecting an email from us and you don't receive it, reach out in person and we have been trying to do the same. And I should also note that I sent Sandra um, a revised ODFW motion two for, to follow up this first one this morning. Um, so if you didn't get that, let me know and I'll try again. I sent this one just now to Sandra, Chris and John DeVore. It's good to see the magic of the internet is still at work. Amazing. All right, Maggie, you want to proceed with your motion one? Thank you, sir. I move the council adopt the stock assessments for Dover sole, sable fish, and copper and quillback rockfish in Oregon and Washington as referenced below and the stock categories recommended in G5A Supplemental SSC Report 1 for use in 2023 and beyond. And the references listed are attachments 1, 5, 8, 9, 11, and Supplemental Revised Attachment 12. All right, thank you. Uh, the language there is accurate and complete. Yes, it is, thank you. And I'll look for a second. Seconded by Corey Niles, please speak to your motion. Thank you, Chair. Uh, these assessments were all recommended by the SSC for adoption and use and management. 
Uh, table one on page eight of the SSC report provides a summary of the outcomes, describing the assessment type, depletion level, stock, and stock category that will determine the sigma value and a recommendation on the next assessment type, which we will keep in mind when we go through our next assessment prioritization exercise. Uh, so I will, uh, in the interest of time, uh, keep my remarks on each one here brief. The Dover Soul assessment was a benchmark assessment and the SSC found that its results were consistent with the 2011 assessment, although scale was somewhat lower and uncertain. Uh, depletion was estimated to be 79% and the stock has been above the target reference point throughout the fishery. SSC noted that the model estimated depletion well. For sable fish, this was the first update of the 2019 benchmark assessment, uh, found, finding that depletion is 57.9%. Um, and although the general trends in spawning output and recruitment were consistent with the 2019 benchmark, this update assessment increases the scale of spawning biomass and suggests that the stock has never been below the target level of 40% of unfished spawning output. I understand that additional data and improvements in the understanding of productivity, including information on recent strong recruitments, are contributing to the updated status in understanding. Regarding the Oregon data moderate assessments, uh, I want to thank uh, everyone for the very thorough discussion of uh, a number of issues and concerns related to data moderate uh, assessment processes. Um, the models themselves, and in particular, the data available to inform them earlier under the motion on California assessments. Um, here, the SSC uh, endorsed the data moderate assessments off Oregon, uh, and uh, along with a category two. Specifically <clears throat> for quillback, they found that the deplete, the assessment found the depletion was 47 is 47%. There is uncertainty related to the recreational selectivity and recruitment. ODFW will certainly review the research and data needs related to those and see what we can do to fill in some gaps if possible. I do want to note that appendices B, C, and D in the assessment document provide some information on several ODFW uh, programs uh, for possible, uh, pardon me, several ODFW fishery independent uh, data sources for possible interest in complementing the assessment. These data were not used in the assessment model, uh, but they are interesting to consider as we think about scale, which always seems to be uncertain in our nearshore assessments. Uh, in particular, the latter two provide, which are um, the hook and line survey we conduct in Oregon's marine reserves. Uh, no, pardon me. Uh, sorry, I found the wrong place in my notes. Uh, I'll, I'll just highlight for Quillback in particular, maybe uh, Appendix D, which contains uh, information from our ROV surveys between 2010 and 2019. And we calculated a minimum population estimate for Quillback off of Oregon. Again, I want to emphasize this was not used in the assessment, but it is um, an interesting reference point in thinking about scale. The area represented in our ROV estimate is 75% of the rocky habitat between 20 and 70 fathoms off of Oregon. So it's a limited, it's a subset of the potential quillback rockfish habitat. The estimate doesn't expand to unsurveyed rocky areas in that depth range, including some off of Port Orford on the Oregon South Coast or the areas inshore or offshore of that depth range including a deeper portion of Arago Reef or any soft bottom habitat, which we heard in public testimony yesterday may also be used by Quillback. The, all this again is, is uh, pointing to the fact that the estimate here is likely a minimum population estimate. And regardless, it was notably larger than the assessment's base model estimate. There are numeric estimates, numeric values provided in the appendix. Um, I am not highlighting them here because it's not really an apples to apples comparison. But in general, this just leads me to believe that the assessment base model um, is more than likely at least not overestimating quillback rockfish abundance off of Oregon. 
possibly underestimating it. Uh, and if nothing else, I, I, my takeaway from this is that uh, despite the uncertainty in the uh, the um, assessment model and the data supporting it, using it in management will probably result in precautionary specifications. Uh, they may result in some uh, changes to our fisheries, but that uh, remains to be seen through federal and state processes on management measures. Moving on to the copper rockfish assessment, uh, found that depletion for that stock off of Oregon is at 73.6%. There are uncertainties here again around selectivities in our commercial and recreational fleets and in recruitment. Uh, I'll just note that the subcommittee, the ground fish subcommittee um, report that is part of the SSC's report uh, does note at one point that in some case fitted selectivities don't match qualitative expectations for the commercial fleet. And I'll just say that um, we have had a lot of back and forth discussions on what those expectations might be. And I think there's a lot of uncertainty there too. So um, we that statement may not be, mean a whole lot. Uh, and it's another area where more in, information would be very helpful. Again, for this assessment, the uh, there's an appendix that includes information from our hook and line surveys uh, in Oregon's marine reserves. Um, this is uh, uh, maybe a little bit less broad of a data, in, data source than the other surveys um, that also provided information for quillback rockfish. But I'll just note that one, one interesting result here uh, look was that the catch per unit effort trend between 2011 and 2019 in those surveys is generally increasing, although it is noisy. And that's a little bit different than the slightly declining trend in biomass estimated by the assessment model over that time frame. Um, I don't think we can draw any conclusions whatsoever from that, but it's it's a, an, an interesting point to note. For the Washington data moderate assessments, um, I, I will let my colleagues from Washington speak to any of these uh, in detail if they choose after I conclude my remarks in just a moment. Uh, just noting that the depletion level in the copper assessment off Washington was 42% and quillback at 39%. Um, and then just in, in closing, I want to note the SSC this report um, contains observations for consideration when stock assessment terms of reference revisions and a work plan for the off year are developed. And these include many good recommendations that uh, the council should recall when we are at those decision points. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Maggie, uh, for the explanation of your motion. Um, I want to give Washington a chance here, Corey Niles. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Maggie, for the motion. For the sake of time, I'll I'll, I'll keep it brief. I will. I, we will have comments for sure in September about when we, when, when we begin to uh, or November, and 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 there on on how we use these assessments and management. Uh, um, Appreciate the remarks Maggie made. Made. I'll just in terms of the Washington, you know, we have a lot of thoughts about the data moderate um, assessments and and how they are used, um, in in agreeing of, of course that that these are um, following the SSC's recommendation, ready for adoption, as as been touched on before. That's just the the challenge of assessing these the stocks in the near shore is, is, is it's been a challenge and remain a challenge in Washington. You know, we we have just a recreational catch where where um, where as the main source of data on lengths, ages of the fish, et cetera. And in despite lots of uh, concentrated efforts, the data continues to be a challenge. Um, yeah, for sake of time, I'll, I'll one more thing I'll say is we you know we tend to focus on 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 the challenges when we we take this up, but I, I do want to note a send a note of appreciation to the to the stock assessment process overall and i know there's been good working relationships between our our, our folks at wfw and, and nims folks on the assessment teams a lot of good collaboration and discussions going on so did want to note that appreciation and and thanks maggie for the motion all right thank you corey uh are there questions for the maker of the motion 
Is there discussion on the motion? Not seeing any hands, I will call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Maggie, thanks very much for the motion. Maggie Summer. Thank you, Chair Grilnick. I have one more motion to offer. Excellent. Sandra or Chris. Get that brought up. <clears throat> While we are waiting for ODFW motion two, there we go. There it is. Magic. Thank you very much. I move the council request that the spiny dogfish stock assessment team conduct additional analyses to further investigate the West Coast groundfish bottom trawl survey catchability coefficient or Q assumed in the assessment similar to those described in G5A supplemental SSC report one prior to council consideration of adopting the assessment. Thank you, Maggie, for the motion. Is the language on the screen accurate and complete? Yes, it is. And looking for a second. Seconded by Butch Smith. Please speak to your motion. Thank you. The new assessment uh, does include many improvements from the 2011 assessment, according to the SSC. It does indicate that the stock is in the precautionary zone at 34% depletion. Um, notably, the scale of the assessment has changed as a result of revised estimates for catchability for the West Coast Bottom Trawl Survey from 0.27 to point in the last assessment to 0.586 here, as well as new survey composition data and lower fecundity estimates. I, I will refer to the SSC report, which says the catchability value is subject to considerable uncertainty due to an inability to qualify seasonal migrations during the summer when the West Coast bound groundfish bottom trawl survey is occurring, which likely affects the availability of dogfish to the survey, potential net avoidance given their strong swimming abilities and the midwater, uh, pardon me, distribution of a portion of the stock shoreward of the survey area and availability to the survey uh, given it's the dogfish semi-pelagic habits. These considerations provide an indication that a Q value lower than 0.586 may be more realistic. The uh, Groundfish Subcommittee proposed and the SSC supported a research project to better understand seasonable availability of spiny dogfish to the survey. The S pardon me, subcommittee report also noted that existing observer data, for example, from the West Coast Groundfish Observer Program, the at sea Hake observer program or other sources on catch rates during the year could be used in such an examination of the potential effects of seasonal migrations. We um, heard quite a bit of uh, discussion and, and consternation about the Q value and received a recommendation from the GAP in its supplemental report to conduct a limited analysis of the seasonal availability of spiny dogfish to the survey in the short term over the summer, given the significant uncertainty around Q and the availability of data to inform a relatively narrow scope of further work. With this motion, I'm requesting such a limited analysis prior to finalization of this assessment and its use in uh, specifications and management measures in order to try to reduce some of the uncertainty. I understand that this might help develop an upper bound prior for catchability, which might be reason to consider a lower value given the wide likelihood profile and seeming implausibility of the 0.586 value. Additional details, uh, including more on the potential data sources mentioned are described in the supplemental SSC report I referenced in the motion and they're also repeated in the supplemental gap report to which I would refer for their uh, recommendation and rationale 
and they are drawing from the SSE report as well. I'll note one slight difference in this motion from the gap recommendation, which specified uh, mop up. This motion leaves the timing open for the results to be re uh, reviewed by the SSE Groundfish Subcommittee in August and come back to the Council in September, if possible, or at the mop up meeting that's currently scheduled for late September, coming back to the Council in November. Uh, this flexibility is intended to best accommodate the timing and schedules of the Science Center and uh, STAT team members, uh, as well as the SSC and its Groundfish Subcommittee, noting that uh, while the SSC is not named in the motion, their review is, is implicit. Uh, I also want to um, note that the, the motion itself uh, is intentionally uh, unspecific on the type of, of analyses to be conducted because I would defer to uh, the, the judgment and expertise of the STAT team and the Science Center. Uh, but again, you know, my intent is, is only for a narrow look um, at the seasonal availability with uh, readily available existing data. Uh, I want to thank Dan Waldeck and Kristen McQuaw for their testimony, which also mentioned uh, the available data and the willingness of industry to provide additional information if it could be helpful. And also Heather Mann, who reminded us of some historical events and a connection to uh, several of the uh, Magnuson Act's national standards. I want to emphasize uh, that I understand and, and we should all understand that the results of further analysis may not be informative or may not result in any change, but I think the effort uh, is important to improve confidence in the assessment and public trust in its outcome and in our management measures that will result from it, particularly in light of how the, uh, how the outcome may affect fishery operations. Uh, and finally, I, I also want to note that there are certainly other substantial sources of uncertainty in the assessment, uh, including in the survey catchability value due to factors other than seasonal availability, uh, as well as uncertainty in historical discards, female age determination, and others. These are important to look into, but not in the short term over the summer and not part of this request. That concludes my motion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maggie. Are there questions for Maggie on the motion? Is there discussion on the motion? Kelly Ames. Thanks, Chair Gronick, and, and thank you, Maggie, for the motion. I just want to note that I will be vo voting in support of the motion, and I have confirmed with Dr. Hasty uh, that the work described in the scope of the motion is uh, reasonable and, and could be accommodated within their workload capacity. Thank you, Kelly. Louis Zim. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and I want to thank uh, Ms. Sommer for her motion, uh, it comports with my experience. Even in Southern California, we see a marked seasonality in the appearance of, of uh, the uh, spiny dogfish. And uh, also, uh, judging from my experience with CPS stocks, uh, Q is often the important question, and I would like to see that uh, pursued more. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Louis Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and thanks, uh, Maggie, for the motion. Just a quick uh, few words of support. I think this is really important to go back and take another look at this question of Q. And there, obviously, we all know there was a substantial increase in the assumptions about the proportion of the population that the bottom trawl encounters, and given the life history characteristics of the species being more of a midwater fish, uh, uh, in my experience, um, uh, there is certainly some question about that higher value at 58 um, percent. So, uh, fully supportive of the motion. Thanks very much. Thank you, Phil. Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks, Maggie, for the the motion. It's, <clears throat> I really uh, do appreciate that in the, the the description afterwards and rationale. I um, I think I said it earlier. I think this is the nexus between science and management that we you know that 
that gets our industry advisory panels and everyone involved. And I think it's critical that we, if there are large concerns and uh, <clears throat> that seem reasonable, and I, I have every reason to believe that what we've heard in the, in the public testimony as well as our advisory panels, that checking, making sure we get this right is of critical comport, importance. And you mentioned uh, this whole idea of trust, and that is that's important too. And I think uh, we we we're well we're we're well uh, informed to to you know to make sure we get this right and to make sure we listen to everyone. And I don't think we need to rush into anything. So um, I like the approach. I think it's rational, and I hope at the end we could get get some you know uh, settle some of the concerns down and and get to the right answer. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, thanks for that, Bob. Are there any uh, any further discussion on the motion? Then I'll call the question. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Maggie, thank you for that motion. Um, I'm not aware of any further motions, but there may may well be. Or any further discussion on this agenda item, but before I go back to John DeVore, I want to see what other business the council has on this agenda item. And I'm not seeing any hands, so now I'm going to go to John DeVore to make sure we ticked all the boxes. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, council members. Uh, yes, you have. You've um, considered all of uh, the advice you've gotten from the SSC and others on uh, these assessments. And from that, you've adopted uh, the new assessments for uh, Dover Sole, Sable Fish, and Copper and Quillback uh, Rockfish in Oregon and Washington. Uh, you have requested a, a second look at uh, um, spiny dogfish with a, a, narrow exam, a narrower examination of the uh, scale question in the uh, survey catchability, and uh, another look at the data moderate assessments for uh, copper quillback and square spot in, in California. And so uh, one of my follow-ups will obviously be working with the SSC to uh, schedule those reviews and how the process goes on from here with the intent of uh, providing um, further advice on these assessments at either the September or November council meetings, depending on how the, how the plan comes, comes together. So with that, I'd say you have completed all the action under this agenda item. Thank you very much, John. And thanks to the council for their hard work on this agenda item. A um, lot of important discussion, but um, it does leave us about three hours behind. So we'll uh, try to be as efficient as possible on the remaining agenda items um, while being as thorough as, as we need to be. Um, so the next agenda item is G6, the Harvest Specs planning. And I think, Todd, you have that overview? Yes, Mr. Chair, I do have that overview with noting that uh, virtually John DeVore is sitting right to my left. <clears throat> so as the chair noted, this is agenda item G6, the 2023-2024 Harvest Specifications and Management Measures Planning. The council is scheduled to adopt a detailed process and schedule governing the development of harvest specifications and related management measures for the 2023-2024 groundfish fisheries. The process accommodates several important sequential decision-making steps, including scientific peer review of data and analyses used for management decision-making, preparation of an appropriate analytical document as required by applicable law, including National Environmental Policy Act, the opportunity for constituent meetings sponsored by state agencies to solicit public input on preferred management alternatives and full notice and comment rulemaking to implement new biennial regulations. 
All of these steps need to be timed so that new regulations can be implemented on January 1, 2023. Three council operating procedures guide the schedule for developing the 2023-24 harvest specifications and management measures. COP9 details the overarching milestones by month and COP25 details the procedures for the review and council approval of groundfish impact analyses and methodologies that inform stock assessments. Finally, COP19 details the process and schedule for exempted fishing permits. The council should consider the overarching processes outlined in the COPs and anticipated workload when adopting the detailed schedule provided in attachment one. Harvest specification considerations. Amendment 24 established default harvest control rules that are applied to the best available scientific information to determine the 2023-24 overfishing limits, acceptable biological catches, and annual catch limits. If the council intends to implement the harvest specifications based on the default harvest control rules, no further analyses of harvest control rules would, would be required. In the event the council would like to change the default harvest control rule, the council should adopt a range of their ABCs based on their P-STAR choice in September 2021 and any additional ACL harvest control rules in November 2021. And I, <clears throat> final preferred harvest specifications are scheduled to be adopted in April 2022. Management measure considerations. As part of the biennial process, the council will consider adjusting existing management measures that will allow the fishery to achieve but not exceed annual catch limits. These routine adjustments are in part based on new fishery information, such as stock assessments, fishery performance, and the like. The council may also consider new routine management measures that have not been previously analyzed for inclusion into the biennial process or biennial analysis, excuse me. However, the council should carefully consider how inclusion and development of new routine management measures into this process could implement impact implementation deadlines. Attachment one proposes that any new management measures be identified in September 2021 with the range of alternatives adopted in November of 2021. Selection of preliminary preferred alternative alternatives should be adopted in April 2022 with the final preferred alternatives adopted in June of 2022. Looking to your packet, you have several items here. The first would be, of course, a supplemental revised attachment one. And I would draw the, the, the council to this particular document, noting that it is revised only because uh, some of the dates were wrong, specifically years. Uh, in writing this document, I somehow wanted to go back in time and had 2020 in several instances. However, uh, Ms. Susan Chambers from the GAP notified me that I was in error and have brought those um, items to correction. No, um, none of the text that is in the task column was incorrect. <clears throat> Looking forward beyond that, we have a report from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, a report from the GMT, and a report from the GAP. Your action is to adopt a schedule and process governing the development of the 2023-2024 harvest specifications and management measures, and discuss and provide guidance on any biennial management measures that should be considered when the council decides final alternatives for analysis in November. And with that, Mr. Chair, I would like to, if you would indulge me, I would like to turn to John DeVore and see if he has anything that he would like to add to this uh, overview. Thank you. Indulgence granted. John DeVore? No, I think you, you've you covered it well, Todd, um, but I'll stand by if there are further questions and I won't be timid at raising my hand if I have any points to make. All right, thanks very much, John. And Todd, any questions for Todd on the overview before we dive in here? I'm not seeing any, so we'll start with the CDFW report, uh, Marcy. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe Caroline McKnight will be giving this report for us. That works for me. Caroline, are you with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you loud and clear. 
Great, thank you. Um, good morning, council members. My name is Caroline McKnight and I will be reading from agenda item G6A, supplemental CDF and W report one. California Department of Fish and Wildlife report on 2023-24, harvest specification and management measure planning. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife supports the current schedule proposed for the upcoming 23-24 harvest specification and management measure process or biennial cycle and offers an initial list of action items proposed for inclusion. As the process progresses over the next 12 months and new stock status and analyses of alternatives become available, CDF&W expects there will be additional uh, specification, allocation, and management measures proposed for California as part of the 23-24 biennial cycle. Repeal the CalCog Conservation Areas. At the March 2021 Council meeting, CDF&W submitted a report under workload and prioritization process to create a standalone item titled Repeal the CalCog Conservation Areas and identified that it would be appropriate to incorporate that action in this upcoming 23-24 biennial cycle. As the report indicated, the rebuilt status of CalCod no longer requires a designated closed area for the purpose of conserving the previously overfished stock. Additionally, enforcing CCA regulations still requires a significant expenditure of limited CDF and W agency resources. And now with, without a substantial need or conservation benefit, or benefit, excuse me. Moreover, the CCAs include a considerable portion of the Southern California bite and many species of healthy fish stocks live there that could be accessed if the CCAs are repealed. Commercial and recreational sectors would still be managed in a manner consistent with areas outside the CCA using depth constraints established by connecting a series of pre-established defined waypoints codified within the Code of Federal Regulations. Proposed new coordinates for non-trawl rockfish conservation area boundary lines. There are currently no non-trawl RC coordinates and associated boundary lines deeper than 40 fathoms in regulation for Santa Barbara and San Nicolas Islands and Tanner and Cortez Banks within the Western CCA. So the 50, 60, 75, 100, 125, and 150 fathom waypoints and lines do not exist. Therefore, CDF&W provides the following proposed non-trawl RCA coordinates to be included in the 23-24 biennial cycle <clears throat> process and is looking to solicit public input on the waypoints as early as possible. These proposed non-trawl RC coordinates will then be available for use in the same manner as all other non-trawl RC boundary lines, regardless of what regulatory mechanism is used to implement or adjust the non-trawl RC boundary lines in future actions outside of the biennial cycle process. An overview map of the Western CCA within the Southern California Bight and the proposed new 50, 60, 75, 100, 125, and 150 fathom non-trawl RC boundary lines are in figure one. And that is exactly what it's intended to be is a, a, a zoomed out overview of the whole area for just spatial reference. Detailed maps showing the new proposed non-trawl RC boundary lines around Santa Barbara, San Nicolas, Tan Island, excuse me, Tanner Bank and Cortez Bank are contained in figures two, three, four, and five respectively. Figure six contains a detailed map of the new proposed 125 and 150 fathom non-trawl RC lines that would encircle both Tanner and Cortez banks. So just to deviate for a moment, looking at those figures, those are just zoomed out far enough so you could see those deeper 125 and 150 um, and, and see them in their full scope. A tabular list of the proposed new waypoint coordinates for each of the proposed new boundary lines reflected in the detailed maps are itemized in tables one through five respectively. So we've provided in each of those tables the actual individual waypoint coordinates and degrees and minutes. An additional area within the Western CCA is Osborne Bank, which currently has no non-trawl RC boundary lines and regulations, but was requested by CDFNW law enforcement to include for consideration. Upon review of depth contours around Osborne Bank, CDF&W has determined there's not enough area to be adequately enforced, except for the 150 fathom boundary line, which again is included in figure seven and the tabular form in table six. The Eastern CCA is designated as essential fish habitat and close to bottom trawl gear other than demersal seine. However, this does not preclude fishing gears that are less impactful to habitat. Like Osborne Bank, CDF&W investigated the feasibility of establishing non-trawl RCAs in the Eastern CCA 
that encompass high relief areas between the 50 and 150 fathom depth contours and determine there is not enough real not enough area to be adequately enforced apart from the 150 fathom boundary line. And that uh, proposed 150 is also found in figure eight and in tabular form in table seven. CDFNW also expects to propose additional waypoint corrections and modifications to discrete portions of non troll RC boundary lines. Presently, CDFNW law enforcement is working to itemize a number of waypoints that are problematic for enforcement. And CDFNW, CDFNW staff are also aware of a number of industry requests to correct crossovers and boundary lines. A full list will be provided at the September 2021 council meeting. CDFNW welcomes input on individual proposed waypoints and lines in preparation for the upcoming biennial cycle and encourages industry or public to contact um, Andrew Klein at, for any questions or technical support. And with that, I will stop and pause if there are any questions. Well, thank you, Caroline. Let's see if there are any questions from around the table on the CDFW report. Uh, I'm not seeing any. Thank you very much, Caroline. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, a report from the Groundfish Management Team. Welcome, Lynn Metis. Thank you, Chair Grelnick. Uh, I'm assuming you all can hear me? Yep. Excellent. I found the right unmute button. So this is agenda item G6A, supplemental GMT report on the biennial specifications process. Uh, we received a briefing from Mr. Phillips of the council staff, as well as Gretchen Hanshu, Brian Hooper, and Golub Kachra, and I apologize for butchering Golub's last name, of the National Marine Fishery Service West Coast Region staff and reviewed the proposed agenda in um, revised attachment one. In regards to that schedule, Upon review of that attachment, uh, the team supports and recommends the council adopt the schedule as drafted. We note that successful implementation of regulations by January 1 depends on front loading the schedule as described in COP 9 and attachment 1 and on all participants in the process adhering to the schedule. We note that adopting a PPA for ACLs by November 2021 is essential to the development of the GMT's overwinter analysis, which is then necessary for council action on ACLs in April 2020, and then management measures in June 2022. And I meant April 2022. I'm not going back in time like Todd either. As described below, if the council concentrates the regulatory package on harvest specification numbers and the management measures needed to implement those harvest specification, the scheduled goals are more likely to be met. This focus on harvest specifications could allow the council to focus on reviewing, editing, and finalizing management measures in June of even numbered years, as opposed to reviewing new analysis. This more manageable June workload should minimize errors and increase the quality of the harvest specifications package. Additionally, the GMT emphasizes the importance of exempted fishing permit actions, particularly those that request deductions from the ACL, taking place in accordance with the schedules described in COP19, so that the anticipated impacts, the requested set-asides, and analysis align with the biennial process. EFP application should include all the information necessary for evaluation in, in November of odd-numbered years, such as 2021, in order to be considered for final action in June of even-numbered years. Minor changes to sample design based on input from the GMT, SSC, and or council can occur between November and June without impacting these other analysis. On the harvest specifications, by November 2021, the council is scheduled to adopt PPA overfishing limits and a range of PPA, P-star values, ABCs, and ACLs for all stocks and stock complexes. In order to stay within the schedule in Attachment 1, all stock assessments will need to be adopted for use in management before or at the November 2021 council meeting, regardless of the timing of the stock assessment review. Additional FPA OFLs, PPA ABCs, and PPA ACL alternatives will need to be adopted in November 2021 to facilitate the GMT's overwinter analysis. And that's a lot of TLAs, three-letter acronyms in one sentence. Apologize for that. Management measures. Based on guidance from NIMFS, the biennial process should focus on those management measures that are necessary for the implementation of the harvest spec as specifications, as mentioned above, uh, rather than general management or general improvements. Some potential management measures identified to date. 
the proposed schedule uh, calls for the council to adopt a preliminary range of proposed management measures for inclusion uh, in the biennial process at the September 2021 meeting. For the council's information, several line of I items have been uh, pre primarily preliminarily identified via previous council actions, state reports, and public requests for consideration as part of the 2324 specs package. We will provide in additional information on any topics forwarded by the council for inclusion at a later meeting. Currently, these preliminary identified actions for council consideration on inclusion in the 2324 process are, in no particular order, adopt management measures necessitated by results of new stock assessments, prohibit directed fishing on short belly rockfish, uh, cow cod conservation area removal, new coordinates for non-trawl RCA boundary lines off California that Ms. McKnight just described, those, pre those last two, allow additional rockfish retention in the salmon troll fishery, both north and south of 4010, and we'll have some additional discussion of that in a moment. And remove the daily trip limit for sable remove the daily limit for sablefish daily trip limit over an access sector north of 36. Some requests for guidance on ground fish retention in the salmon troll fishery. The GMT has been asked to consider changes to the incidental ground fish retention allowance in the salmon troll fishery multiple times in the last several years. Management of the salmon troll fishery, which is outside of the ground fish FMP, complicates how these re uh, requests should be explored. Uh, should it be done through a biennial harvest process, in-season, emergency rule, etc. We are aware of the overlap between salmon and ground fish harvest, particularly noted in the salmon troll, particularly noted in the salmon troll fishery and the growing interest to, to increase retention of incidentally caught ground fish. The GMT notes that at seed discards of ground fish are not currently monitored in that fishery. This data scarcity makes mortality projections difficult to accurately quantify at this time, uh, as we've discussed under a previous agenda item at this meeting. Addressing requests by the salmon troll fishery as in-season actions may be challenging if expected ground fish impacts are higher than the amounts deducted from the ACLs for the incidental open access or IOA fisheries as part of the uh, biennial process. Uh, we recognize an opportunity for council guidance to improve the process and outcomes of this complicated and sensitive topic. For this current specifications cycle, we recommend the council define management goals and provide specific guidance on what regulatory pathway the management of ground fish retention and the salmon troll fishery should be addressed. Doing so will define timelines, processes, roles, and responsibility, and make it easier for fishery participants, council members, and advisory bodies to navigate. Policy guidance and clear strategic goals and objectives that balance the needs of multiple user groups across FMPs would benefit all stakeholders. This, particularly this particular challenge provides model opportunity for council to continue progressing towards comprehensive ecosystem-based fisheries management and creating the flexibilities highlighted by the Climate and Communities Initiative. Such guidance could also inform analysis of future ground fish retention requests from other unobserved non-ground fish seeking uh, additional opportunities. Uh, and with that, uh, that concludes the report and I will try to answer questions. Thank you, Lynn, uh, for the report. Are there any questions on the team's report? Maggie Summer. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Lynn, and to the whole team for the report. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is on the GMT's recommendation um, related to groundfish retention in the salmon troll fishery that we provide specific guidance on regulatory pathways. Um, can you give us some more information on, on what you're looking for there? Is that uh, asking whether we want to pursue uh, some groundfish retention in salmon troll fisheries through, through you know, biennial specs and groundfish in season processes or something else or help us understand what, what the GMT is asking for there? Uh, thank you. Uh through Chair Gorelnik, uh, Ms. Summer, um, you, you hit it on the head. We, we're asking um, sort of a holistic look at that at that fishery and how does the council council members see this fishery say two to five years down the road? Um, there, there's the opportunity that we could look at stuff through the, this biennial process and set it up hopefully so that we can then do in-season action over the next couple of years. Um, but there would have to be some indication that the council is interested in that 
moving that way forward. Um, what we're trying to ho what we're, we hope to avoid is something like what happened in March and April of this last year, where there was some confusion about can can we do this through in season? Does it qualify for in season? Um, trying to make it clear whatever process moving forward this way, members of the SAS, members of the GAP, the GMT and council members and other interested parties are all on the same page that, okay, we want this change, this is how we have to do it. Um, we don't have a recommendation on that pathway. We are looking for guidance from you all to say how you would like it. Um, so hopefully I sort of answered your question. Yes, thank okay. you. All right, further questions of the team? Maggie? Thank you, Chair, I have one more. Yes, please. Um, Lynn, thank you to the team for the list of uh, potential new management measures um, on page two. And you have reminded us that the council is adopting a, a preliminary range in September. Um, in thinking ahead to that, I, I know that one of the things we will be grappling with it just is, is workload and the issue of what can be included in specs without potentially delaying it. Uh, and so we will be carefully considering uh, potential workload associated with these. Um, and I know it's it's too early in the process for the GMT, or I assume it is for the GMT to have had discussions on any expected workload associated with these, but is that something we would expect um, in advance of the September meeting? It, it, for example, in the September briefing book from the GMT or um, after the council adopts a range and then that might help us narrow it. Uh, through Chair Gorelnik, Ms. Summer, uh, we have not had that discussion yet. Uh, we were wanted to wait until maybe the council gave us some preliminary guidance. If that is something that would be helpful to council members for the September meeting, um, don't mean to speak for the entire team, but I suspect that's something we can produce for, for these items that have been identified, sort of um, like we have done in the uh, workload management measures prioritization process, sort of a where we put uh, high, medium, low, very qualitative workload um, information, sort of a... Um, sort of, a, I guess, a mini pre-scoping like we have done in, on items in that process. I, I think that's something we could accomplish in time for the advanced briefing book. And I'm probably digging a hole with my chair and vice chair, um, but I, I suspect we can do that. Thanks very much for that response. Uh, further questions of the team? Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. We have a, a report from the GAP, Gary Richter. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Uh, good morning, council members. I'll be reading from agenda item G6A, Supplemental GAP Report 1, Groundfish Advisory Subpanel Report on 2023-2024 Harvest Specifications and Management Measures Planning. The GAP received an overview of this item from Mr. Todd Phillips, Pacific Fishery Management Council, and the Groundfish Management Team regarding this agenda item. The GAP understands the biennial harvest specifications process as proposed will primarily include only those management measures necessary to implement the specifications for that biennium. The GAP generally supports this proposal. However, the GAP remains concerned, as we have stated in the past, about the inability to consider some new management measures in conjunction with the biennial harvest specifications process. The GAP reviewed the revised proposed schedule for developing the 2023-2024 harvest specifications and management measures and agrees it should allow sufficient time for completion of the specified tasks. The GAP reviewed the California Department of Fish and Wildlife supplemental report on repealing the Calcutt conservation areas. CDFW has proposed new coordinates for the non-trawl rockfish conservation area boundary lines that would replace the former CCA boundary lines. The GAP agrees this should move forward in conjunction with the 2023-2024 harvest specifications and management measures process. Given the recent copper and quillback rockfish stock assessments that suggest those stocks may be considered overfished in certain areas, the GAP sees these modifications as critically important. Opening all or a portion of these areas would likely disperse fishing effort and may mitigate some of the pressure on other rockfish species, including copper rockfish in nearshore areas. 
Yeah, Mr. Chairman, that completes our gap statement. Be glad to field any questions. All right, thanks very much, Gary. Uh, the questions on the gap report. Thank you very much, Gary. Thanks, sir, have a good afternoon. Good to have you, you too. All right, that takes us to public comment on this agenda item. We have two uh, speakers. So uh, welcome, uh, Victor Leipzig. Is Victor with us? I don't see him on the list. Um, so we'll go to Anna Weinstein and, and then after Anna, we'll see if Victor is with us. So Anna, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair Karolinik. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, yes, um, I'll try to be brief. I know y'all are behind, um, but I am speaking on behalf of uh, six organizations today. Um, Audubon, um, Audubon Washington, Audubon Society of Portland, San Diego Audubon, I suppose C and Sage, since Vic wasn't able to make it, C and Sage Audubon, um, Oceana, and the Pacific Seabird Group. Uh, so um, our letter um, laid out our points, um, which I'll just summarize here. Um, so we'd like to see at this meeting a prohibition on directed fishery for short belly rockfish added to the list of council prioritized new management measures for the ground fish 23-24 specification cycle. Uh, this follows a storyline going back to um, last year when the council moved um, short belly rockfish out of the fishery and into ecosystem component category um, with um, taking away its um, legal accountability measures um, for incidental catch and directed fishing. So, um, uh, so then in March 2021, um, the council uh, under G2 um, developed a motion um, uh, or adopted its motion to um, uh, put a prohibition on a directed fishery for short belly rockfish to the list of potential management measures to consider in June 2021, whether to include it in the 23-24 harvest specs and management measures, unquote. So the council um, took this special action when it recognized um, it, it can't continue to leave short belly rockfish, a foundational forage fish in the system vulnerable to a directed fishery. And so the threat from aquaculture and fish meal, fish oil markets is real. Um, and this is illustrated um, over at the Mid-Atlantic Council this past month, uh, which considered an, an exempted fishery permit for, for per seine capture of 3,300 tons a year of the redfin herring. Um, so that is a significant EFP application um, for a forage species. And of course, the aquaculture opportunity areas are moving forward in the business in Humboldt Bay with a shoreside salmon farm proposal, um, Nordic Aqua Farms, as it's known. Um, and so it's important to stress that we know um, the trawl sector has no intention of targeting short belly. It puts a lot of time and energy into tracking and avoiding them. Um, and I want to thank Heather Mann for opening my eyes to the many challenges this ind industry faces as it balances avoiding short belly with avoiding other rockfish and listed salmonids as it brings to market millions of pounds of low carbon, healthy food for Americans. Um, and so industry members will be the key participants for developing this pathway. I'll say our organizations can contribute um, analysis of landings levels that would make short belly um, economically viable for those who may be interested in a directed fishery, um, which we hope would inform um, the analysis, um, you know, what are the annual multi-trip landings to ensure no impact to the trawl fishery while effectively discouraging a directed fishery from developing um, and would need to accommodate occasional hits um, that happen that are inevitable um, as the trawl fishery goes about its business. Um, and finally, just a quick thank you, as we noted in our letter, for um, adding short belly back to um, the PacFin groundfish scorecard report 007. Um, 
and that's been re really helpful. Um, so thank you for your attention to this issue and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Anna. Are there questions for Anna? Thank you, Anna, very much for your comments. And I still don't see Victor, so that will conclude public comment on this agenda item. Excuse me. Takes us to our council action, um, which is there on the screen, which is to adopt a schedule and process and discuss and provide guidance. So we have a number of recommendations here. We have a draft schedule. Um, so let us see what our preferences are here. I'll, I'll look for a hand. <clears throat> I can't raise my hand. Uh, Heather Hall. Thank you, Chair Grelnick. Um, I do have a, I um, could offer a motion on um, the uh, proposed schedule and I have it in writing, but I haven't sent it. And I could do that right now. Why don't you go ahead and send it and in the meantime, we'll give folks another opportunity for discussion before we hear the motion. How's that? Sounds good, thank you. So let's see if there's any discussion to be had here. I'm still not seeing any hands. So, um, oh, there we go, there we go. Marcy Uremko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually have a question for council staff. Um, with regard to the CDFW report, uh, you will notice that um, our goal with this report was to get it into the record early so that it could be um, reviewed uh, by the public and other agencies um, with plenty of time. Um, we know things um, we're trying to avoid things coming in late, so we thought we would get in as early as possible with this content. But I'm just curious um, on the the review um, question. I, I, I don't know if we put things out for public review at this stage. Um, again, our intent here was to increase visibility and have folks take a look at these coordinates and have um, NIMFs uh, staff that work with waypoints uh, take a look at these coordinates and enforcement take a look at these coordinates um, so that we have a lot of time to make adjustments if needed. Um, but I'm just wondering if there is a, a, a formal step that needs to happen with regard to public review. Thank you. So is that a question Pat can answer or John? Um, I, I can take a stab at it if, if, uh, if you'd like. Um, I mean, I, I think that's fine, but uh, I, I do um, discourage uh, the council from getting into the weeds with management measures at this meeting. Uh, that's really uh, more appropriate for September and November, but, uh, you know, Marcy's characterization that she's putting it out early to solicit public comment is fine, but I, I would suggest that we really get into it uh, at the next meeting. Uh, Marcy, does that answer your question? Halfway. Um, thank you, John. Um, I guess my question really is, do, do, you, do we need, um, would it be better to put, put this out for public review, which happens through the council potentially later in the specs process, are we okay holding it until then and noting that our intentions are, as I, I just expressed, for folks to start taking a look at these now um, and bring any you know, recommended amendments to, uh, to us? Um, I, I mean, I'm just looking for your guidance on whether we need a motion to put this out for public review formally or if we're fine, um, just approving it um, 
to move forward? Um, I, I would suggest that, uh, you know, a lot of the principal folks who will be providing advice on management measures, the GMT and GAP um, folks who are listening in right now have received that notice, so they'll start thinking about this. Um, but I do think it's a little too early to put it out for formal review, um, formal public review. That's really a September action. Thank you. That That's just fine. Just wanting your perspective. Thanks. All right. And, and I'd seen Maggie's hand up. Maggie? Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, but sure, I'll... I'll uh, Go. One of my comments was going to be supporting the uh, schedule in the supplemental revised attachment one. Um, and my understanding based on that was that um, September is when we would be identifying a preliminary range of management measures. And that's when, when they would be officially ad adopted for public review, that range. Um, I, I would not be prepared, I think, to vote on any today anyway. So I was, um, was uh, reassured to hear the guidance just given on that. Uh, I have at least one. I thought I had two other comments, but I think I've forgotten one of them. I have one other, but I saw Phil's hand go up, and I want if anybody still wanted to talk about this subject before we move on, I'd be happy to pause. Okay. I also saw Phil's hand go up and back down. Oh, it, sorry, Mr. Chair. I, it was on a different topic. It, it was on the short belly topic. But, so, I, I again, we'll, we'll come back to you. Then, so, Maggie, further comment? Thank you, Chair. And, and it is on short belly. Um, just briefly, I don't want to take a, a lot of time today, but do want to um, thank. Uh, Anna Weinstein for the excellent letter in the briefing book um, and the recognition of the ground fish trawl sectors avoidance of short belly and the very thoughtful recommendations uh, on moving forward with some concrete ideas uh, and including industry representatives. Um, I certainly agree um, with the importance of short belly rockfish as forage um, and that I don't want to see any targeted short belly fishing until or unless there has been an adequate opportunity to address the latest uh, scientific information and consider potential impacts to the ecosystem and dependent predators and fisheries. Um, I don't, however, think there is an immediate conservation concern based on the latest information we have on the stock as well as on ecosystem information and fishery uh, the information catches of short belly. I understand the aquaculture feed concerns in particular, uh, and I think the Mid-Atlantic Council example is, is very interesting. Um, I don't think the risk of a reduction fishery developing here on the West Coast is immediate. Um, I, I would say even before this council meeting started, we uh, had heard some concerns that developing regulations, some concerns from the National Marine Fishery Service that developing regulations for a targeted short belly prohibition might be significantly time and effort intensive and uh, be and really add quite a bit to the specs picture. And now, given the potential additional complications at this point from the possible need for one or more rebuilding plans and 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 or uh, challenging management measures for some of the California nearshore rockfish stocks in particular is further complicating the specs picture. I uh, certainly don't want to jump to any conclusions there, but um, you know we can we can certainly anticipate the possibility of of some added specs complications. Um, I do want to note that the intent of the ecosystem species designation the council took was um, is for species that aren't targeted, and it was really in recognition of the ecosystem value of short belly rockfish uh, over its fishery value. And I think that the count, if the council were to become aware of any interest in targeting or any targeting beginning to happen, um, we would need to reconsider the ecosystem component species designation. 
um, that gives us an existing pathway to respond to that concern. And I'm, res I'm confident that we'd hear about that concern uh, from industry members, from observers or dockside samplers, at least as soon as any catch data or metrics would show it, um, if not probably even before then. So I'm not worried that a targeted short belly fishery will appear out of nowhere. Um, I, I guess my final thought on this is that given all this, um, I, I am not inclined to um, uh, try to combine it with the specs item, uh, recognizing that we aren't making any final decisions on that today, as, as I just also noted in my comments on the calendar, but just wanted to offer my thoughts right now. Um, however, it might be possible to think about whether there's um, some policy type language that we could add to the fishery management plan that just clarifies a, a desire that short belly not be targeted, assuming that that is um, indeed the council's full desire. And if that wasn't accompanied by any regulatory changes, uh, it, it could perhaps be done without a big lift. So I'll be giving that some more thought between uh, now and September and, and happy to talk with anyone further about that. Uh, but that's, that's my thought on short belly. Thanks. Thank you, Maggie. Bill? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, well, I apologize for um, in the, here at the outset for maybe taking too much time on this topic. Um, but, I, you know, I, I, um, the forage fish issue, um, and I think this council has a pretty strong record over time of of uh, recognizing the importance of forage fish and providing protections um, as appropriate. And I look back and think back to the Managing Our Nation's Fisheries Conference that, that uh, the Pacific Council sponsored. It's, it was back in DC, back in 2013. And one of the marquee topics there was forage fish and the need for the regional councils as a whole to pay more attention to forage fish and providing protections. You know, we followed that with a thing called Initiative One back in 2015, that um, the title of that initiative was uh, Protecting Unfished and Unmanaged Forage Fish Species. <clears throat> and that, led, that uh, initiative led to an amendment to most of our FMPs, ground fish being, our ground fish FMP being, being one of them, it was Amendment 25, um, and it again uh, was focused on protecting and, pro well, and providing protections and making sure that you don't go down the road of starting directed fisheries on forage fish species without fully understanding the science and the consequences of taking such an action. We came along, we were asked to comment on um, uh, Senator Cantwell asked us to comment on the Forage Fish Conservation Act. We sent a letter on July 11, 2019, extolling all the great things, uh, or many of the great things that we've done in terms of recognizing the importance of forage fish. And then, of course, we we all know the uh, and and remember what we discussed in and the discussion around short belly rockfish. Uh, and, and in terms of trying to provide some um, uh, protections for, for that species, while at the same time recognizing that they're incidentally caught in a number of different fisheries, and we wanted to make sure that our actions, you know, preserve that, the ability of that to continue. Uh, so, you know, here we find ourselves uh, in, in 2021, and we have, uh, I don't know that every conservation group was, uh, has, has expressed a view on this, but the majority have, and, they're, they, and they've done it uh, respectfully. Uh, they've given us some time. They've had some patience, um, and they've uh, uh, referenced our action that we took on short belly. Um, and as part of that action and the discussion that, that ensued, uh, was the potential of the council looking at some additional protective measures, be they prohibition on targeted fisheries or a prohibition on the sale 
something to ensure that uh, those protections um, uh, have some meat and uh, and some enforceability. Um, and I, I appreciate uh, Maggie's comments, um, um, <laughs> but I, I do not want to wait until there's an immediate conservation need. I do not want to wait until there is a uh, fishery on the horizon for reduction purposes. Um, I want to get out in front of this. Uh, I want us to walk our talk. We've had lots of strong um, things coming out of this council about our desire to protect forage fish species, and we need to walk that talk. And so my question, I guess, is if not if not through the specs process, then then how? And under and I and I don't in any way want to minimize the uh, the, the all of the issues that, it's, that have even been raised today. <clears throat> They're going to make this specs biennial process process a challenging one. But I am not ready to agree to take this off the list. I'd like to keep it in on the list. We'll have some, as I think Maggie said, we're not ready to make final decisions today. Uh, and one of the final decisions I'm not ready to take is to remove this as a potential uh, item for the specs process. I would like uh, to get some further understanding from National Marine Fishery Service, uh, not, not right now, uh, as well as council staff as to what degree of additional complexity there is to move forward and how is there a pathway here that ha and we, can we pick one that has the least uh, resistance to it in terms of getting there, but at the same time has that same strong outcome uh, that m many of our environmental groups and stakeholders are asking us to take. So, thanks. Thank you, Phil. Is there further discussion before we have a motion? Louis Zim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for considering my input once again. Um, I'm not one known for, uh, for being a, a big enthusiast for some of the environmental NGOs propositions. However, as everybody knows, I am an enthusiastic birder and I really do uh, want to back uh, Otto Weinstein's uh, proposals. And I agree with um, uh, Phil and also looking back on some of the statements we made earlier, I think we need to leave this in for consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Louie. Uh, Marcy? Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. A um, <clears throat> couple of remarks. Um, one, I appreciate um, the discussion we had uh, surrounding um, the process and what our actions are today in front of us and the clarification that we aren't making any uh, hard decisions on in or out right now. Um, with that, I think I'd like to turn my remarks to the question of uh, incidental salmon troll uh, retention of, of ground fish uh, for California. And by California, I mean south of 42. Um, I appreciate the request from the GMT for guidance. And I think what I'd like to do here is offer some um, some initial thoughts, um, but again, this shouldn't be construed as a hard and fast and, and um, that uh, there won't be opportunities down the road um, if circumstances change. But my initial inclination is that we should not spend analytical energy um, on looking at additional uh, retention of ground fish in the salmon troll fishery for south of 42. Um, unfortunately, uh, incidental retention of ground fish in the salmon troll fishery for the area between 42 and 4010 isn't really, there's not much to discuss there because there is no salmon fishery, as we heard earlier from uh, Harrison. So, um, 
the the situation isn't really much better uh, working south. Um, the salmon seasons are um, limited significantly this year by uh, poor forecasts. Um, I appreciate the salmon trollers looking for opportunities to um, avoid uh, throwing fish back where they could be landed and brought to the dock uh, to make a few extra dollars. Um, but I will say that the um, efforts that our agency has undertaken this spring trying to untangle the complexities that come with regulations that govern the groundfish fishery and the salmon fishery. And when you stick them together, it gets very complicated when you're dealing with provisions like VMS and RCAs and what uh, rules apply in what areas on the same trip when you're trolling in and out of an RCA, for example. Um, so I, at this time, it has been a huge lift on enforcement staff, uh, our GMT folks, our STT folks to try to um, unravel this. Um, so I'm not saying that, um, you know, we wouldn't ever again consider increasing the species or the retention opportunities for groundfish in the salmon troll fishery, but um, I am not interested right now in um, putting more analytical energy uh, toward this topic. Um, I think we're unfortunately going to have to put some toward the topic uh, just um, <laughs> if we were to try to keep the status quo regulations uh, in the next biennium, looking at uh, the, the possibility of um, more <laughs> extensive nearshore fishery closures. Um, if, if that were to come to fruition, then, um, you know, it certainly changes the game as to whether we want to allow any retention of, of ground fish, incidentally, with the salmon troll fishery. So, um, I think we may have to do that just because now we do have an authorization for some uh, retention south of 4010. But I think so. We're, so we're going to need to look at that. Um, but in terms of whether we're interested in offering more opportunity in this regard, um, my initial thought is no. But again, this is an, an early meeting, and we don't have all the information yet to inform us in our decision making. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is short belly. Um, I very much appreciate Phil's remarks. Um, I look forward to uh, hearing back from National Marine Fisheries Service um, a in a little more detail about the regulatory and analytical lift that a directed fishery prohibition um, uh, would require. Uh, thinking back a few meetings, uh, when this topic first came up, um, I expressed some reluctance with including short belly uh, in the scope of the specs discussions, just because now that uh, short belly is an EC species, we aren't talking about specifications. We're talking about something that's different. It's, it's a management measure, but to me, it's not really tied to specifications. Um, so. Uh, I still think that's the case. Uh, that said, I agree with the need to find a vehicle forward uh, now <laughs> and not delay. And that this is all kind of carrying over from uh, prior discussions and dis decisions. Um, and now, unfortunately, we don't have a tool uh, at our disposal in the specs process where we might be able to do something. So um, I am hopeful that we will be finding a way to do something soon. But um, I think the discussion about whether in or out of the specs package, um, perhaps uh, looking at what might be possible in the whiting utilization item um, would be appropriate. I, I'm not trying to suggest that I would propose putting that 
I don't want a longer timeline. I'm not at all. I just don't know um, if there might be a, a vehicle there where um, <clears throat> inclusion, <clears throat> excuse me, of a directed fishery prohibition might be convenient. Um, so uh, I, I guess I just want to again express um, the need, uh, and I think that we had, you know all kind of agreed that there was a need and that we needed to move forward. So uh, anyway, thank you for the discussion. All right, thank you, Marcy. Heather Hall. Thank you, Chair Grelnick. Um, before we go to the motion, I, I just want to add a, a little bit to the conversation on the uh, biennial, biennial management um, issues that have been talked about, um, largely focused on um, ground fish retention in the salmon troll fishery and and short belly. Just just really briefly, um, appreciate everything that's been said about um, short belly. And I I just you know when I look back to the motion in uh, March to uh, designate short belly as and EC species, I just reflect back on, you know, where we were at that meeting and it, we had a lot of new information um, brought to us and it was very uh, challenging to um, figure out a, a, the right path forward. Um, you know, I think conservation um, and protecting forage fish was on the forefront of everyone's mind. I think we were very unified in that, um, sentiment or um, motivation and, uh, you know, uh, the motion to move it to EC species uh, was really intended to maintain the precautionary approach we've taken for short belly. Um, and uh, I, I recognize there, you know, there's interest in, in talking about this more. And, and I, I really like the idea that, um, Phil teed up and the question to NIMS is, is there maybe a simple path forward that we can look at for that? Um, so just wanted to bring that up and um, relative to ground fish retention in the salmon troll fishery, uh, uh, really appreciate what uh, NIMS um, did through in season to revise that ratio. You know, we thought it was uh, something that we could consider uh, routinely. Ling cod specifically had been analyzed in specs before. Um, the GMT updated that analysis so that we could look at that adjustment. And, and so I realized that it might be more complicated if other ground fish species are added to that um, retention. But um, I'll just kind of want to flag that, um, you know, we're I know we're not making decisions on these at this meeting, but interested in, in looking at that and the potential for um, making sure that at least we have the analysis and specs um, to be able to, to think about that through in season. And that's it for those two items. And I'm prepared to um, offer my motion on the schedule if there's no more discussion on on the other biennial management issues. Um, uh, let me give folks a chance to raise their hand and if not, we'll move forward with your motion. Okay. I'm not seeing any hands, so please move forward. Okay. I move that the council adopt the detailed process and schedule for the develop, development of harvest specifications and related management measures for 23 2023 and 2024 ground fish fisheries as described in agenda item G6 attachment one. Thank you, Heather. Is the language on the screen accurate and complete? Yes. And I'll look for a second. Seconded by Marcy Remco, please speak to your motion. Thank you. Um, I think the, the proposed schedule um, is intended to meet the goal of having our um, 
ground fish rules in place by January 1, 2023. Um, I know that even with this detailed schedule, meeting that deadline and that timeline is challenging. Um, acknowledge that we we really need to strike a balance between any additional management measures um, that that we um, put include in the um, specs analysis uh, uh, without delaying the rule process. Uh, rulemaking process, and um, I think the GMT did a really good job of reminding the council of some of the key decision points um, that are critical to allowing their analysis and meeting that goal. So um, that's it. All right, thank you, Heather. Mm -hmm. Are there questions of yeah. Heather on the motion? Is there discussion on the motion? Okay, not seeing any hands. I will call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Um, any abstentions? Uh, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Heather, for the motion. Let's go back to our uh, actions here on this agenda item to make sure that we do, do anything else we need to do. We have adopted the schedule. We've had a discussion on, in particular, on short belly, but also on um, the incidental retention of ground fish in the salmon troll fishery. Um, let me see if there's any more discussion or guidance to be had um, under number two here. Looking for hands. Let me ask if the council has any further um, discussion here. I'm not seeing any hands. Well, I see Ryan Wolf. Welcome, Ryan. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just quickly to note that I know there was a number of comments um, raised, uh, noting for NIMPS to uh, to be prepared at, in the September meeting um, to discuss some of the issues and points that were raised earlier uh, a little further, and we're uh, happy to do that, and we'll be prepared to do so at the September meeting. Thanks. Thank you, Ryan. So let's see if there are any other hands. And if they're not, um, we're at a good place to break for lunch. Um, we're going to take, uh, when we come back from lunch at 1 o'clock, we're going to take things a little bit out of order. We're going to go to agenda item C3, the update on the executive order, because we'll be joined by Sam Rausch at 1 o'clock. <clears throat> when we're um, and then we'll come back to groundfish and then uh, marine planning. So let me ask uh, Chuck if there are any announcements before we break for lunch. No, thanks, Mr. Chair. No, I think uh, I think you've covered it. So just plan on being here at one o'clock for our um, update on Executive Order fourteen zero zero eight. Then uh, then I would expect we'll take up in season following that before we move into the rest of our administrative items. Great. All right. Thanks very much, Chuck. Thanks, everyone, for your work on this agenda item. Actually, let me first, actually, as a formal matter, let me just go back to Todd and, and confirm that we've done what we need to do here. I didn't take that off. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, looking at the actions, or action that the council may take, I believe that you've met it. I do have one question for the maker of the motion, and this is more of a confirmation of the intent is that the um, schedule that was listed, or not schedule, but the attachment that was listed in the motion, you do mean the revised uh, attachment is what my question would be. Or, Heather? Uh, thank you, Chair Gronlick. Yes, I did mean revised. Thank you, Todd. 
Thank you, Heather and Mr. Chair. All right, so we're good then. Um, so we'll be back at one o'clock. See you then.
<clears throat> well, it is one o'clock and um, we'll get started here on uh, agenda item C3, update on the executive order. And um, Chuck, let me turn to you if you're there. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, I am. Um, so uh, this is agenda item C3, the update on executive order 14008. So uh, I'll give a quick situation summary here and then we'll turn it over to Sam Rauch to um, give an overview from the NIMS leadership uh, perspective. So uh, Sam, just let me uh, say thank you for uh, attending and, and uh, presenting this information to us and welcome. And uh, you get to experience another uh, virtual council meeting. Hopefully <laughs> there won't be too many more of these. So uh, President's, President Biden's executive order 14008 on tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad was released in January this year. That's attachment one. Um, there's some highlights in attachment one that uh, are particularly relevant to the Pacific Council. Um, in its initial response to the EO, the council sent two letters to the administration following its April meeting. The first letter is attachment two was sent to the Secretary of Interior and Secretary of Commerce uh, responding to section 216A of the executive order, which focuses on steps the US should take to conserve at least 30% of US lands and waters by 2030, including proposing guidelines for determining whether lands and waters qualify for conservation. The second letter is attachment three, and that was sent to uh, National Marine Fisheries Service responding to section 216C, which focuses on collecting input on how to make fisheries and protected resources more resilient to climate change. In early May, the National Climate Task Force, um, which uh, was led by the Department of Interior, and uh, that's the reason we sent our letter to them, to her, um, the, uh, the, the task force released their report on section 216A and that is uh, attachment four, that's the America the Beautiful Plan. Uh, one of the report's recommendations was that an interagency working group should develop an American Conservation and Stewardship Atlas to measure the progress of conservation, stewardship and restoration efforts across the United States. Uh, the task force report also calls for annual progress reports, uh, the first of which would be due by the end of 2021, and those would include progress on the areas of collaboration outlined in the task force report, uh, an assessment of land cover changes, including loss of open space, and a review of the condition of fish and wildlife habitats and populations. So again, uh, Sam Rauch is gonna provide an overview of the executive order and progress and next steps on its implementation. Uh, there are several opportunities for the council to engage with the administration in addressing the objectives of the executive order and the council should be prepared to respond to such requests from national Marine fishery service uh, the council should also be aware that uh, at its may meeting the council coordination committee established an area-based management subcommittee to develop a common understanding amongst the councils uh, of area-based management measures and to develop a report on area-based measures in the US EEZ, including a comprehensive evaluation of all existing EEZ federal fishery area closures and other area-based measures in the US, uh, a discussion of the pros and cons of area-based management in the ocean, and contrasting management objectives and expected benefits of area-based management tools for the diversity of ecosystems under the council's jurisdiction. Um, and as I think I mentioned in my ED report, uh, Mr. Kerry Griffin on our staff is, uh, is our council's representative on that, uh, on that subcommittee. So uh, the council action under this agenda item is just to provide comments and guidance on implementation of the executive order. Uh, again, your materials are attachment one being the executive order itself, attachment two, the letter regarding uh, 216C, uh, that should be to Department of Interior, attachment three, uh, sorry, attachment two is to 216A, Department of Interior. Attachment three is a letter on 216C to National Marine Fisheries Service. 
uh, in attachment four is the National Climate Task Force report, uh, Conserving and Restoring America the Beautiful. Um, so those are our, our, our uh, materials. Uh, Sam Rauch is prepared to give a, a PowerPoint presentation that is also included uh, in your materials as C3A uh, NIMS report one. So uh, with that, if there are any questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer them, Mr. Chair. Otherwise, uh, I'll turn it back over to you and, and, uh, and to Sam to uh, give us this presentation. All right, thank you, Chuck. Uh, see if there are any questions. I'm not seeing any hands. So we'll turn uh, it over to Sam Rausch, uh, Deputy Assistant Administrator for Regulatory Programs at NOAA Fisheries. Welcome, Sam, to our Pacific Council meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I am here to please, pleased to be here with you today to talk about the report conserving the America the, the Beautiful. And I apologize in advance because it will be somewhat repetitive of the summary that uh, the executive director just gave. But uh, please bear with us, with me and the report. Uh, so as Chuck said, the report was released in early May. It complements many of much of our work and the council's work for five decades or so uh, of conserving natural, cultural, historical resources within our nation's marine and Great Lakes environments and special places, talking about NOAA writ large. And in the report, the president calls on Americans to join together in the pursuit of a goal of conserving at least 30% of our lands and waters by 2030 through an inclusive and locally led effort. The report includes recommendations emphasizing the importance of ongoing dialogue, engagement, and collaboration for conserving and restoring America the beautiful. So the, this next slide here is the actual text of the executive order. Uh, we, we know, and I think I personally, although I lose track, uh, have come to the councils and talked about other aspects of this executive order, specifically 216C, uh, which is a different provision of this, which tasks the Commerce Department with seeking input, and particularly from the councils, but from others as well, on uh, how we can create resiliency and ensure resiliency in our fisheries and other things. Um, today, we're going to talk about 216A. So 216A was directed at the Secretary of Interior, although it was in consultation with Commerce and other agencies. The Interior Department was to submit a report to the, clim the National Climate Task Force, and that was created in a wholly different section of this executive order um, to produce a report for the task force, and that's the American The Beautiful Report, uh, which, as I said, was to recommend steps for conserving at least 30% of our U.S. lands and waters by 2030. 30% is not an endpoint. It does say at least. Uh, and there's also there's nothing particularly magical about 30% one way or another, but it is a target, and it does have some meaning. Um, in terms of various uh, various objectives and, and how you look at conservation. But the ultimate goal is to achieve an enduring ethic of conservation, an enduring process of conservation to meet several outcomes that we'll talk about in a minute over the long run. There are two operative provisions of 216A that we're going to talk about. The first one is that we are required to solicit input from a number of individuals, including fishermen and other stakeholders, uh, on identifying strategies that would encourage broad participation in the goal of conserving 30 percent. And the report is supposed to propose guidelines for determining whether the lands and waters qualify for conservation and the mechanisms to measure progress to that goal. And we'll talk mostly about that one, although we will return to how to solicit input uh, at the end. So if I can have the next slide, please. So just as a brief uh, reminder, for those of you who are not aware, uh, since the issuance of executive order in January, mainly interior, but with our assistance, conducted outreach and engaged in listing sessions and received feedback from a wide range of stakeholders, including the councils, as the executive director indicated, but also quite a few others. Uh, we held a couple of listening sessions that NOAA helped sponsor. All of that preliminary engagement helped inform the report. If I can have the next slide, please. So there was an interagency report, the American They Were Beautiful, which is attached to your materials. It was released on May 6th. 
it it is the first step as you will see it does not outline yet what conservation is or whether the lands which lands and waters are in that 30 percent or exactly how we're supposed to measure that but it sets us on a path for getting to those answers and, and determining where we are um, it affirms the need to pursue this national conservation goal to combat three key threats loss of natural areas and resources climate change and disparities in access to the outdoors both in this executive order and in a number of other executive orders the president has been clear that he is interested in equity and in the environmental realm and equity of access which means access for a wide variety of uses not just for recreational purposes but to make sure that underserved communities in particular have an uh, equal access to the the natural resources and all the benefits that they can bring to the table it is a 10-year locally led nationally scaled campaign explicitly the report recognizes the need for a continuity a continuum of approaches it doesn't lay out a singular statement that we have to do it this way it intentionally uses the term conservation because it acknowledges the values of various conservation actions in addition to protected areas so these in does include protected areas but it also includes ecosystem restoration and areas that allow for sustainable mixed use because federal agencies will seek input on how to measure progress towards the 30 percent goal there is no specific conservation action either included or excluded at this point, but there's a recognition that as you decide, there are many conservation actions in the country right now to meet many different purposes. And the test is not whether or not those are good conservation actions, but whether or not they contribute to these three overarching goals that are laid out in the report. In addition to those three overarching goals, there are six key principles, if I could, uh, eight core principles, if I could have the next slide, please. So these are the eight core principles that the report lays out that as we are looking at the approaches to meet those overarching objectives, uh, we need to be mindful of these principles so that whatever our approaches are, they need to be collaborative and inclusive. The spirit of collaboration and shared purpose should animate all aspects of our conservation restoration efforts over the next decade. The conservation need to be designed to benefit all Americans, not just a few, and they should be equitably distribu distributed as indicated, this concept of equitable distribution is very important to this administration. And the, the conservation value of a particular place should not be measured solely in terms of the biological, in biological terms about what's there, but also in terms of its capacity to provide benefits, such as access to recreation and other things, and to prepare for and respond to climate change. So it's broader than just a biodiversity measure. The measures should support locally led efforts. We should do all we can as the federal government to help local communities achieve their own conservation priorities and vision. Locally and regionally designed approaches can play a key role in conserving resources and be tailored to meet the priorities and needs of local communities and the nation. We need to ensure that we honor tribal sovereignty and so we must involve regular and meaningful consultation with tribal nations. The efforts must respect and honor tribal sovereignty, treaties, subsistence rights, freedom of religious practices, which also align with other administration objectives. We need to pursue, pursue measures that create jobs. We know that both the act of creating conservation areas can create a type of green infrastructure that can and directly linked to the creation of needed jobs in coastal areas, at least for the water part of it. Uh, but we also know through the long work of the councils that certain conservation areas are important to sustain a broader economy. There are many areas which the councils across the country have protected spawning areas or other ports of habitat with the idea that this would, pre this would allow for the sustainability of the fisheries such that we can have a thriving coastal communities built around fishing practices. And so the, cons the conservation of those areas are key to the job creation and maintenance uh, through a, uh, an environmental ethic. We need to make sure we honor private property rights and voluntary stewardship efforts. Obviously the land part of the land and waters initiative, private property rights are more, more significant than they are in the ocean. Uh, but we must try to respect the rights of private property owners to build trust among all the communities and stakeholders 
and recognize and reward voluntary conservation efforts of private landowners and the science-based approaches of fishery managers as we go forward. And that we need to use science as a guide to what we're doing. We need to have transparent and accessible information that will help increase the understanding and build trust among stakeholders and the public. And we should reflect, though, that indigenous and uh, tribal individuals can bring important knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge to the table, which can complement and integrate with these efforts. And we need to try to incorporate that. And finally, uh, the goal, while ambitious, the belief of the administration is it can be achieved using a wide variety of existing tools and strategies that the federal agencies, tribes, territories, states and local governments, private landowners, nonprofits, and fishing communities have already developed and deployed effectively. The goal is not to create a new top-down federal process, but to recognize the various processes that we currently engage in across the country, not just the federal government, but us collectively, uh, to create conservation actions across the landscape. All right, next slide, please. The executive director mentioned this, that one of the first steps in this, in this process will be the creation of an American Conservation and Stewardship Atlas. The atlas is intended to provide a baseline assessment of how much land and ocean in the U.S. is currently conserved and restored. So we've mentioned, I think, many times that in order to evaluate where you are in the president's goal of at least 30 percent land and water is conserved by 2030, you need to know where we are now. Are we above that? Are we below that? Uh, what is meant by conserved? What kind of areas are conserved as the executive order uses that term? And that will provide a basis for where we need to go and how aggressively we need to go to get there. Uh, so that atlas will be developed by the interagency working group of agency experts, federal agency experts, but those experts will seek input from public states, tribes, scientists, a wide range of stakeholders, and consider a range of contributions, not just uh, defined wilderness areas, but voluntary conservation measures on farm, ranch, forest, and private land, con explicitly conservation measures under the Magnuson Act that the council has create, councils have created, and existing efforts or designation on federal, state, local, tribal, and private lands and waters. And as the executive director mentioned, there will be annual uh, reports that will follow on to this one. The first one is expected to be released at the end of 2021. Those reports will include progress updates on areas of collaboration identified in the report, updates on land cover changes, including loss of open space, and a review of the condition of fish and wildlife habitats and populations. So I can have the next slide, please. The report also lays out six areas of early focus that we should look at to begin making early progress. One of them is to create more parks and safe outdoor opportunities in nature-deprived communities. The campaign, the American Beautiful campaign, should support locally-led conservation and park projects in communities that disproportionately lack access to nature and its benefits. I've said several times, but we need to support tribally-led conservation and restoration priorities. We should review our most successful conservation programs to determine how to better include and support the tribal governments and to support their own efforts at conservation. This could include working with Congress to revise underlying statutes or developing technical assistance capacity building grants to support indigenous-led conservation efforts. Additionally, federal agencies should take steps to improve engagement with American Indians, Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians, and other indigenous groups on the care and management of public lands and waters, particularly regarding sacred and ceremonial sites and trust and treaty rights. We should initially focus on expanding collaborative conservation of fish and wildlife habitat and corridors. We know that it doesn't make a lot of sense, particularly on land, but also in the ocean, to protect one area of a migratory species and have no way for it to get to other important migratory areas. There needs to be uh, a way for the species to get between the places it needs to go. And we need to look at that, particularly on land, but also in the ocean. And we know how important rivers are uh, to many of our fish populations. 
We need to take steps broadly uh, to stem the decline of fish and wildlife populations that are in the habitat throughout the country, including wildlife corridors and fish passage. The report explicitly calls for the expansion of the National Marine Sanctuary System and the National Estuarine Research Reserve System. And the administration did take an important step along that, that line, uh, I believe last week, with the creation of a new sanctuary in Wisconsin on the Great Lakes. The report, though also specifically for this group, recognizes the work of the Regional Fishery Management Councils on the Magnuson Act and calls for NOAA to work closely with the councils to identify areas or networks of areas where their fisheries management efforts would support these long-term conservation goals, either as they exist now or as they might be a partner in developing new, new measures, which is something that the councils do all the time. I do note that last Monday, the, the administration adopted a recommendation of the New England Council for a significant closure off of New England of a number of deep sea uh, canyons and corals um, for many of these conservation goals that mirror what the goals that are laid out in this report. So these are something that, that the councils, the Pacific Council and other councils do all the time, looking at area-based management for various purposes. And the report asks us to, to work with the councils including, as Chuck mentioned, the TCC Working Group on Area-Based Management uh, to try to figure out which of the council efforts should be included, could be included, or how the councils will relate to this effort. <coughs> um, the report also says that one of the first efforts should be to look at increasing access for outdoor recreation, uh, prioritizing management planning that identifies land and waters that appropriate need to be conserved for that purpose. And we know that recreation, particularly recreational fishing, is very important to many of uh, the stakeholders that participate in the council process and is important to many of our local economies. Uh, we should incentivize and reward the voluntary conservation efforts of fishermen, ranchers, for farmers, and forest owners. And as I indicated before, look to create jobs by investing in restoration and resilience. And another provision of these executive orders talks about the creation of a civilian climate core that can help to conserve and restore public lands and waters towards meeting this 30% goal. And we have a number of similar conservation cores actually currently that NIMPS, the National Fishery Service, is supporting that we think will feed into this broader civilian climate core. If I could have the next slide. Next slide, please. So the next steps. The report only is, talking, is only the starting point. We, uh, as indicated, one of the provisions of the report was to formally and informally engage with a wide range of stakeholders uh, to try to get their advice on how we can better achieve the objectives of the report and how we can uh, communicate the goals and, and get buy-in to these objectives. This discussion with th this council, it's one of a series of discussions NIPS has been having. I think it, this one is my fourth in two weeks um, to get council input, but it recognizes the important roles that the councils play in all of this. And the councils are mentioned several times in this report. So if we could have the next slide, please. So from NOAA's perspective, this is a, this is a multi-agency initiative. So there are other issues, there are other authorities that interior, agriculture, and others are bringing to bear. From NOAA's perspective, we're looking at it in, under the lens of our own authorities. Obviously, for this council, for the councils as a whole, the Magnuson Act is an important authority that is currently used in many places to create area-based management to achieve many of the same objectives that the president has laid out. But there are other authorities we look at that um, the first two are not NIMS authorities, not Marine Fishery Service authorities, but they are NOAA authorities under the Ocean Service, which are the Sanctuaries Act, the Coastal Zone Management Act. And then there are closures in certain places or area-based measures to protect our marine mammals under the Marine Mammal Protection Act or our endangered species under the Endangered Species Act. And then finally, even though this is not a NOAA-specific statute, we are occasionally given by the president co-management responsibility under antiquities, under for marine monuments, if they are designated. If the president does not so designate, they are managed by Interior. But recently, for a number of ocean monuments, the NOAA has been designated as a co-manager, and so we do have a role there. All right, finally. 
second of the last slide. So a number of key questions. Um, as indicated, we are supposed to, to go out, seek input, not just from the councils, but from a diverse range of stakeholders, but I'm particularly interested in what the council has to say about what baseline conservation actions are currently effective in addressing the three, um, the three overarching goals of this nature loss, climate change, and disparities in access to outdoors. What types of additional conservation restoration actions would be effective in addressing the, those three things? In other words, what kinds of things should be included in the definition of conservation? What tools do we have to achieve additional conservation and restoration actions? What criteria do we need to use to identify and select these areas? Are there, in addition to the criteria, are there particular areas, new areas or enhancement of existing areas that we think should meet these criteria or that you think would meet these criteria? And finally, how should we support and collaborate with stakeholders to broaden participation in this initiative? <coughs> Excuse me. So those are the questions and I'm happy to take comments or uh, participate in the discussion, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Sam, for your presentation. Um, let, let me see if there are any immediate questions from around the table. We'll, we'll come to council discussion after we've had an opportunity for public comments. So are there any questions of Sam? Thank you, Sam. But don't go too far away because I, I don't see any advisory body reports. And let me quickly check and see if there's any uh, public comment. Uh, Chuck, can you confirm there's no public comment on this agenda item? I'm not seeing any signups. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so then this will take us to our council discussion and give and take with Sam. So um, I look for some hands. All right, uh, Corey Niles followed by Phil Anderson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and, and thank you for being here, Sam. Um, I apologize if I missed it in the presentation, but we heard earlier at our budget committee meeting at this meeting that the president's budget has a, a, an increase for, for NOAA. Um, I don't think we had all, all the details, or, or, or I don't at least remember the details, but curious if, um, if, that, if, if you know if that budget contains some of those increases focused uh, on, on this initiative. There's nothing in the budget that is explicitly mentions this executive order. There is a significant proposed increase to our habitat program to address climate impacts to habitat, uh, restoration work and those kinds of activities. So there is that part of the budget and then there is a requested increase in our science programs and certain other programs to also better position us for climate. There, are, there is, in addition, there is uh, a requested increase that would look at this equity principle and participation and those kinds of things. So a lot of that is in the budget, but it is not specifically referenced this executive order, but it would be very supportive of the theories of the themes in this executive order in terms of the goals that the president has laid out. All right, uh, Phil Anderson, followed by Karen Braby. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks, Sam, good to hear your voice. Uh, appreciate you coming before the council here today and providing us uh, this information. It's very helpful. Um, you know, I just, uh, I know you've, you've seen the several um, written communications that we've had, one, one that went to uh, Paul Doremus that uh, you know gave in probably a fairly high level summary of some of the things that we do here in the council that are at least from our perspective directly related to this initiative. I also noted uh, those eight core principles, uh, at least there was about um, six of them that, that just you know are aligned perfectly with uh, the way we do business here. Um, and I'm, I, uh, what I'm 
curious about is in terms of follow through um, that we can do communicating with with headquarters. Um, do you have a do you have some thoughts on what you would like to see from us in terms of follow up? Uh, in terms of providing some feedback to the questions that you pose to us, uh, what's the best way for us to do that? Um, well, let me, there's, there's two ways to answer that question. One is we are, I am currently engaged with the CCC subgroup, which is for those of you who, you know, the, the broader audience, that's the council coordinating committee, which is all the eight councils, the council chairs and executive directors. And I've had several discussions with the chair of that subgroup, Eric Reed from the New England Council, and Dave Witherell, who's the executive director of the uh, North Pacific Council, on what their plans are and how uh, my understanding is that the councils are first going to do something very similar to what the federal government is doing, which is to create an atlas of all of the council area based measures, why they, you know, what the purpose that they're trying to achieve with the various um, measures and how that might interact. What is good and bad, and it is it is broader than 30 by 30, so it is intended to be a tool that the councils could use. If they're thinking about measures, it would be uh, a significant guidance about what is good, what situations you might use, which action. Clearly, also, though, the desire of the CCC was that this would be uh, input into the 30 by 30 process. And so we've talked about that as to how that may happen. There is no current schedule from the federal interagency working group, although we expect, I expect that one will be developed shortly. And then we'll have to come in and cross-reference that because our clear desire and the mandate from this report is to try to get that feedback, feedback into the system. That to, so on the national level, working with the CCC subgroup, that's what we're doing and we're having good conversation. I've met with them twice already so far. From this particular council, uh, we do, I would value any uh, opinions, advice, thoughts this particular council has. You can either give it to us orally here at this meeting, or there will at some point be a mechanism, specific mechanism to give us written comments. That is not yet set up. I anticipate it shortly. I well know, though, that even without that, you know where our address is and you could send it to me or the new head of fisheries, Janet Coy, who I, I should have apologized, I should have expressed her greetings to you all and her excitement at being selected by the uh, president to, uh, to lead the fisheries service. And at some point, as soon as we can figure out all the computers and everything, I'm sure she's going to want to talk to the councils, uh, but we got to figure out how she can talk virtually to anybody at this point. But we, we will certainly take written comments if the Pacific Council wants to individually send us comments, and we would welcome those. And for the broader public, at some point here soon, there will be a written portal. I don't have that information yet. As soon as I get it, we will share it with the council. Just a quick follow-up, Mr. Chair. Thank, uh, thanks, Sam. Yeah, that helps a lot. Uh, and of course, we're actively engaged with the CCC, our leadership is, and and uh, that seems like a good um, forum in which to kind of pull together the various uh, pieces from across the eight different regional councils. And and uh, I think looking at those, you know, those kind of four key questions for future engagement in, in particular, um, and uh, in particular, the baseline for conservation actions uh, and the criteria uh, used or something that uh, at least I would um, like to have a little bit of opportunity to think about, and um, then we can uh, provide you some some of our thoughts either directly back to you and your leaders and, and uh, uh, Janet Coit's office as, as well as through the, the CTC. But I, for one, uh, am heartened to see the commitment that this, that this administration has to conservation and meeting the the uh, challenges that climate change uh, present to all of us, and uh, so uh, we'll we'll be looking forward to contributing. Thanks, thanks very much, Sam. 
All right, Karen Braby. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Sam, thank you so much for your presentation and allowing us some time to ask you questions. And uh, one of my questions was uh, related to the dialogue you just had with Phil, and I would just underscore that there's a lot of interest and, and thinking going on around how to uh, define current activity, current regulations, current re approaches in terms of the 30 by, by 30 principles. So I think there's broad interest, uh, certainly within the Pacific Council to hear about that as that develops and have an opportunity to provide input. Um, so thanks for, for offering that. And the other question I had uh, was more uh, in the nuts and bolts. I understand that there are some additional efforts happening um, in the West Coast region and the fishery science centers related to marine planning. Uh, and, I, and I'm assuming that that is both for the exercises we'll talk about in the next agenda item, uh, offshore wind and aquaculture opportunity areas, but also in service to the atlas that's described in the task force report and having um, better uh, availability of fisheries information in a, in a way that makes it useful for the development of criteria and um, assignation of, of conservation status for these areas. Just wanted to hear if you had any more detail um, on that line of thinking. Well, I'm sure there's representatives from the West Coast region of the Science Center that might be able to more specifically discuss their regional efforts from the national perspective in terms of this interagency working group, you know, much like I indicated, we are we are welcome the input of the council. We we don't want to duplicate efforts. We're in the same position with the councils in terms of NOAA has a great deal of data about various conservation areas, uh, both council and non-council related areas, and we are working with the interagency group to try to figure out how best to bring that to the table. We do not yet have. A clear conception and so any at this point early on any input that you might have about what the you know the the, the gis people will tell me you know what are the fields that we need to ask the question when we create this sort of atlas what do the questions need to be just that then we can apply the criteria to those questions and how would we get that so um we're really working and i'm not a gis person so but we're working on those nuts and bolts now and much like uh, the council is excited to present its data to us. We're excited to present our data to the international inter interagency group, but we still are um, trying to define what the shape of that query will look like. And maybe I will defer if anybody that's on the West Coast or the Science Center uh, is on the uh, on the phone who wants to describe more specifically the region or the center's efforts. All right, that's a good idea, Sam. So, is there anyone from? West Coast Region or Science Center wants to um, contribute information in response to Karen Braby's question. <clears throat> well, I guess not. I'm, I don't see any hands. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, sure they Chuck will Tracy. get a chance to. Uh... Well, Chuck's got his hand up. Chuck, did you have? Uh, I'm not going to respond on behalf of the uh, the uh, Science Center of the region, but uh, I just had some another question if we're ready to move past that. But if there is anybody uh, from uh, NIMS on the West Coast here, uh, I'll yield. Well, I'm not, I'm not uh, seeing any volunteers, so why don't you go ahead, Chuck? Okay, thanks. And uh, yes, thanks very much, Sam, for, for coming and giving this information. And I, you know, I think uh, there, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of the questions and, and your answers that kind of uh, get to uh, most most of what I was uh, was interested in hearing about, uh, but maybe just to to put a, a a little finer point on a couple things. Um, you know, I think I think the uh, the process of uh, determining what uh, what things that have already been done, how they contribute to the uh, to the objectives of, of the executive order, and uh, and you know the uh, uh, 
the questions for future engagement and the uh, uh, core principles. Um, I think uh, I think uh, you know you can expect from the from our council to hear on our thoughts about how uh, some of our measures uh, fit into those. But um, I guess I would also just ask that uh, you know as uh, you'll be dealing with this on a much broader scale, and um, and uh, actually probably presumably on that, you know also on the uh, the terrestrial scale. Uh, but to the extent that you could provide us any uh, guidance on the things that uh, appear to be, uh, you know, sort of rising to the top or, uh, you know, relative importance of, of some of those aspects, uh, you know, the, if you could provide us some feedback on, um, on how we should be characterizing our input to you to, uh, you know, most to, to address those uh, particular areas of, uh, of most interest. Um, I think we would uh, we would really appreciate that, and I hope that uh, we'll be uh, obviously doing some of that through our um, SSC uh, area based management subcommittee as as well. Did I say SSC CCC? Um, so anyway, uh, yeah. So uh, so any feedback you could provide in, in that area, I think, would be appreciated. And um, I guess that's all I've got. Yes, Mr. Chair, if I could respond to that, uh, I would be happy to do so. Yeah, if we have the opportunity, as I indicated, the administration currently does not have a preconceived notion as to what is or is not conservation, other than they want to at least initially take a broad lens. They've recognized the continuity of approach, continuum of approaches. They've talked about council measures explicitly in the report. They're interested in figuring out how these these different suite of measures contribute to the overarching goals of uh, dealing with the loss of natural areas, climate change, and disparities in access. Uh, so there's nothing off the table, but there's also nothing on the table. Uh, so I have no leanings to tell you at the moment, uh, but if I do get them and it's appropriate to share them, we certainly will. Uh, just, just a quick follow-up, Mr. Chair. Yes, yeah, that 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 was my sense of of your uh, presentation. So, again, you know, I think you can be uh, expecting to get uh, some input from us on our thoughts about that. But again, as you as you sift through our input and all the other inputs you're going to get, uh, you know, just sort of a feedback to uh, to what what things are striking home and what things are striking out uh, would, would uh, I think would be appreciated. Thanks. Uh, Joe Oatman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Sam, for uh, providing this presentation uh, to the council. I uh, appreciate some of those details as those relate to um, tribes um, across the nation as well as here in the West Coast um, that I uh, represent. I uh, wanted to see if you might be able to explain a bit more, and I, I do apologize if I might have missed it, but under the six areas of focus slide, um, there's the bullet that states support tribally led conservation restoration priorities. Uh, if you could uh, maybe you know, give me more of a sense as to what's meant by support, um, is that something like, you know, what tribes are doing now to try and benefit fish and habitat? Um, that you want to see some of that work continued, or is there a, a thought of um, to do um, you know, more of that kind of work? Um, if you can help me out on that, I'd appreciate it. Thanks, Sam. Yes, uh, thank you. And I, I think there's a, a number of different ways that the federal government or that the administration in, in, intends to use it. It all is based on the understanding that the tribes have a conservation ethic. They have uh, important goals that they're trying to achieve for conservation of our land and waters for a variety of different uses, not just sacred and ceremonial. That's very important. Our trust and treaty rights but a wide range of things. And the tribes are very good managers and stewards of our lands. And so the two things that when I look at this language, the, what I look at it as the two things we're trying to do here, one is uh, where the tribes are engaged in their own efforts 
we should try to figure out ways to assist them in those efforts. Are there ways we can take the, the, the federal government and all the tools we have to bear or partnership ability that we can do that to help the tribes with their own efforts? Uh, and that could, there's a lot of kind of different things that you can look at under that. And there's a lot of different tribes. And so this report is national and I, there's no specifics there other than that general idea. The other one is as the federal government is engaging in its own efforts, such as the council process or other kinds of things, to make sure that the tribes are uh, included in that discussion, that we look at what's successful about that. How can we better support the tribes? How can we better bring them in? Do we need to make changes to, to that to better bring those in and to align the federal effort and make sure the tribal goals are included in the federal goals and that we're using the federal tools to support some of these goals? So it's a wide range of things. And I think if you looked at both this executive order and the other executive orders that and other actions that the president has done, the president is uh, serious about trying to support and build on the relationship the, the federal government currently has with the tribes and to make sure the tribes have input into this and it's a supportive uh, feedback loop between we're mutually trying to achieve similar objectives. Joe, did that answer your question? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Sam, for providing those additional details. Those are really helpful. Okay, uh, further questions, discussion? I know we've already provided some guidance and we'll be working through the CCC to provide additional. Joe, your hand is still up. Do you have another comment or question? No, sorry about that. No worries. Uh, Chuck Tracy. Thanks. Uh, so Sam, uh, just another question uh, I, I've seen there's uh, recently there's been some uh, discussions and some announcements about some uh, opportunities for uh, listening um, sessions uh, there's been some uh, uh, we've had some outreach uh, from um, from Silver Spring on uh, engagement with underserved communities uh, and so I'm just wondering uh, the relationship of those efforts are those uh, associated with uh, with executive order 14008 and uh, do you have any uh, updates or expectations on, uh, on on some of those efforts um, there is a different executive order that talks about equity which the number escapes me at the moment and I but I do think I mentioned it in one of my discussions with the Pacific Council in the last year um, and it it talks about creating a program, looking at the various uh, programs and access rights that the federal government has with a focus on ensuring equitable participation, equitable use of our natural resources, access, those kinds of things. Um, we have, there's a department led initiative that is stepping down to NOAA and to the fishery service on that. And I have created uh, a working group across the various elements of, of the National Fishery Service to try to look at the various goods and services we provide, various opportunities that we provide, and how can we better align those, uh, the things that we do as a federal agency with the objectives of the executive order in terms of equity and, and, uh, and uh, that. So that's not specifically 1408 30 by 30, but it aligns well with 30 by 30, but it is technically in support of the other executive order, which, which, which seeks to have this broader, uh, more strategic input into equ equitable issues and environmental justice. So when you hear those things, unless it's specifically 30 by 30 related, it's not directly a 30 by 30 initiative, but it supports that and that it, it's all wrapped up the, the, the motivation behind that other executive order and equity and environmental justice is the same motivation behind the third objective here when the administration talks about disparities in access to the outdoors. 
Thank you. Further uh, questions for Sam, further discussion, any further guidance on the executive order from the council? Keeping in mind, this is hardly our last opportunity. Well, I'm not seeing any other hands. Sam, thanks so much for coming to the council and discussing these issues with us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Chuck, have we concluded mm -hmm. our business here on this agenda item? Yes, Mr. Chair, I believe we have. All right. Well, thank you, Sam, once again. Don't be a stranger. And um, with that, we will return to ground fish our uh, last ground fish item of the day is agenda item G7, in season adjustments. And I am very pleased to turn over the virtual gavel to Vice Chair Pettinger. Brad? Uh, thank you, Chair Gronick, and I, I bet you are. <laughs> it's been a long day for you on the gavel. And with that, we'll go right, uh, get right to it and, uh, and look to uh, Todd to kick us off. Todd? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Good afternoon, Council. And this is agenda item G7, the last of the ground fish items for this meeting. It is in season adjustments, final action. <clears throat> the management measures for the ground fit for ground fish are set by the fish by the council with the general understanding that these measures will need to be adjusted within the biennium to attain but not exceed the annual catch limits. This agenda item will consider progress to date of the ground fish fishery as well as routine in season adjustments to the 2021 fisheries such as trip limit adjustments and season structure. These adjustments are in part based on recent landings data and the latest information from the West Coast ground fish observer program. The ground fish management team and the ground fish advisory sub panel both have provided reports for the council for this agenda item. In your briefings materials, you have a report from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, a report from the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, and as I mentioned before, a report each from the GMT and the GAP. Your action is to adopt final in-season adjustments for 2021 as necessary to achieve but not exceed annual catch limits and other management objectives. Mr. Vice Chair, I conclude my uh, opening remarks and I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Todd. Uh, questions for Todd on his overview? All right. With that, um, we'll go to the uh, Maggie Summer with the ODFW report. Maggie? Thank you very much, Vice Chair. Uh, the ODFW Supplemental Report 1 has been uh, in the briefing book for uh, since before the meeting started. It is uh, simply informational, not needed for any decision making under this item and provides some updates on the status of recreational and commercial near shore ground fish fisheries in Oregon uh, to date this year. And I think I would just, in the interest of time, ask uh, if there are any questions for um, any interest in me providing further detail, I'd be happy to. Otherwise, um, just note that it's there. All right, thank you, Maggie. Questions for Maggie on the ODFW report? Okay, very good. Uh, with that, we'll go to, uh, to Marcy Rimko. Uh, Marcy, CDF report. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, Caroline McKnight was slated to give this report. Let me make sure she's still with us. I am. All right. Take it away, Caroline. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, my name is Caroline McKnight and I will be reading agenda item G7A supplemental CDF and Delby report one. Um, this is a California Department of Fish and Wildlife's report on 2021 groundfish harvest in California. Um, CDF and W provides the following informational report on harvest of select groundfish species for 2021. This report represents the first update on the status of 2021 fishing seasons relative to ACLs, HGs, sector allocations, ACTs, and effect for the 21-22 biennium. And this report catch includes estimates of total mortality from the recreational sector and landings from the commercial non-trail sector without discard mortality. The 2021 combined recreational and commercial catches to date compared to federally designated harvest specifications are found in table one and are, are all within allowable limits or levels. 
Monthly recreational catch, um, which can be found in table two. The data are from RecFin through April 2021 and reflect activity across all recreational management areas for January through April. Um, season openers in California for boat-based fishing occurred on March 1 for south of Conception, um, April 1 south of Point Arena, and May 1 south of the Oregon-California border. There are new regulatory changes for 2021 within the 10 fish aggregate for rockfish cabazon and green lead bag limit. These changes include removal of the sub bag limits for cabazon, black rockfish, and canary rockfish, and the implementation of a five fish sub bag limit for vermilion rockfish. The preliminary indications are that catch is in line with 2020 levels, and there's no discernible trends this early in the season. Um, several management areas also experienced an increase in allowing fishing depth in 2021. In response to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the California Recreational Fisheries Survey staff continue to maintain safety protocols, including keeping a safe distance from subject anglers and passengers. Similar to 2020, there have been some deficiencies in data collection by SURFs in the early months of 2021, including the absence of any party charter onboard data, length data, and some species composition data. As conditions improve, CDFNW expects its sampling activities to continue on the path back to normal. Commercial landings uh, data, which are found in Table 3, are from PACFIN through June 16th. Uh, the data are preliminary and subject to change. Uh, beginning in 2021, fishing period, uh, or fishing during period 2, excuse me, which is March and April, south of 4010, reopened for the first time to commercial ground fish fishing for lingcod. Shelf stocks, which include minor shelf, canary, boccaccio, widow, and chili pepper rockfishes, and nearshore stocks, which include black rockfish, nearshore rockfish complex, California scorpion fish, cabazon, and kelp greenling since 2003. Activity during this period for the shelf stocks was slightly higher than expected, though year to date commercial landings of shelf stocks are tracking higher than previous years. These landings are projected to be within limits. Um, landings from the commercial nearshore fleet during period two were lower than anticipated. Uh, CDFW will provide additional catch updates throughout 2021, including catch information on new species of interest. And I'll just draw attention to table one. This is the both combined recreational and commercial um, information on catch um, against those appropriate tracking limits and the percent attainments. Um, and as you can see, all of them are fairly low this, for this early in the season as expected, um, with the exception of, I know there's uh, generally some extra to shelf rockfish in the south and our vermilion rockfish, um, which is tracking similar to last year. Um, and with that, in the interest of time, I'll pause and make sure there are no uh, further questions. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, questions for Caroline on the uh, CDFW report? Nope, okay, very good. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you. Okay, next up, uh, we'll go to the GMT report and uh, Mel Bandrup. Mel? Hi, good afternoon, Council. Can you hear me okay? We can. Excellent. I'm Mel Mandrup. I'm with the Groundfish Management Team, and I will be reading the team's report on in season adjustments, final action. The GMT discussed the current status of the groundfish fisheries, requests from industry, and any needs for in-season adjustments during the June 2021 Pacific Fishery Management Council meeting. Today before you have one action item, and that is um, for canary rockfish open access north of 4010 trip limit. The GMT received a request from a California fisherman to increase the open access canary rockfish North of 4010 trip limit from 1,000 pounds per two months to 1,500 pounds per two months. The rationale for the request was to reduce regulatory discarding as the weather improves over several months and effort increases. This is especially a this is especially of concern in the newly reopened area between 30 and 40 fathoms, where industry has reported large numbers of canary rockfish. The current trip limit for the yellowtail rockfish is 1,500 pounds um, per month. And for widow rockfish, fish, it is 2,000 pounds per two months. And um, I apologize that that line was left in there as a reference to um, potentially other species that um, may be caught in addition to, to um, canary 
and uh, wanting to make sure that if we could increase the 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 canary trip limit, um, it would be similar to those uh, trip limits. Uh, so, and if not, regulatory discarding may be occurring. Um, as a reminder, canary rockfish is a coastwide stock with harvest guidelines for the fisheries that operate within the non trawl sector. For the 2021-22 biennium, Council preferred to combine the AHGs for the commercial nearshore and non-nearshore fisheries, providing the commercial sector an HG of 126 metric tons. Table 1 shows the canary rockfish HGs for 2021-22, uh, and this table was taken directly out of the 2021-22 analytical document that we used for the harvest specifications management measures process. So table one, you see your sectors within um, the, that are uh, the fisheries within the non trawl allocation and um, their HGs for uh, this year and next year. All canary rockfish trip limits, uh, that would be limited entry and open access, both north and south of 4010, that went into effect January 1, 2021, had a combined estimated mortality projection of 75 metric tons of the 125, 126.6 uh, metric tons of the HG, uh, as seen in table 4-100 of the 2021-22 uh, analytical document. To date, commercial non trawl landings of canary rockfish are tracking higher than um, higher than January through June of 2020 and the average January through June landings of 2017 through 2019. Current projections show the commercial non trawl fisheries. Uh, at 25 point, uh, 24.5% of the HG through uh, June 2021. And uh, the table above uh, kind of shows the uh, status, tro status quo trip limits and then um, where we are tracking currently. Additionally, the, the council chose to increase the canary rockfish trip limit in the open access uh, fishery north of 4010 from 300 pounds per two months to 1000 pounds per two months as part of the 21-22 harvest specifications and management measures package. With a January 1, 2021 impl implementation date for the current trip limit, discard data is not yet available to determine whether ves vessels are reaching that 1000 pounds uh, uh, limit and whether there is a need for additional opportunity beyond the newly implemented increase. Therefore, the GMT does not recommend uh, increasing canary rockfish uh, trip limit for the open access fishery north of 4010. The GAP inquired about the interactions of canary rockfish with other nearshore rockfish uh, due to time and other high priority agenda items. The GMT did not analyze the full extent of the interactions, but a preliminary look uh, confirmed vessels that land canary rockfish sometimes also land nearshore rock stocks on the same trip. The GMT notes that the West Coast Groundfish Observer Program Groundfish Expanded Multi-Year Mortality Report includes total mortality estimates for canary rockfish in the nearshore fishery. And I believe Kenyon Hensel kind of spoke to that um, yesterday when talking about the nearshore fishery off Northern California. Informational items, uh, stable fish daily trip limit. In appendix one, the GMT provides the 2021 landing projections for the limited entry north of 36, the open access north of 36, the limited entry south of 36. Sorry, turn off the phone. Uh, in the stable fish daily trip limit fishery, um, compared to each sector's 2021 landed target, uh, landed share, and then projections for the open access fishery south of 36 are provided are not provided because uh, fewer than 27 metric tons have been landed since it landed annually since. 2017, with a range of one to six percent attainment of the target during that time. 
As of June 23rd, the AOS sector sector's landings are tracking higher than those of 2020, but lower than those of the previous years. And that can be seen down below in Appendix 1. The GMT uh, requests input from the Council on whether in-season updates of the Sablefish DTL fishery are helpful when there are no requests to adjust trip limits and whether they should be included in future reports. Moving on to Chinook Salmon Scorecard. So Table 3 shows uh, the Chinook Salmon Catches from Ground Fish Fisheries and Exempted Fishery Permits as of June 26, 2021 in relation to the sector thresholds. So in Table 3, we can see um, overall we are doing well, um, staying well within our, the thresholds for each sector. Uh, and we've provided the breakdown of uh, each subsector and um, the percent of threshold um, for each of those subsectors. And uh, I'll note the for the midwater trawl item, that 29 um, Chinook catch to date uh, is inclusive of those EFP numbers that you see below in table 24 that says there's been 28 uh, Chinook part of that midwater trawl. So that 29 does have that 20 in there. Short belly rockfish scorecard, uh, table five estimates, estimates that 146.6 metric tons of short belly rockfish have been taken as of June 26, 2021. The GMT notes the short belly rockfish is once again available on the public groundfish scorecard uh, on the the PACFIN um, reports dashboard, and there's a link provided for you. Since the data, data is publicly available, the GMT requests guidance from the council on continued inclusion of this table in future season reports. So here you have um, our short belly um, Amounts taken to date, um, total is, uh, again, 146.6 metric tons. And then uh, we have the Rebuilding Species Scorecard. Um, no updates since the April 2021 meeting. And that is um, toward the end. That is at the end of this report, um, if you were to scroll all the way to the last page. Um, I'm happy to walk through the sablefish um, tracking figures if you'd like. Otherwise, um, I'm more than happy to take any questions from council if there are any. Hey, Mel. Thank you. Um, question for Mel on the uh, GMT report. Okay. I think you're good. Cool. Thank you. Have a good day. Hey, thank you. Okay, uh, next up is the uh, GAP report and uh, Gary Ricker. Gary? Yeah, good afternoon, Master Price Chair. Um, good afternoon, Council members. I'll be reading from Agenda Item G7A, Supplemental GAP Report 1, Ground Fish Advisory Subpanel Report on In Season Adjustments for 2021 Final Action. The GAP met with the Ground Fish Management Team to discuss progress of this year's fishery and possible in season adjustments. The GMT discussion was led by Ms. Melissa Mandrup. The GAP offers the following recommendations and comments on proposed in-season adjustments to ongoing groundfish fisheries. For fixed gear open access canary rockfish north of 4010 north latitude, fixed gear open access fishermen north of 4010 north latitude have requested an increase in the trip limits of canary rockfish. Fishermen report large numbers of canary rockfish have moved into their traditional fishing grounds and there are concerns they will have to start discarding canary. Increasing the canary trip limits would reduce the regulatory discarding that fishermen are anticipating will occur once better sea conditions arrive this summer. The open access canary trip limits were just recently increased in this area from 300 pounds per two months up to 1,000 pounds per two months as part of the 2021-2022 biennial harvest specifications process. The GAP agrees with the GMT to delay any further trip limit increases of canary rockfish until that time at which landings data from 2021 can be analyzed. Following that analysis, there may be room for an increase in the canary trip limits for open access fixed gear 
for 2022. And Mr. Vice Chair, that completes our gap statement. Be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Gary. Uh, questions for Gary on the gap report? All right. Thanks, Gary. All right. Have a good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, you too. Okay, that um, finishes uh, the reports. And I do not see any public comment cards for this agenda item. Correct. Okay, which would uh, which would take us to um, council action, which is to adopt final in season adjustments for 2021 as necessary to achieve but not exceed annual catch limits and other management objectives. And with that, I'll open up the floor. Marcy Rimko. Marcy? Uh, thanks very much to the GMT and the GAP uh, for their reports. And I also want to send a special shout out to ODFW for their in-season report describing the management activities in their nearshore fishery. Um, it's very helpful for us to understand what's going on at the state level um, and their activities related to management of the nearshore fishery uh, under their state authorities. So um, that was very useful and much appreciated uh, that report. Um, on the one action item that was uh, brought uh, forward for consideration on a proposal to increase the Canary Rockfish OA limit north of 4010, um, want to thank the GMT for their look at the available data and their uh, prudent thinking here on the fact that we just provided a fairly substantial increase uh, in this limit uh, with our new biennial specs. Um, looks like folks have uh, begun to utilize that opportunity, which is a good thing, um, but certainly support um, their recommendation uh, and the GAPS recommendation not to increase the trip limit at this time. Uh, the gap suggests maybe um, after next year, um, or maybe in next year after we've been able to review uh, the full 2021 20, uh, data that's available um, on our attainment. Um, as you can see, our uh, look at table two, um, taken 25% and that was in the early months of the year. So um, it's difficult to project uh, fishing activity that might occur over summer and into fall. So I really support, uh, appreciate their, their thinking on this and their uh, eye toward precaution. Um, on the GMT's question about whether in-season updates of Sablefish DTL are helpful when there's no request or increases, um, gosh, I I would say that um, in the interest of minimizing your workload, um, maybe if I mean it would be nice for folks to take a look at the numbers and um, determine if they need to report to us or not. I kind of like to leave it uh, at your discretion. Um, we may not need all of the figures that uh, are helpful to us when we are considering actual proposals. But um, anyway, that's just my off the cuff thought on that. On the salmon scorecard, I really want to thank the GMT for uh, table three and also table four um, and the, just describing to us uh, where the different numbers come from. I would say that, you know, since table three uh, now includes the information, or I'm sorry, table four now includes the information from table three that maybe we don't need a table four um, all of the time, but um, it's nice to see it here. And I really appreciate um, you recalling that discussion uh, from our last meeting and our need to kind of pull all of the uh, Chinook bycatch together in one place. Um, so really appreciate that. Um, and it's also nice to acknowledge that we are uh, well within our allowable thresholds and that's good news for all of us. 
uh, short belly. Um, even though the data is publicly available on the PACFIN reports dashboard, I um, really appreciate um, seeing it here in the in-season report. It doesn't look like this is a huge lift to paste this in, uh, in each in-season report. Um, at least I don't think it is. Um, but this is certainly, I think, helpful to, to get a, you know, take 15 seconds to look at where we are and, and what activity has occurred uh, to date this year. So um, anyway, just uh, really appreciate the work of the GMT uh, and the gap in their coordination and their um, evaluation of in-season activities. Thank you, Marcy. Um, Heather Hall, Heather. Thank you, Vice Chair Pettinger. Um, I also appreciate the GMT and the gap reports and um, where the recommendation landed relative to the request to increase the open access canary rockfish uh, limit north of 4010, uh, given this is a new trip limit already and very little time to see how it's going and, and how we might end up with the at the end of this year, um, I think the recommendation from the GMT and, and the support um, on that recommendation from the GAP is a good one. Um, and as Mar Marcy was talking about the uh, request for feedback on the Sablefish um, updates that the GMT have been providing, I I wasn't sure what the history of the those um, updates were, if it was something that maybe the council had asked for, I I just uh, had, didn't really think of it and thought exactly where Marcy was headed with, uh, you know, saving the GMT some time. And um, I commented at our morning delegation meeting that um, the GMT report for in-season is eight pages <laughs> with a lot of um, informational um information on catch that I, I think is valuable um, and was thinking we could say, you know, maybe just reserve the Sablefish updates um, until there's a request for in-season changes. But um, thanks to Corey who reminded me that, you know, maybe those updates actually uh, signal to the GAP or other industry members where things are and, and give them uh, a way to evaluate whether to put forward a request um, to increase trip limits. And so I hadn't uh, thought of that. And so wanted to just um, mention that that might be a, a reason to keep those um, Sablefish updates in the GMT report. Um, and then relative to the short belly, keeping the short belly um, updates in the report, even though they're available on the on the PACFIN website, I, I think there's value to keeping them in the in-season uh, informational section of the report. Um, I find them valuable and I, I don't know if everybody knows how to use the PACFIN reports dashboard, although I, I know um, PACFIN's worked really hard to simplify that and make it very user-friendly. I just thought it would be good to have two different um, ways for um, folks to access that information. So uh, thank you, that's it. Okay, thank you, Heather. And uh, a good point, uh, Corey had a good point there, I think, of the Sablefish. Uh, further discussion? Okay, um, seeing none, um, Todd, I look to you. I think we've had some good discussion here, but uh, no real action, so I'll turn to you to confirm that yes thank you mr vice chair i would agree with your uh with your analysis there that the council has had good discussion but yet did not take any action based on um based on that discussion so uh, i would say that you're concluded well, well, thank well, you well, not quite yet i see phil had his oh. hand up before you uh, completed this oh, terribly sorry uh phil oh no need for apology uh, i just um uh, i i we are um, we are losing one of our really outstanding GAP members, I believe. Um, Sarah Nayani has um, uh, written a 
council a letter letting us know that um, she'll be stepping away from her from her gap duties. And uh, I I may be mistaken, but I thought this was uh, the last um, item gap item here at this meeting. And I just wanted to acknowledge Sarah's outstanding contribution to not only the gap but the council process. Uh, she's uh, really contributed a great deal, not only in representing uh, the sector of her particular interest, but uh, really way, has uh, weighed in and helped the gap uh, on a broader perspective. So just a shout out to Sarah for doing such a great job. Yeah, thanks all that, Phil. But, um, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, Maggie Summer, Maggie? Thank you, Vice Chair, and boy, would I like to second that. Um, so thank you for remembering uh, that this was the last ground fish item, and I, I would also like to uh, echo the, the value that I think Sarah has brought to the process um, in terms of bringing people together, sharing information, and, and really reaching out and, and being uh, just an, an exemplary model of, of contributing to this process and, and bringing, uh, bringing a lot of positivity to it. So uh, I admire that and appreciate it and wish her the best. Thanks, Maggie. Uh, Chuck Tracy. Chuck? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I also wanted to thank Sarah for her, her contributions, uh, not, and not just to the gap, but, you know, uh, when we first met her, she was uh, working for National Marine Fisheries Service in the region and uh, was a uh, a real asset uh, to that division. And um, we uh, were really, uh, really missed her when she left NIMS, but, uh, but she couldn't have gone to a, a place where she would have been uh, uh, any more valuable to us than, than the gap. And she's done an outstanding job. Um, as Phil mentioned, uh, not just representing her uh, sector, but, uh, but uh, pitching in uh, to, uh, you know, understand issues, and uh, uh, she's been uh, a real asset in terms of making uh, uh, making sure that statements are uh, clearly communicating their message. And uh, um, she's just been great to have. And uh, uh, I'm just hoping she goes someplace else that uh, that uh, she's not going to leave the council completely behind because uh, we really value her presence. Uh, but uh, but uh, in any event, we uh, we wish her. The best in in uh, whatever uh, her next endeavors are. But uh, thank you so much, Sarah, for your contributions to the council uh, process and for being such a great uh, council family member. Thanks, Chuck. Um, I just uh, saw a, um, a in the chat there that uh, Dan Moldex said Sarah will be reading the future workload statement for the GAP, so we'll have the chance to speak to her then. And I would say that she isn't online, but. Uh, um, uh, thanks, Dan, for pay, uh, pointing that out. And uh, I don't think she's online right now, actually, but she can certainly read her uh, all the kudos that, that she so richly deserves. Uh, Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'll try to be brief. And the reason I want to say something about Sarah now is a lot of people don't stick around maybe for that long in the agenda. And it seems like we've got to, sometimes we have a smaller attendance and I want to make sure that more people have the opportunity to hear it. But I I can't say enough about Sarah's uh, contributions to this process, and not just in her own fishery, but I will comment on some of the things that she did in 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 support of her fishery as well. But I'm just an outstanding job. I just I'm lucky to be a member of the of the U.S. Canada Whiting Advisory Panel and the U.S. Advising Advisory Panel, and her work there this year and all through it was has been just amazing and I, I i can't say enough about how how much it it meant to the to the result that we did end up with this year and how in supporting the justifying that the fact that we maybe didn't come to an agreement but we did come to a successful place and lar in large part to her her contributions and then i'd also say that she's been such a such a great support to mrep the mrep program that the council values and and she just you know she's always giving of herself and and to the better of all so i'm going to miss her greatly so i hope she comes back so thank you sarah 
Thank you, Bob. Well, we can certainly hope. <laughs> uh, Butch Smith. Butch? Yeah, Mr. Vice Chair, and I just like to echo what everybody said about Sarah, and uh, I know we're short on time and got a long ways to go, and I, I just, a true, a true rock star of this process, and uh, I thank her for all her dedication and working with the SAS and working with the Chucklehead from El Waco and, uh, you know, trying to educate us all. She's a, a real class act. So thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, for this opportunity. Good said better myself, uh, Butch. Thank you. Okay. And with that, um, Todd, I'll turn to you so you can officially wrap us up here. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, same remarks as before. I believe that the business for the for this item has been uh, completed, and thank you very much. All right. Okay. Um, and with that, uh, we'll go straight to um, C4 and uh, Carrie. Uh, yes. Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair and Council Members. Uh, this is Agenda Item C4, Marine Planning. Um, Pacific Council involvement with marine planning, especially with offshore wind and aquaculture, has increased quite a bit over the past year or so. Um, the Biden-Harris administration has set ambitious renewable energy goals, as have many coastal states. And the first full-scale commercial offshore wind project was approved in early May off the coast of Massachusetts. So there's a lot of um, momentum with um, offshore wind and um, aquaculture as well. Um, the original purpose of this agenda item was to give the council a chance to decide how you wanted to be structured to address marine planning issues. Um, as you recall, up till recently, marine planning has appeared on um, the council agendas, the March agenda, um, once per year, and it has been largely an update, um, and, but without um, a lot of, um, you know, sort of heavy involvement. Um, however, that is um, changing, obviously. So um, the, the, there was a four-state report in uh, April from the April council meeting that asked the council executive director, Chuck Tracy, to evaluate several options for um, formulating uh, your council and advi and or advisory bodies. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, that uh, that response is attachment one um, in the June briefing book materials. Uh, Chuck will cover that in a little bit. Um, also, more recently, there's been some movement in the offshore wind planning process. There was a May 25th Department of the Interior press release announcing an agreement between BOEM, Department of the Interior, Department of Defense, and uh, the state of California on advancing offshore wind uh, off California. Um, and that press release also announced the intent to move forward the Morro Bay 399 area and the Humboldt Call area as potential wind energy development areas. Um, also in the briefing book materials is an announcement from the California State Lands Commission on the availability of a preliminary environmental assessment on offshore wind projects in state waters off of uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base. So we thought it would be prudent to ask BOEM um, to provide an update on recent activities um, and up upcoming activities that the council should be aware of. Um, so Nessie Sumite uh, is here with us today from BOEM and she'll give a verbal update on activities. We also have Dr. James Morris with the um, NOAA's Ocean Service to give a brief update on um, the status and upcoming activities with regard to NOAA aquaculture opportunity areas. There's a bullet list in the situation summary with some um, you know, up, upcoming dates. I won't go through those because I think our guests will cover those, but I do want to bring your attention to the last bullet point um, which identifies the week of July 19th for a PFMC BOEM meeting as a sort of deep dive into data, mapping, impacts, um, and all sorts of other um, uh, offshore wind-related issues and concerns. We've now narrowed those dates down to July 22nd and 23rd. There's a Federal Register notice that'll be going out soon. We're working on meeting details. Um, it probably won't be all day the 22nd and all day the 23rd, um, but again, we're working out those details, um, a meeting description, agenda, principles, things like that. Um, also in your briefing book materials, there is an ODF&W report one 
Um, there are eight supplemental advisory body reports and there's public comment. Um, and I think I already mentioned the uh, executive director's report is attachment one and then the two um, press releases were attachments two and three. Um, so after this overview, we'll turn to Nessie and then to James for their verbal updates. And then Chuck is going to summarize his evaluation of the four state report. Then we'll move to reports and comments of management entities and advisory bodies. And then there's also some public comment. Council action today is to review recent activity and provide guidance on a process and a schedule for future council engagement. So that concludes my um, overview of the agenda item. I'm happy to take any questions about that. And if not, then we can turn to Nessie and then to James. Okay, very good. Thank you, Kerry. Questions for Kerry on his overview? Okay. Seeing none, I'll go to uh, Nessie Sumite. Nessie, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? Uh, we can. Great. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair and Council Members. Um, my name is Nessie Sumite. I'm the Chief of the Renewable Energy Section at the Pacific Office of the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management of Rome. So I just want to thank you for allowing me to address you for a few minutes today to give a brief update on BOEM's offshore wind planning efforts on the West Coast. Um, as you're aware, BOEM is engaged in offshore wind planning in Oregon and California. So since we last spoke to the council in March, we are continuing offshore wind energy outreach and engagement in Oregon. Um, in May, BOEM and the Oregon Department of Land, Conservation and Development hosted a virtual informational set of meetings to update the public on the data information collected um, during the planning phase so far. And we've also begun a dialogue with the Oregon Dungeness Crab Commission and the Oregon Trawl Commission that we presented at their commission meetings earlier this spring. We're looking forward to meeting with the fishermen involved in natural energy or fine from Lincoln County and Fishermen's Advisory Committee for Tillamook County in July. So BOEM and DLCD are also um, planning a fisheries virtual workshop in August to review fisheries related data that's in Aura Wind map and to gather feedback to inform um, future offshore wind leasing offshore of Oregon. In California, um, as Gary mentioned on May 25th, the Secretary of the Interior Deb Holland, National Climate Advisor Gina McCarthy, the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, Dr. Callan Call and California Governor Gavin Newsom announced an agreement to advance areas for offshore wind off the northern and central coast of California. That announcement also included a date for a California task force meeting on June 24th, 2021, which was an inadvertent overlap with the PFMC meeting. So sorry for that. Um, BOEM has rescheduled the date for the task force meeting to July 13th, 2021. Um, everyone is welcome to attend a task force meeting, um, but we do ask that you register on our, our website. Um, you have been aware that BOEM identified call areas offshore California in 2018. So those call areas were located on the north and central coast, and we had been not able to identify areas and move forward with the leasing process. So I'm pleased that with the announcement that, and after years of collaboration between the Department of Interior, the Department of Defense and the state of California to find areas that's offshore the central coast that could be compatible with the Department of Defense's training and testing operations. Um, I think we now have a path forward for leasing in California. On the North Coast, we will be advancing the humble call area as a potential wind energy area for environmental review under the National Energy Policy Act, or NEPA, for potential lease issuance. Um, if fully developed, this area could accommodate about 1.6 gigawatts of offshore wind. And on the central coast, we have identified an area. Um, we kind of call it the Mora Bay 399 area because it's an area roughly 399 square miles in size. Um, if fully developed, that will support three gigawatts of offshore wind um, off the, the central coast, northwest of Morro Bay. So this 399 area includes a portion of the original Morro Bay call area that was identified in 2018, uh, and also areas to the west of the Morro Bay call area extending to 1300 meter water depth 
and then an area to the east that was discussed by the offshore working group led by U.S. Representative Carbajal. So in, in partnership with California, BOEM will hold the Intergovernmental Renewable Energy Task Force meeting uh, on July 13th. And hopefully, you know, that's that's good to avoid um, PFMC meetings. And in during that task force, we'll discuss further the identified areas on the north and central coast and the leasing um, process for uh, going forward in California. And BOEM will also undertake um, government to government tribal consultations as those are requested. Um, I again want to reiterate our willingness to continue engagement with the council and its advisory bodies and committees to review the data that we've gathered, to identify the data we don't have, to identify fishing entities we should be engaging with, and to hopefully assist us in convening them to inform BOEM's future decisions on offshore wind leasing. Um, as Carrie said, we've been in discussions with PMC, PFMC staff about scheduling a couple of webinars in July, which we hope will allow for sufficient time to dive into the data that's currently available. Um, so we're looking forward to those webinars uh, on July 22 and 23. Um, so that's the brief update that I have for you, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Nessie. Um, Questions for Desi on uh, her overview? Uh, Chuck Tracy, Chuck? Uh, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, not a question, just wanted to uh, thank Nessie for coming and, and uh, spending some time with us here today, and but also especially for their willingness to reschedule the uh, task force meeting so that our council could attend. I thought that was uh, very uh, very generous of, of her, so I appreciate that. and. Uh, Look forward to um, seeing how things go there. So thanks very much, Nessie. Great, thank you. Mr. Vice Chair? Uh, we hear you. All right, I didn't hear acknowledgement. Thank you, this is Karin Brady from ODFW. Thanks so much for your update, uh, Nessie, appreciate it. and. Uh, just had a, a question for you about future looking um, and thoughts about um, public engagement for uh, the maybe the, the Oregon process, for example, on um, moving from the mapping uh, portion of the process to identification of call areas and how um, how the PFMC may uh, engage in that and provide input on that part of your process? Sure. Um, I think, you know, as, as, you know, providing the, to make sure that we have the right, the right data that we're working with and characterizing it properly is, is probably, you know, key. Um, just from a timing perspective, right now we're continuing with our engagement with the different fishing groups. Um, and the, the goal is to, maybe even have a, uh, an August webinar um, with some of the other groups that maybe we may have missed. Um, so any input in, in terms of, you know, um, making sure that we catch everyone, um, that would be good as well. And then the the plan is that um, in the September, October timeframe, we would provide to the task force a um, sort of a status of where we are with data gathering. Um, and then kind of look to see beginning, um, you know, to see where potential call areas uh, would be available um, for for leasing probably the end of the year. So that's kind of generally our time frame. Um, and as we move through the process, um, we're hoping to continue to refine the data to make sure that um, we we have you know the right the right data. But from a timing perspective, that's kind of when input would be most useful. Um, to us is before the, um, I think the end of, like by before September, October, but you know, clearly we're gathering data um, all along the process, right? Um, because what happens in the call simply is to um, refine the polygons. Right now we're, we're gathering data all along the coast of Oregon. And so um, but then we'll start to focus on, on areas like polygons along the coast on which we're going to ask for specific data review and it goes through the, the um, uh, government uh, 
that gov that govs um, for comments, and then it's not until um, that call goes through a public comment period, in which we then identify window that down further to identify areas that we would call wind energy areas on which we will do environmental review for lease issuance. Um, so there's no cutoff in terms of um, when we would want data, but I just provide those timelines in terms so that you you can sort of gauge um, potential council involvement. So I don't know. Great. If, no. Yeah, no, that's great. And Vice Chair, if I can have a follow up question, please. Um, uh, I think that that certainly um, starts to to remind us all of what that process looks like. And so my um, attention goes to the beginning of next year when the call areas will be published or released and there will be an additional public comment period, which could be a, a period of time that would be appropriate for PFMC input. And just asking if, if I heard you correctly. Yeah, because then there'll be, I mean, we'll take comments now to help us define even those polygons. Um, if, you know, if the data suggests that, but clearly you will see in the call areas more specific polygons to comment on. So that might sort of narrow the, the sphere of review. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Court. Uh, for the question for Nessie. Uh, Louis, Louis? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thank you for coming and talk to us today, Nessie. I would really appreciate you. Any input that Bohm gives us, um, you guys are, are definitely uh, uh, the peak of information on this. And uh, so <laughs> it's. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question that is, is not really more on the federal level, but do you have any information on how the uh, state uh, areas off of Arcuello, Vandenberg, and Plank Conception uh, are progressing for what what I think is an experimental wind farm. Farm. Uh, I'm very very interested in that. That is actually within state waters. Thank you. Yeah, I I, I think I heard Kerry um, mention that you have something in your attachment for a preliminary environmental uh, assessment from State Lands Commission. So I I would you know, ask you to refer to that. Um, you know, those are smaller projects, um, all within state waters. And I probably should stop at that. Oh, okay. Well, that that clear clears that up. I was I was unclear about the nexus uh, between uh, Boehm and and state efforts, and uh, I, I will go ahead and, and review that. Um, I didn't know it existed until today, and I'll spend some time with it. Thank you. Great, thanks. Thanks, Louie. Um, further questions? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Nessie, for coming and uh, speaking with us. Great, thanks. All right, next up we have uh, James Morris from the uh, NOAA Ocean Service. Uh, James, are you there? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Oh, uh, we can. Great, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and council members as well for the invitation to come and to give you an update on the aquaculture opportunity areas work. Um, as you may recall, the Executive Order um, 13921 called for the development of aquaculture opportunity areas um, around the nation. It calls for approximately 10 AOAs over the next seven years. Um, the Executive Order calls for spatial planning to occur in year one, followed by um, a programmatic EIS for those AOAs in years uh, two and three. It calls for identifying two AOAs over that three-year process. And so that would be essentially around seven years to complete the analysis of 10 AOAs. Um, the target size for aquaculture opportunity areas is less than 2,000 acres for the current planning process for the Gulf of Mexico and Southern California. Um, those two regions were identified as the first two regions for the AOA planning effort and, and uh, spatial planning effort and programmatic EIS development. We have completed stakeholder engagement and spatial planning uh, work for 
uh, Southern for the Southern California Bight, which is the geographical range of the first AOA um, efforts for California. And we are currently drafting atlases that describe that spatial planning work for both regions, the Gulf of Mexico and Southern California. We're excited about the spatial planning effort we have conducted for Southern California. And we have identified over 200 data layers that are included in the atlas. We have developed novel uh, modeling approaches for protected species and developed several other new data products that will be useful for other re regional marine planning efforts. We are grateful for the collaboration with BOEM and others as we have worked to develop those new data products. Um, the Atlas will identify approximately uh, six locations um, or AOA options in the Southern California Bight that, that our modeling work suggests have the highest suitability for aquaculture development. Um, these, um, these six um, options will be evaluated during the programmatic EIS process, which is slated to begin later this winter. Um, the atlases that we are currently writing um, will be going through an independent peer review process with the uh, Center for Independent Experts, after which we uh, plan to release publicly uh, sometime this fall. We are currently uh, looking at November 1st as the rollout for both atlases for the Gulf of Mexico and Southern California. Um, we really look forward to the next council meeting to be able to share with you an in-depth um, briefing on the results of the spatial planning work. And we hope that you'll make time for, for that briefing uh, at that time. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have today. All right, thank you, James. Um, questions for James? Okay. See none. Uh, thanks, James, for uh, coming today. Um, well, with that, we're going to go to uh, Chuck Tracy, I believe. Um, Chuck, are you there? Yep, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of briefly go over attachment one, which has been in the briefing book. Uh, since the, uh, in the advanced briefing book, I'm sure most, uh, most people have had a chance to look at it, but I'll, I'll, just, I'll just kind of uh, highlight some, uh, some aspects of it that, uh, that are still relevant. Um, so uh, at, a, at our April council meeting, um, I received a, a direction to analyze a, a proposal developed by the four states um, on uh, ways to engage in marine planning issues. Uh, in particular, offshore wind development. Um, so the proposal included four uh, tops, consideration of advisory bottle, body models, uh, use of working webinars to engage with BOEM and other agencies, council staff capacity, and council agenda time. So uh, so I, the analysis uh, is, was kind of based on, uh, on some assumptions, which I list out here. So um, the assumptions were that uh, the meetings uh, or actually webinars will be held to coordinate council stakeholder input with ocean development proponents, similar to the February 24th webinar that the Habitat Committee hosted. Uh, we assume that the coordination webinars uh, will occur prior to each council meeting with a scheduled marine planning agenda item. Um, the uh, council staff would be responsible for identifying coordination opportunities with action agencies or proponents uh, facilitating the coordination meetings and supporting the uh, marine planning advisory body. Uh, we would also provide uh, mapping expertise. <clears throat> so uh, staff and BOEM task force members uh, currently meet regularly with BOEM to update project status and plan for further interactions, uh, just like we've just had here with, uh, with Nessie and Jim, uh, so that we can uh, make sure and bring uh, important things to the council's attention. Uh, we also uh, just want to note that we have contracted with a consultant to provide mapping services on an ad needed, as needed basis. Um, we believe the other staffing needs can be met with, uh, with existing uh, resources here at the council staff. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, another assumption was that the council will plan for three agenda items per year to consider marine planning issues, uh, to develop recommendations and uh, approve letters and comments, et cetera. And just to note that we already have one uh, in March, so that would uh, so we would not add that would not be a fourth meeting, but that would we would just uh, add on to that meeting probably. That's 
So in any event, uh, plan for three uh, marine planning agenda items per year. Um, so uh, uh, I also did a budget uh, forecast that uh, I'll go over in, in a little bit, uh, but it's, uh, it's more of a context exercise than, a, than an actual uh, you know, budget expense, but um, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> So the uh, the four state uh, report requested uh, we look at four different uh, uh, models for advisory bodies uh, for for an advisory body to uh, to help coordinate uh, and uh, work on this for the council. Um, I'm not going to go over them in a lot of detail, but uh, the first one was that the Habitat Committee would serve that function, uh, would host coordination webinars and, and report to the council. Uh, the second one was that, uh, that similar to that, only there would be some uh, additional uh, positions established in the Habitat Committee to augment the expertise uh, to help with these marine planning activities. The third model was that a new advisory body would be established uh, to attend and report on coordination webinars that would uh, have a broad range of expertise uh, necessary. And then uh, the fourth model was that uh, they would simply task uh, all the advisory bodies uh, sort of simultaneously to attend and report on the coordination webinars that uh, that would be uh, basically hosted and conducted uh, primarily by uh, by council staff and uh, and then the proponents. Uh, so there's uh, <clears throat> there's some list of you know, potential positions uh, that are probably. Uh, uh, cover, uh, you know, all possibilities there. So, um, but I think there's probably been enough discussion that I'm not going to go over those too close, uh, too closely right now. And um, just save that for the advisory body reports, their feedback on those and council discussion. Um, I did, uh, I did do a budget exercise just to, again, to provide context using basically the same methodology we use uh, when in the past we've applied mm -hmm. Uh, for uh, special project funding. So uh, again, this this isn't uh, this wouldn't be the extra amount of money that we would need to do these uh, because there would be, you know, some things are uh, fixed costs. Uh, this, this is mostly designed to just sort of provide context for uh, relative to other aspects of council business. You know what this would where this would uh, align with with those. So. <clears throat> Um, basically, what what this analysis says is that uh, adding uh, this sort of effort in terms of the uh, you know three uh, council meetings per year to uh, to work on these uh, green planning issues, uh, uh, increasing the um, number of advisors um, and uh, time for the advisory bodies to deal with these. Uh, the time the council spends on the on the council floor with it and, and whatnot. So uh, so basically, what this what this effort suggests is that uh, marine planning uh, would consume about three percent of the council's budget, uh, also about three percent of the council floor time, uh, roughly it would be roughly equivalent to uh, what ecosystem or halibut would be over the course of, uh, of a typical year. Um, I would I would say that uh, I'm not sure that uh, you know the assumption here was an hour and a half of the uh, council time per meeting i'm not sure that uh, you know that if that would be adequate um, but uh but that that was the, the assumption made um i'd also say that you know while three percent of, of the council time i think it would represent probably a little bit more of some of the advisory body time um you know the council's on the floor for 44 hours and an hour and a half out of 44 is three percent but you know the advisory bodies uh Many of them meet, uh, you know, two to five days worth, and, uh, and they'd probably spend uh, three hours developing their statements and whatnot. So a larger percentage of, of advisory body uh, time would be consumed, I think, in this effort. But, uh, but regardless, that just gives you a general context of, of what this would, um, what sort of effort would be required. Um, some other points to make about this, uh, you know, establishing uh, some sort of lead out advisory body implies that the council itself wants to provide direct input to action agencies based on input from the advisory bodies. 
Um, so which would, this would typically occur through the formal communication such as council approved letters or public comment uh, uh, portal submission. Um, so, you know, that, that's a very structured process that, uh, that we're all familiar with. Uh, I did just want to point out that, you know, that some of the other uh, uh, avenues, I guess, for communication to occur that, that may or may not be uh, the primary uh, route would be that, uh, you know, um, the council could authorize advisory body representatives and council members for that matter to attend workshops hosted by either the council or another action agency and then allow the action agency to just assimilate the results of the workshop uh, more directly as opposed to uh, waiting for the council to um, receive its reports from its advisory bodies develop some recommendations you know uh, coordinating those uh, recommendations and uh, sending a formal letter uh, so in summary, uh, I think expanding the council's involvement with marine planning issues is feasible from a fiscal perspective, uh, at least in the near term. Uh, council staffing resources are also sufficient uh, to meet this objective. Um, the state and federal agencies will have to decide if they have adequate staffing uh, resources to populate uh, any expanded advisory body needs. Um, but uh, both agency and council staffs may have to restructure or redirect efforts from other activities and priorities or otherwise add capacity to accommodate this proposal. And then finally, the council should think strategically about how to absorb this additional workload and floor time and how it fits within its statutory and discretionary obligations and priorities. Uh, I would just say that uh, that last statement is uh, something that uh, could be said about uh, you know, any, any of the council's uh, efforts really. So um, anyway, that, that uh, concludes my uh, brief summary of that uh, report. Um, if you've got any questions, be happy to answer them. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, questions for Chuck? Karen uh, Brady, Karen? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Chuck. I, I appreciate your, your um, overview of the report, which I've read, but I gleaned more of your thinking just from the overview. So I appreciate it. Um, and uh, I wanted to pause on that last uh, sentence and the comment on strategically absorbing workload. And, and I'm, I'm pleased that through your analysis of the budget and staffing that you feel like the council is prepared to um, meet this this need if the council so determines that that it is a need and, and additional engagement is desired and required. Um, so thank you for going through that process. But what, what I'm wondering is, you know, you've you've laid out an analysis of option C, which is a, a fairly large um, uh, advisory body concept. And I'm wondering if there are scalable elements in your thinking that's within your analysis of option three that would decrease budgetary impacts, decrease staffing impacts, decrease council uh, floor time impacts to get maybe at that strategic uh, concept a little bit more. And um, if you have more details in your thinking, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so uh, there's I, that, there's not much scalable in there. I think uh, the 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 financial costs of of a very large advisory body is, is one, um, and and so uh, that uh, that aspect I think would be scalable, but but frankly I, I you know the rest of it I think uh, are um, you know the uh, uh, the tasks are going to be the same. Uh, the uh, staffing needs, uh, we're going to be staffing a large advisory body or a small advisory body uh, or an expanded advisory body, perhaps. Uh, so I, I don't think there's a, a lot of scaling there. We've, we've already uh, contracted with a, um, somebody to do GIS mapping on an as-needed basis. So we've got that placeholder. Uh, council floor time is still going to be, you know, council still going to have to work through the issues. Uh, they're still going to get reports from uh, probably 
you know, a good chunk of their other advisory bodies on these issues. So I, I don't think there's a lot. Uh, I don't think there's a lot scalable, uh, other than other than perhaps the uh, you know the financial impact of uh, of having uh, you know having modeled such a large advisory body. And 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 on that last point, that's part of my question: is scaling the size of the advisory body? Um, will there be significant uh, impacts? Budgetarily, it's it's not clear from the budget to me what is what is scalable. For example, travel or in-person meeting time or things like that um, per diem yeah. to members, things like that. Yeah. So basically, all of that is in the sort of in the travel line. I would say. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, staffs, salary, wages, personnel benefits. That's all going to be the same. Uh, goods and supplies are, are minor. Um, contractual is uh, uh, primarily the um, uh, GIS uh, mapping per function. Um, yep. there, there's probably some other, uh, looks like there's must be, some, oh, there's a council member compensation is also in there. So that's, that would all presumably stay the same. I didn't model any uh, council member attendance at that things. Uh, so really, it, it'd be the travel line. So that would be the only thing that would be different. So, you know, uh, on an annual basis, you're looking at, uh, uh, you know, 20, say 24,000 out of, uh, you know, 165. So, you know, if you had a much smaller uh, advisory body, and again, you know, we don't pay for any of the federal members. Uh, there, there's basically no cost to us there. So uh, anyway, you know, I don't know if you, you, know, you could cut that in half, maybe. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not a huge chunk of the of the cost. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks, Laura. Uh, further discussion? Uh, Phil Anderson. Phil? Uh, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Chuck, um, I guess the thing that is uh, most concerning, well, I don't know if it's most concerning, it is a concern, is the, at least for my chair, the likelihood that the estimate for the amount of time or time this will take is is uh, underestimated. Mm -hmm. um, we, we seem to have, to have a tendency and it's, certainly been not out of the norm to spend five, six hours, seven hours on a single agenda item. And I, especially with the, with the, I think the challenges and the, and the newness, if you will, to the um, marine planning and all that's going to come with it, I, I have no confidence that we will spend a total of nine hours a year on it. But that's just me. Uh, thanks, Phil. Uh, yeah, I, I tend to agree. Um, you know, I, I think this was based on some discussions we had in April, and uh, and perhaps the sort of the uh, one example we had um, from the March meeting. So that you know, maybe the the part that. Uh, uh, that uh, covered the um, uh, February 24th Habitat Committee meeting, and that that, uh, that was sort of the, the example of our you know coordination uh, webinar in advance, and then the council floor time that resulted from that. So that's what that's based on. Uh, but but like you, I I do have a concern that that uh, that that you know the probability that that could go over I, I think is is real. Um, you know, again, uh, and but a lot of it depends, of course, on how much activity there is and how, you know, I mean, right now, yeah, I mean, th things are popping right now, you know, um, and, uh, you know, I think when we were first thinking about this, uh, you know, the administration, while uh, there were some, um, there was some activity uh, indicative of, of where the administration was going, 
I think uh, I think that's accelerated a bit, and I think it's provided some opportunities for some additional, um, uh, at, you know, some additional acceleration, I guess, of um, of issues. And so uh, I, I think you know we're probably feeling that uh, and seeing that right now. Um, I don't know if that's you know, how long that'll continue, but uh, but I, I agree. There's a there's a risk that uh, you know that an hour and a half uh, of council floor time is uh, perhaps unrealistic. Okay, for the questions, for Chuck uh, Carn, your hands up. No, thank you. Okay. Okay, seeing no hands, I'm gonna have some short-term marine planning here and uh, we're gonna take a break. Uh, we'll be back for two hours and five minutes. Uh, let's be back here at um, 3.15 and we'll start off um, with the ODFW report.
Okay, we'll get started here just uh, uh, just shortly here. Okay, um, and we're back on the C4 marine planning and um, middle of the reports. Um, Karen Braby, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I am going to go through this report uh, quickly. It is a supplemental report. However, it's been in the briefing book for some time. And the purpose of this report is truly informational and uh, to, as an example of process that's happening outside of the PFM, PFMC arena. Uh, and what this report is, is a one-page cover memo, essentially, of comments that we provided uh, from the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife to our sister agency partners uh, at the Department of Land Conservation and Development, who is Oregon's uh, Coastal Zone Management uh, Action Agency, state agency, and then from there to BOEM. Uh, and so this report is essentially um, our view of um, how the development of mapping layers has occurred so far, the status of that mapping process, and, and opportunities for improvements um, of the maps that exist within the Orowind map portal. So um, that uh, the um, the uh, the report essentially just gives an idea of what our uh, evaluation has been. And um, and gives a basically a list of, of the map layers that have been reviewed. Of note, this is only the the maps that relate specifically to fishery information, not to general ecosystem and habitat layers, which are still under review by our agency. Um, and so I, I hope that this will be an informative list and report for the council family at large. Uh, just to see what's happening, have assurance that that review is happening and those discussions are happening. And uh, as a, a caveat at the end of the report, I also want to note that there are a lot of, of opportunities for improvement of the information that's being used in the, in the planning process. However, uh, as an agency, ODFW has not identified the staff capacity or funding resources needed to uh, take those data that are available and put them in a format that could be integrated into the planning process. And so that is a barrier to um, uh, potentially to some uh, of this process moving forward. So with that, I'll, I'll stop. I'm happy to answer questions if there are any, but that gives you a sense of why we submitted this report. Okay, thank you, Karen. Questions for Karen on the ODFW report? Okay. Seeing none, thank you, Karen. Uh, next up is the Habitat Committee report and uh, Lance Hebden. Lance? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Can you hear me? We can. All right, uh, this is Lance Hebden, Chair of the Habitat Committee. I will be reading agenda item C4A, Supplemental Habitat Committee Report Number One. Habitat Committee Report on Marine Planning. Uh, Mr. Kerry Griffin provided an overview of this agenda item to the Habitat Committee. The HC considered the executive director's analysis of the four straight proposal on marine planning workload and focused its discussion on the four options for a marine planning advisory body, as well as an alternative submitted by the public by West Coast Pelagic Conservation. The HC identified pros and cons with each option. The Habitat Committee recommends option B which was in the executive director's analysis as a short-term option to address the immediate marine planning issues requiring council attention until a new advisory body is formed. For the long-term, the HC supports the formation of an independent advisory body that provides a strong stakeholder slash conservation presence, such as either a public option proposal submitted by the West Coast Pelagic Conservation or modifying option C to reduce the size and strengthen stakeholder representation. In support of our recommendations, the HC discussed the following points. 
The Habitat Committee has expertise on habitat issues, but expertise on fisheries, fishing, and ecosystem issues is needed for the group to be effective at analyzing and communicating concerns on other subject areas in the interim role. There are likely to be additional types of ocean development beyond wind energy and aquaculture under the marine planning umbrella that would better be better served by a new advisory body with broader experience or broader expertise. Meeting with representatives from other advisory bodies is challenging during council meetings due to overlapping schedules. Meeting outside the council's meeting could garner more participation and flexibility will be important to ensure broad participation. Webinars will allow more flexibility and additional meetings may be necessary to analyze Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management proposals. The BOEM task force is noted as a government body of government officials with no stakeholder, non-governmental organization or public membership. The Marine Planning Advisory Body should have a stronger stakeholder presence to provide this missing voice in the BOEM process. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, that completes the Habitat Committee report. Thank you, Lance. Uh, questions for Lance on the Habitat Committee report? Okay, seeing none, thanks Lance. Next up is the uh, CPS uh, management team report and uh, Trung Nguyen. Trung, are you there? Hi, yes, this is Trung. Can you guys hear me? Uh, we can. Okay, great. Hi, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and Council Members. My name is Trung Nguyen and I will be reading the uh, Coastal Plastic Species Management Team Report on Marine Planning for Agenda Item C4A. Uh, the Coastal Plastic Species Management Team has reviewed current materials on marine planning, including the Council analysis of the four state proposals on marine planning workload, and offers the following comments. With respect to Council agenda scheduling, and because the CPSMT does not regularly meet in March or September, the CPSMT would prefer marine planning scheduled for council meetings in June and November, as well as March, in order to increase potential CPSMT participation. Regarding the four options proposed for the makeup of marine planning advisory body, the CPSMT finds option C that relies on drawing members from outside the Habitat Committee and existing advisory bodies to be most effective at bringing in the necessary expertise, but the proposed number of participants may be both cost prohibited and too large to operate optimally. The council may wish to consider more broadly utilizing the liaison, mo liaison model to help reduce the number of members needed for option C. Ut utilizing this model should result in more cost efficient and effective group with fewer members that have the ability to bring additional expertise as needed. The proposed option D may not be as effective may not be an effective approach due to workloads and prioritizations of existing advisory bodies. The CPSMT also notes that the list of proposed participants for options C and D do not specify a tribal representative. That's my, our report. Yeah, thanks, Trung. Um, mm -hmm. Questions for Trung on the um, management team report? Okay, thank you. Um, next up is the CPS advisor subpanel and uh, Mike Okaniski. Mike. Yes, can you hear me, Mr. Chair, or Vice Chair? We can. Okay. I'll be reading from agenda item C4A, Supplemental CPSAS Report 1, Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel Report on Marine Planning. The Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel, CPSAS, is very concerned about present plans for offshore development that is likely to impact our fisheries. In fact, fishermen strongly oppose offshore development initiatives. Fishermen have been and are being excluded from the decision-making process. Concerns include the recently energized siting process underway for marine development in our West Coast economic, exclusive economic zone, specifically offshore energy OSW. In addition, in our March report, we enumerated several concerns about NOAA's Aquaculture Opportunity Areas Initiative, AOAs, one of which is located in Southern California. Regarding OSW in April of 2021, the Departments of Fish and Wildlife from California, Oregon, Washington, and Idaho issued a four-state report on marine planning at the April 2021 Council meeting, or four-state report. Mr. Chuck Tracy and council staff did an analysis of the four state report, agenda item C4 attachment one. Eight major 
fishing organizations submitted supplemental comments voicing their concerns for the probable loss of important fishing grounds and potential impacts to essential fish habitat. In addition, it has been expressed that the overall process of OSW permitting an analysis of potential economic loss to fisheries managed by the Pacific Fishery Management Council is not transparent, nor are impacts sufficiently analyzed and further, the process provides no forum for fishermen and fishing community input. This is a major oversight. For example, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, BOEM, East Coast Vineyard Offshore Wind Energy Project Environmental Impact Statement analysis predicts major impacts to East Coast fisheries. And that's in the Vineyard Wind 1 Supplemental to EIS PDF. There is immediate need to create an advisory body and forum for industry and other stakeholders to voice their concerns in a public venue and provide advice to the council. The CPSAS supports a modified version of option C found in the four state report and in the council staff analysis. We are also supporting recommendations contained in the C4 supplemental comments. This action follows traditional council practices as outlined in the four state reports. The council has a long-standing tradition of providing an inclusive forum for governments, scientific and industry experts, and interested and affected communities to effectively and efficiently bring information and advice together to inform the council's decisions and recommendations to NOAA Fisheries and other entities, four state report. The four states and continuing, the four states are interested in learning from the council's executive director about potential options for facilitating a PFMC advisory body engagement with offshore development. Additionally, in an October 13, 2013 council letter issued to the Department of Commerce, Dr. Don McIsaac stated, it is imperative that wind energy developers consult with the local fishing industry before projects are cited. The CPSAS concurs with the four state report and Dr. McIsaac, but the council does have a role to play advising agencies when their actions threaten our fisheries on our ocean or ocean environment. At the least, the public and full analytical process on impact should occur with fishery and council input before these citing actions are implemented. While there is a wealth of knowledge that the council and council staff possess, the advisory bodies also possess important supplemental knowledge. In addition, AB representatives are the closest to the stakeholders they represent. CPS, <coughs> excuse me, CPSAS recommendations. The CPSAS concurs with the Pacific Whiting Conservation Co-ops supplemental comments that contains recommendations on marine planning. One, state in a letter to BOEM that displacement of council managed fisheries and the scientific research that su supports sustainable fisheries is a conservation and management concern for the council. Two, indicate that meaningful engagement in the offshore development arena is important to the council and the council process. Three, establish a new advisory body specifically tasked with addressing offshore development and four, seek opportunities to collaborate with NIMS and other federal and state agencies in a coordinated effort to ensure an effective balancing of new offshore development with council managed fisheries, including identifying and securing resources and staff to support these efforts. And C4 supplemental public comment. The CPSAS also recommends an expansion of the third PWCC recommendation to include the following. Marine Planning Ad Hoc Advisory Body, MPAB, should be started as soon as possible after the June Council meeting. The MPAB should cover both OSW, Offshore Wind, and the NOAA Aquaculture Opportunity Area Initiative. Our concerns about the AOA initiative were shared by the Habitat Committee and other advisory bodies. The council has not provided an update by NOAA, has not been provided an update by NOAA about AOAs since the presentation in March, but we assume NOAA is continuing to advance that program along with OSW. <clears throat> the marine planning body 
needs to be nimble and responsive. The marine planning advisory body should be relatively small and be supported by scientific and other subject specialists that would not sit on the marine planning body. The CPSAS recommends a maximum of 15 members with representation from the CPSAS, Highland Migratory Species Advisory Subpanel, Groundfish Advisory Subpanel, Salmon Advisory Subpanel, HAP, the Habitat Committee and Ecosystem Advisory Subpanel, and the three states and NIMS. The Marine Planning Advisory Body would be responsible to inform the other ABs and the Council on Marine Offshore Development. The CPSAS believes the four state reports option C with the above suggested modifications should be the preferred council option. The specialist work would work with the MPAB to check present mapping accuracies, establish important past, present, and potential future harvest areas, and collect and collate fisheries and environmental data. Generating enough offshore wind energy electricity to meet the goals laid out by the present administration in the state will require thousands of wind turbines, large numbers of power cables, and will occupy thousands of square miles of ocean. NOAA's AOA initiative also threatens to usurp valuable fishing grounds. The need to form a council marine planning advisory body is immediate and important to every fishery on the West Coast. Thank you, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Mike. Questions for Mike on the uh, advisory subpanel report? Okay, thanks, Mike. Thank you. Next up is uh, Greg Bush in the EC report. Greg? Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair. I'll be reading Supplemental EC Report 1 for Agenda Item C4A, Enforcement Consultants Report on Marine Planning. The Enforcement Consultants have reviewed the documents pertaining to the Agenda Item C4, Marine Planning, and have the following comments. The EC does not have a preference on which Marine Planning Advisory Body option the Council chooses. However, should the Council select Option C, the EC recommends the MPAB follow the liaison model using the existing enforcement consultants. If option C, with only one enforcement seat is selected, the EC recommends that Mr. Chris German be assigned as primary and Lieutenant Leela Lingo as the alternate. This concludes our statement. Thanks, Greg. Um, questions for Greg on the EC report. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up is, um, Lynn Mattis and the GMT report. Lynn? Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, I take it y'all can, can still hear me? We can. All righty. This is agenda item C4A, supplemental GMT report uh, on the marine planning. We did receive an overview from Mr. Todd Phillips of the council staff on our June 10 webinar, and we reviewed the materials in the briefing book. Um, additionally, some members of the team were able to listen to the GAPS uh, June 25th briefing on this agenda. Um, no new information on proposed aquaculture wind energy sites has been provided since the April 2021 council meeting, so this report focuses on the council's future involvement in these processes. We acknowledge the importance of the issue to the fishing industry and the need to have knowledgeable individuals engaged, engaged in the process. However, the GMT, among others in the council process, are primarily tasked with accomplishing regulatory mandates, such as catch share program reviews, in-season tracking, and harvest specification, while addressing a number of other emerging ground fish fishery needs and requests by stakeholders. The team's ground fish specific priorities make it challenging to analyze or comment on all other items, including habitat and administrative, that affect ground fish fisheries. That being said, we would still like to remain appraised of any apprised of any marine planning issues pertinent to ground fish fisheries and have the option to weigh in as needed. For that reason, we recommend a flexible liaison model for options A, B, or C, uh, as outlined in attachment one, in which advisory bodies are invited to each habitat committee or marine planning advisory body meeting to serve as expert advisors on issues pertinent to their fishery management plan and would coordinate it with their respective council staff to determine if attendance is needed and or useful. 
This would allow the GMT to largely maintain focus on existing workload while also participating in the marine planning process as feasible. Under option D, adding three additional meeting days and nine additional hours of council floor time uh, that the GMT may, may need to track per year would divert time away from the team's existing obligations. Additionally, as part of our other agency duties, some GMT members will continue to track the issue and the GMT will provide comment and analysis when marine sp spatial planning issues explicitly connect to fisheries management on the council priority or the council prioritizes an action. We would also find it more efficient if the advisory body were primarily tasked with capturing the input of the liaisons and advisors in a meeting report, much like what is currently done in the groundfish stock assessment review panel, as opposed to relegating the task of writing statements and recommendations to various ABs who are already balancing many FMP-related agenda items. Lastly, given the rapid pace at which offshore wind development is being explored off the West Coast, along with gaps in scientific knowledge related to impacts to this region's habitat and fish stocks, we urge the Council to take we urge the council to quickly establish an advisory body that can begin the process of engaging in important upcoming planning meetings outside of the council process and exploring any potential impacts to the council's fisheries. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, questions for Lynn on the GMT report? Okay, thanks, Lynn. Thank you. All right, next up is um, Merritt McRae in the uh, GAP report. Merritt? Mr. Vice Chair, Council Members, I'm Merritt McRae, and I'll be reading from Agenda Item C4A, Supplemental Gap Report 1, the Groundfish Advisory Subpanel Report on Marine Planning. The Groundfish Advisory Subpanel received a briefing on this agenda item from Mr. Kerry Griffin, Pacific Fisheries Management Council staff, and reviewed the briefing book documents for this agenda item and offers the following comments. The GAP recognizes marine planning and the advent of increasing offshore development has been a growing concern among fishery sectors and managers for some time. President Trump's push to develop offshore aquaculture areas combined with the Biden administration's recent pressure to develop 30 gigawatts of offshore wind energy by 2030 has the potential to conflict with fishing and scientific survey efforts and change the infrastructure dy dynamics at some ports. As the GAP noted in our April 2021 Future Workload Planning uh, Workload Statement, Agenda Item H5A, Supplemental Gap Report 1, OSW energy development should not come at the cost of displacing existing fisheries and cause disruptions to the communities they support. More importantly, the Gap believes it is imperative that the, the Council and the National Marine Fisheries Service West Coast Region, the Northwest and Southwest Fisheries Science Centers be fully engaged in any offshore development. This cannot be understated. As noted in several public comment letters, fishing and seafood industry members count on the Council and the National Marine Fisheries Service to be our voice and in ensuring industry has a voice in the process. The Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act mandates the Council's state, tribal, and federal partners to work together to sustainably manage our fisheries. These fisheries depend on a lengthy time series of established groundfish surveys. Displacement or interruption to these surveys could harm the science on which essential fisheries policy, harvest specifications, and management measures, etc., are based. Clearly, neither the seafood in industry nor the science surveys should be harmed in a rush to develop the outer continental shelf, whether for renewable energy, aquaculture, or other projects. Agencies outside the council process and developers are rushing to develop and or propose areas for offshore wind without input from the seafood industry and or true engagement with the council or, or the National Marine Fisheries Service. Incorporation of industry perspective have thus far been largely ignored. The council process is the best, most transparent forum for industry involvement on these important developments in contrast to the process used by other agencies for developments affecting our, fish, excuse me, our fisheries. To that end, the GAP fully supports the formation of a small ad hoc advisory body at this meeting in line with option C from the four state report on marine planning agenda H5 April 2021, or a hybrid option. Several letters, including those from the Pacific Whiting Conservation Cooperative, the West Coast Pelagic Conservation Group, 
the West Coast Seafood Processors Association, and the joint letter by the Midwater Trawlers Cooperative and United Catcher Boats provide similar recommendations to support the formation of a small group to coordinate efforts and responses to offshore development, mapping and data integration efforts, and to develop reports and letters for council consideration or for emergency approval if outside the timelines, if outside timelines do not afford normal council schedules. An ad hoc group formed at this meeting and or the September meeting would allow the council to respond to projects in the immediate future, such as the 399 call area off California and the expected call areas off Oregon. The council could transition this ad hoc body into a standing advisory body as the process moves forward. The formation of this group with full support from council staff, from the council and staff, would send a clear and poignant message to the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and offshore developers. The council and its component membership must be engaged in offshore development. Furthermore, the GAP requests that the council send a strong letter to BOEM specifically indicating the council's intent to be a material part of the offshore development discussion, especially regarding wind energy. The GAP appreciates the staff analysis and the consideration of the potential budgetary requirements for an advisory body to deal with the offshore development. However, the GAP supports a smaller, nimble, and industry-centric group to provide quick turnabouts on reports and suggestions for council considerations. Inclusion of some state and federal planning members would enhance the group, as noted by the industry letters. Regarding the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife report, under this agenda item, the GAP appreciates the ODFNW's consideration of data layers that could in be included for offshore mapping and siting processes. The ODFNW iterates its concerns many GAP members have had in the past regarding missing data, regulatory changes that affect fisheries, latency of some data, et cetera. For example, ODFNW notes the large regulatory changes to the rockfish conservation area in Oregon are not reflected in the current data layers. Areas closed by regulation for more than two decades may see renewed effort, but those areas will not be depicted in the current data layer catalog. This could lead developers and agencies to falsely conclude those areas ideal for offshore development. It is imperative that these data sets remain updated with fishermen involvement to be relevant to offshore developers and other agencies such as BOEM. As envisioned, the new group with appropriate council staff could help coordinate and oversee these mapping efforts with other fishery management plan advisory bodies. The council and outside groups. In addition to these data sets, the GAP notes our West Coast fisheries are extremely dynamic. Fishermen follow fish and move to avoid bycatch. The gap is concerned that areas currently crucial to each fishery may shift given the impacts of climate change, change and other variables. These are important stocks our communities depend on. We already compete with a wide variety of ocean uses and fishermen avoid both National Marine Fisheries Service and non-National Marine Fisheries Service closures. The siting of offshore development projects may add yet an additional areas that fishermen cannot access. In summary, the GAP generally concurs with the recommendations contained in the Pacific Whiting Conservation Cooperative public comment. These are one, make it clear in a letter to BOEM that displacement of council managed fisheries and the scientific research that supports sustainable fisheries is a conservation and management concern for the council. Two, Indicate me that meaningful engagement in the offshore development arena is important to the council, its process, and the seafood industry. Three, establish a new small advisory body specifically tasked with addressing offshore development. And finally, four, seek opportunities to collaborate with the National Marine Fisheries Service and other federal and state agencies in a coordinated effort to ensure balance and coexistence between offshore development 
and council managed fisheries, including identifying and securing resources and staff to support these efforts. Thank you. And with that, I'd be glad to take any, any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Merritt. Uh, questions for Merritt on the uh, GAP report? Okay. Seeing none. Thanks, Merritt. Thank you. Uh, next up, we'll go to uh, Megan Waters and the uh, SAS report. Megan? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and members of Council. This is agenda item C4A, Supplemental SAS Report 1. The SAS had considerable discussion about the four options for a marine planning advisory body as proposed in the analysis of four state proposal on marine planning workload. The SAS feels that the marine planning issues, particularly the siting and development of offshore wind and wave energy developments, is an issue that will require increasing involvement by the council over the next several years. The SAS also feels that the habitat committee is already fully involved with both marine and freshwater habitat issues. In order to develop the specialized knowledge necessary to integrate professional fishing expertise, the SAS recommends that the council adopt option C and develop a new marine planning advisory body. While the SAS appreciates the added cost associated with a new advisory body, we feel that a more narrowly focused effort is necessary to fully engage with these emerging issues. And with that, I will conclude our report and take any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Megan. Questions for Megan on the SAS report? Okay, thank you. Um, next up uh, is uh, Wayne Heikla and uh, the HMS uh, advisory sub panel. Wayne? Okay, you hear me? Uh, we can. Okay, good, good. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the Council, Moyne Heikla, Vice Chair of the Highly Migratory Species Advisory Panel, will be reading our report, agenda item C4A. Highly Migratory Species Advisory Subpanel Report on Marine Planning. Um, the Highly Migratory Species Advisory Subpanel received a presentation from Mr. Kerry Griffin on agenda item C4, Marine Planning. We also reviewed statements submitted by other advisory bodies and the public. <clears throat> After discussion and deliberation, the HMSAS agrees with the Habitat Committee's recommendations and recommends option B with clarifications as a short-term option to address the immediate marine planning issues requiring council attention until a new advisory body is formed. For the long term, we support the formation of an independent advisory body that provides a strong stakeholder slash conservation presence. <clears throat> We understand that the formation of a new advisory body will take time and not likely be functional and operational in the near term. Given the speed with which new information is being made public, time is of the essence. Just this past Monday, it was revealed that the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management intends to conduct lease sales off California coast in both Humboldt Wind Energy Area and the newly expanded Morro Bay Call Area next summer. Coupled with the imminent announcement of additional call areas, as well as the recent interest expressed in placing an offshore wind farm off Washington coast, time is not a luxury we have. Regarding option B, we could not center on what was meant by liaison model. So we offer the following as a replacement. Add positions from each sub panel to ensure fishing industry slash community expertise. We also believe that the council would benefit from considering whether the addition of someone from NIMPS with a background in fisheries economics is appropriate. Ex vessel revenues are easy to find, but the true economic contribution impact of our fisheries is more difficult to quantify. The addition of someone from the US Coast Guard is appropriate as navigational issues will surely be implicated. We thank the states for submitting the report in April and thank the council for addressing this important matter. 
As one of our members said during our deliberations, quote, there has never been a bigger threat to our fisheries than offshore wind. Well, this concludes our report. Thanks, Wayne. Questions for Wayne? Um, Car Brady. Car? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And Wayne, thank you for that report. Um, my question to you is just the nature of the discussion within the AS related to um, choosing option B versus one of the other options. And what I understand is that you chose option B because you felt it was the most uh, expeditious and that it would be uh, the quickest to become operational and that you see the, the near-term uh, activity of this type of, of uh, advisory body as being the primary uh, of, of primary importance. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, that's pretty good. We, uh, we covered all the options and went back and forth on them, but we figured just because this is moving so fast uh, and setting up a whole new advisory panel might take some time through the council process to set one up, whereas you could possibly do this hybrid uh, hybrid advisory panel with the with the options that we uh, we laid out. So that yeah, you pretty much uh, got it. What what our discussion centered on? Okay, and then just for a quick follow up. So if there was an option that could become operational rapidly, then um, that would meet the AS desires. So thinking about the, your comments on composition, but, but that rapid development, regardless of whether it's option B or another option, is that, is that all, also accurate? Yeah, and we'd like to see something in place, at least for discussion purposes or where, where people could Put, put into the uh, put into the uh, uh, council process by the September meeting. That would be ideal. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you. Okay, for the discussion, uh, for the questions for uh, for Wayne. Okay, seeing none. Thanks, Wayne. Thanks. Okay, I think that wraps up our. Uh, AB reports, management team reports. Um, and it takes us to public comment. I believe we have two public comment cards, at least I saw. And um, Michael Godowski, followed by uh, Elena Dovak. Um, Mike, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me, Mr. Vice Chair? We can. Okay, good. Just one second. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and Council Members. For the record, my name is Mike Okineski. I'm representing the West Coast Pelagic Conservation Group. WCP is the acronym. We submitted supplemental comments to the Council on C4 along with seven other fishing industry organizations. There are seven advisory body reports on C4 that echo consistent points on the important need for the Council to be involved in inch in offshore development and the necessity to create a marine planning advisory body. Although there are differences in the approaches, five of the seven ABs state that there is need for quick or immediate action to form a marine planning advisory body. There are no minority reports. The ground fish advisory panel and coastal pelagic species advisory subpanel are best aligned with our organization's written supplemental comments. With that said, I do not recall a previous occasion when I've seen this much AB support to reach the same end with virtually no opposition. WCP urges the council to follow the advice of your advisory bodies and form a marine planning advisory body, ad hoc or otherwise, that is composed of members from the other advisory bodies and the states in the fastest manner possible. As is, we will we will be playing catch up with the current siting plans of offshore wind developments. There will be a much wider expansion of wind farms to come in the near future. That concludes my comments. I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Questions for Mike uh, on his testimony? Okay. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. You too. Um, next up is uh, Yelena Novak. 
Uh, Yelena, are you there? Brad, can you hear me? We can. Um, hello, Vice Chair and Council Members. My name is Yelena Novak. I will be commenting on behalf of the Oregon Troll Commission, um, OTC, about the importance of the Council engagement in the marine planning issues, specifically offshore wind energy development. Agenda item C4B, Supplemental Public Comment, and provide our recommendations on this agenda item. OTC is an industry-funded state government agency established by the Oregon State Legislature to support and promote the Oregon trawl fishing industry. Our fleet, consisting of bottom trawl, midwater trawl, and shrimp trawl vessels, participates in the council-managed West Coast ground fish and Pacific widened fisheries, as well as the state-managed Oregon pink shrimp fishery. We would like to express our deep concern about the direction of offshore wind energy development of the West Coast and its likely environmental and socioeconomic ramifications to our fisheries and the industry. B based on what we already know from the events that have been unfolding on the East Coast, as well as in California, it is clear the fishing industry, by far the most adversely impacted existing ocean user group, has little to no voice in the outcome of the, ambition, of the ambitious national climate agenda that threatens the future and well-being of our fishing communities. The United Nations describes the world's oceans, their temperature, chemistry, currents, and life drive global systems that make the earth habitable for humankind. Our rainwater, drinking water, weather, much of our food, and even the oxygen we breathe are all provided and regulated by the sea. Our fishermen are on the front lines seeing how climate change has been affecting the ocean and its complex ecosystems. While we believe that transitioning from fossil fuels to environmentally sustainable energy sources is very important and also necessary, fast-tracking the development of yet-to-be-proven technology on the industrial scale with little understanding for the scope and extent of the environmental consequences, as well as no adequate mitigation strategy, seems short-sighted and potentially even dangerous. In anticipation of a discussion with Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and Oregon Department of Lands Conservation and uh, Development, TLCD, at the most recent regular OTC meeting held on May 24th, OTC in a joint effort with Responsible Offshore Development Alliance, RODA, and several of our industry partners involved in the offshore wind issue on the West Coast, held an informational meeting to gain a better understanding of the issue and its potential impacts to the fishing industry. A diverse group of 70 plus people attended that meeting, including OTC commissioners, troll fishermen from all three states, uh, Oregon, California, and Washington, multiple shoreside processors, industry representatives from various fisheries and sectors, including the recreational interest, the at sea widening sectors, and other attendees came to hear from expert speakers, including Annie Hawkins, the executive director of RODA, an organization advocating for fishing interests and the responsible offshore development. This activity allowed for many valuable takeaways, including understanding of the fact that offshore wind development issue itself, as well as processes involved in it, are overwhelmingly complex and obscure and leave very little room for meaningful public engagement. We appreciate the representatives from both Boehm and DLCD attending the subsequent OTC regular meeting held on May 24th and presenting the information about the milestones of offshore wind development in Oregon, as well as about the data available to Boeing. Although Boeing welcomed commissioners' feedback and suggestions for additional data sources, we remain hesitant about that request due to the lack of clarity about the purpose of the request, 
how such data would be used and who would be analyzing and interpreting it. To our best knowledge, BOEM does not have an in-house fishing expertise who can help them navigate the highly dynamic and complex fisheries world. The need for Council's engagement on issues of offshore wind energy to many of the Council managed fisheries participants is evident based on the broad support from numerous members of the Council family. We appreciate the Council members from each of the four state departments of Fish and Wildlife for their recommendations submitted in the April 2021 four state report and the Council advisory bodies for their feedback as well as the council staff for the information provided in response to the April 2021 for state report. We believe an effective engagement of the council on issues related to offshore wind can be best achieved through option C of the April 2021 for state report, which recommends establishing a new advisory body to work on those issues. In addition, we support the recommendations submitted by the Pacific Wide and Conservation Cooperative in their comments on this agenda item, including suggested modifications to the composition described under the option C of the staff report. Additionally, we support other three recommendations made by the Pacific Wide and Conservation Cooperative, urging the council to one state in a letter to the BOEM that displacement of council managed fisheries and the scientific research that supports sustainable fisheries is a conservation and management concern for the council. Indicate that meaningful engagement in the offshore development arena is important to the Council and Council processes. Seek opportunities to collaborate with the National Marine Fisheries Service and other federal and state agencies in a coordinated effort to ensure an effective balancing of new offshore development with Council managed fisheries, including identifying and securing resources and staff to support these efforts. Why is it important for the council to become engaged in the offshore wind energy issues? There are known as well as unknown negative impacts to council managed fisheries. Potential habitat damage, cold pooling, impacts from the noise and electromagnetic field, impacts to fishery surveys, among other. Spatial conflicts with the negative implications to the fishing industry including displacement of fishermen from their traditional fishing grounds, revenue losses, um, quota reductions, and other, as well as a lack of meaningful stakeholder engagement and the public process um, within the official Boeing processes. Recognizing of the fishing industry uh, concerns, five members of the Oregon Congressional Delegation submitted a letter to BOEM in September 2019, urging them to include OTC, Oregon Trial Commission, along with other three Oregon State Seafood Commodity Commissions to the BOEM Oregon Intergovernmental Renewable Energy Task Force. BOEM dismissed the request, citing they did not recognize Oregon State Commodity Commissions as the state government agencies, despite the existing state law, Oregon Revised Statute 576, that establishes the commissions as the state entities. To conclude, we urge the Council to establish a small advisory body to deal with offshore wind energy issues while helping ensure our sustainable council managed fisheries and fishermen's livelihoods are not sacrificed in the pursuit of ambitious climate goals and bold actions intended to expedite the deployment of industrial scale offshore wind facilities without a full consideration of all of the impacts to marine environment and the industry. That concludes my statement. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Elena. Uh, questions for Elena on her um, public testimony? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Elena, once again, for coming to speak with us. And with that, uh, that takes us to um, council action. Huh. So uh, with that, 
Uh, we're going to consider the executive director report on marine planning process and schedule for future council engagement and provide guidance as appropriate. And I'll open up the uh, council floor for um, a discussion. Karin Brady. Karin? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I actually wanted to open with a question uh, for Chuck, if that's okay. Um, and the question is uh, around the use of the terms ad hoc committee versus an advisory body under the um, more formal, um, typical council advisory body. And uh, my my understanding is that an ad hoc committee could be um, uh, assembled rapidly without uh, significant process if the council agrees on what that process looks like. And I just wanted to confirm that. Uh, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Karen. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so ad hoc committees, uh, can be formed, uh, they can be formed rather rapidly. I don't have the COP in front of me, but basically it says that they will be, the committee will be formed by a vote of the council and it will be uh, populated. Uh, the, the appointments can be made by the chair uh, directly, but, uh, but to the extent possible or practical, uh, they would consult with the council uh, on those appointments. <clears throat> so that, that's what it says. Uh, in terms of that process, it also states that um, ad hoc committees are intended to be uh, uh, sort of uh, temporary uh, for specific uh, purposes or projects. So, um, uh, with that said, uh, you know those those are in the COPs, and uh, and this was pointed out uh, at some point today. I think uh, COPs aren't always followed to the letter, um, so we do have some other. Uh, ad hoc committees like uh, the ecosystem work group that uh, is has been long term and is fairly focused on on um, some uh, well I, I, uh, adapts to whatever the issues are so not not particularly focused on one issue so so uh, that being said <clears throat> um, yes the uh, you know uh, to, if you were to establish a committee for example under cop uh, two, like the uh, advisory sub panels, or three, like the management teams, uh, then uh, that would typically go through a more formal process of uh, soliciting for nominations, um, uh, a vote uh, by the council to appoint. Um, in the case of management teams, uh, review by the SSC for qualifications. So, uh, so you know, those are again more technically oriented. Uh, so um, the habitat committees may be a little bit of a hybrid there where there are some people that are, uh, you know, that are on the, the three-year uh, appointment cycle, industry representatives, uh, whereas there's also some agency folks who are uh, more, more permanently appointed um, uh, that uh, generally don't have to have their qualifications reviewed by the SSC. So, so there's, there's sort of a, uh, I guess the management teams and the advisory sub panels are kind of uh, two extremes. The, high, the habitat committee is a little bit of a, uh, a blend of those processes. Ad hoc committees, again, um, uh, you know, again, easier to easier to form, uh, easier to uh, uh, populate and, and replace members as needed um, uh, through the authority of the chair. Uh, but generally, it's much as possible in consultation with the council. Chuck, further discussion? Uh, Karin. Thank you. And this is kind of a follow up statement to that. You know, one of the things that we have heard uh, today repeatedly is uh, the urgency of this issue and that um, we need to do something quickly. Uh, and so that's been very much noted. By myself, uh, we heard that also in March uh, as well. Uh, the last time we had a, a formal marine planning uh, agenda item, and so thinking through options for me, 
uh, really is is thinking about the impacts on council time, workload on staff, and uh, the advisory bodies that uh, currently exist, uh, and the speed with which we can get um, potentially a, a dedicated advisory body uh, developed. So thank you for that, and um, look forward to more discussion around the table on those issues. Thanks, Gordon. Um, Joe, Joe? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And uh, appreciate uh, the information that has been uh, presented on this uh, particular agenda item. It is one um, uh, that the tribes are uh, interested in. And so I'd like to share maybe a bit of perspective on that. Uh, so the Coastal Treaty Tribes, uh, those being the Hill, Macaw, Quilly Tribe, and Pohindi Nation, uh, their rights to fish in regional custom areas were secured by their uh, representatives in both the Treaty of Olympia and the Treaty of Nia Bay. This right is held in perpetuity and is directly tied to place-based management. Any council process that includes expansion of marine protective areas near coastal industrialization and future impacts to habitat within and adjacent to the UNAs of the coastal treaty tribes necessitates inclusion of the tribes within the process. Uh, as, we re re as we have reviewed this, um, uh, under this agenda item, we note that both options A and B included variations of forming ecosystem related recommendations utilizing the habitat treaty where although currently uh, vacant, the tribe may appoint a representative uh, necessary. Uh, option D utilizes all current advisory bodies where the tribes have multiple advisory body members serving in various cap capacities. However, in its current or state proposal, option C does not include any tribal representation in the makeup of a potential new advisory body. If the council chooses to move forward and form a new advisory body uh, laid out within option C, uh, the tribes request that an additional seat be created for a representative on the tribes. Thank you for the opportunity to provide that uh, perspective. Thanks, Joe. Um, uh, Heather Hall. Heather? Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, I just wanted to offer some some general comments. Um, first, appreciation to Chuck and Council staff for the analysis on the four state um, report and in our proposal, and for um, providing your input on that. It it was very helpful, and for the discussion. I also wanted to thank all the advisory bodies and the public comment um, for the really thoughtful um, input on this issue. And, you know, it says to me that there's, a, we're missing something and there's there's a strong need. And so appreciate that we're trying to figure out um, a, a way to do that in a way that um, is efficient, effective, um, also, you know, <laughs> balances, uh, all the work that the council is already doing. I know we'll talk about that tomorrow under a future meeting, and that's always a struggle and a challenging discussion. Um, so here as we contemplate doing even more, um, I just want to say I, I think it's uh, a, an important thing to be considering and worthwhile uh, to make space for this um, in the process and, and to provide that um, that. Uh, way to to get our stakeholder input um, and funnel it to um, folks as, as we're considering uh, wind energy and and other um, marine planning issues so uh, thank you and um, I'll probably have more to say later thanks thanks Heather um, Bob Dooley Bob yeah thank you Mr. Vice Chair and thanks for the opportunity here to comment I I have a comment and I have a question the comment is, I don't think we have, after hearing all the testimony and all of the ongoings for, for several council meetings now and attending all of, of several other outreach and meetings on that have been held, I don't think there's an option here to, to not 
move forward in a in a quick way and and get get all the information and all the help we can from the very able advisory bodies as been described by everyone here in the options i'm not necessarily wedded to one particular option i think getting uh, getting something on the road is the key importance i think you know unlike a lot of other things that we may make a mistake and get wrong if we if we don't engage in this with all we have to to get it right and to make sure that we do all we can to make sure that it's done right there is no in season action or anything that'll move these facilities off of our off of areas where they're conflicted with our critical habitat and our our fisheries so i think it's it's important we do all we can um that's that's my comment and so i you know i would support there that that we do something that gets an ad hoc committee possibly on the ground first, and maybe it, it transcends into something else in the future. I'm okay with that. I'll wait for discussion on that. My question is really maybe to Chuck and possibly to Karen. Uh, there's been talk about a, a, a planning or a data model, I guess, to, for siting. And we have heard from, particularly from James Morris from Aquaculture and his, his his mapping tool and how he's actually invited us to help get industry involved in, in creating layers that we need believe should be in there. And I, I guess the question I have is, uh, Chuck, you'd mentioned that there is, you, you have employed a, a mapper to help or I think that's the term. And I, I'm I'm hoping that the language and the question is 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 the language that he is using this uh, adaptable to the language that those other platforms that are really coming from government entities and agencies there it see appears are they are they compatible because it seems to me that that's an important concept that we should be taking right up to begin with and I hope you I hope it already has and I hope it's a maybe a redundant question so uh, that's the question. Chuck? Chuck? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Bob. So let, let me see if I understand your question. So are you asking about the combat compatibility of uh, of mapping platforms that, uh, that BOEM and uh, no aquaculture and our contracted uh, mapper are using to make sure of compatibility there? Was that, was that your question? Yes, yeah, so that's exactly it, Chuck. I'm sorry. I'm really... Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, uh, yeah so uh, they are. Uh, so the, uh, as a matter of fact, the uh, mapper, we, so basically everybody uses ArcGIS, very common platform. And, and uh, Allison Bailey is the person we've contracted with, and she did all the mapping for uh, our Amendment 28, uh, Mount Fish EFH project. Um, and, uh, and so she's... Uh, She's, uh, I think, well well versed in uh, in in the use of that, uh, the purposes that we uh, need, and uh, you know, um, I'm sure it can. Uh, their uh, the platforms are uh, will be very compatible with uh, with what's being used elsewhere. Thanks, Chuck, and that makes me uh, very confident that we have a good chance for success in being. Okay, um, Heather, is that a remnant hand? Yes, sorry. I think you might did the double click. And, uh, <laughs> uh, okay, further discussion? A motion? Karen Brady. Yes, I, I am prepared to offer a motion. Uh, I think it will generate some additional council discussion. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to hear one. <laughs> and uh, Chris and Sandra have it, and apologies, it is uh, lengthy, and um, I will read it because um, folks haven't seen it ahead of time. Maybe another... Um, Increase in font size, please. All right, so there's a, 
a preamble and then a motion. And the preamble in consideration of creating an ad hoc marine planning committee is as follows. One, the timelines for NOAA and BOEM data development analyses and decisions on offshore wind and aquaculture opportunity areas, respectively, are short and do not necessarily align with the council's schedule, resulting in potential missed opportunities for PFMC comment. A smaller uh, marine planning committee that could meet during or between council meetings could be a time, uh, timely mechanism for the council family to track and alert the council members to the need for comment and elevate that need to the PFMC for action. Two, to be effective and responsive to the external planning timelines, the Marine Planning Committee work could be done efficiently via remote meetings. Three, specific to offshore wind and engagement with BOEM, state task forces are comprised only of government representatives by law. State and federal agencies are participating directly in task force processes and bringing related management and research perspectives to the table. The task force process do processes do not include fishing and fishing industry stakeholders, yet fishing grounds and fish habitat are resources of particular concern to the PFMC and marine planning and are particularly vulnerable to poorly informed spatial planning process. A PFMC marine planning committee with a priority on fishery and fishery related stakeholder voices would fill a gap in and strengthen the BOEM process. Four, the four state fish and wildlife agencies support the following approach. Given this context, I move that the council initiate an ad hoc advisory body to engage in immediate needs in marine planning processes for offshore wind and aquaculture opportunity areas for at least two years. The Marine Planning Committee will provide timely evaluation of these planning processes and facilitate delivery of PFMC input to the action agencies through regularly scheduled PFMC meetings process or through emergency letter process. Purpose and function of the Marine Planning Committee. One, purpose, an ad hoc Marine Planning Committee uh, advisory body will provide the council with an open and transparent process to gather industry and stakeholder input and advice on marine planning, particularly offshore wind and aquaculture opportunity areas, and a mechanism to funnel constructive recommendations to the PFMC for PFMC action and communication with the planning action agency in question. Two, composition. The ad hoc committee will be led by a dedicated council staff member and would include a council staff or contractor with GIS expertise. Six committee members would be chosen from existing PFMC AB membership, for example, the GAP or the HMSAS, to serve on the ad hoc Marine Planning Committee and act as liaisons to their primary AB to facilitate timely and efficient information flow four resource managers, three recommended by CDFW, ODFW, and WDFW, and one tribal manager recommended by the council's tribal representative with expertise in offshore wind and marine spatial planning would also serve on the marine planning committee. Function. The committee will respond to state specific processes which have independent timelines in a manner that facilitates the opportunity for the PFMC to provide comment letters as needed to directly inform the offshore wind or aquaculture opportunity area processes in California, Oregon and Washington. In addition, the council staff lead will build a broader network of dedicated specialists from other institutions as appropriate, which may include, but is not limited to NIMFs, other state and federal agencies, the sanctuaries, universities, or other marine science and fishery experts to serve as a fluid group of subject matter experts that can provide additional information, analysis, and advice as needed. 
four, schedule and meeting planning. The committee should meet in conjunction with, but not necessarily during, regularly scheduled PFMC meetings and provide update reports to the council up to three times each year. For travel and cost savings, council staff should consider the option of virtual meetings prior to full PFMC meeting agenda starting. When the offshore wind or aquaculture opportunity area process does not align with a regularly scheduled PFMC meeting, the committee could meet virtually and initiate quick response letter process as determined necessary. Over the next three months, the committee should participate in the July working webinars. Uh, nomination and approval process for the ad hoc membership is below. And the committee should report to the council in September, including A, a summary of the July webinars, B, recommendations to the council on the need for comment letter to BOEM, and C, recommendations to PFMC on further augmentation of the committee membership. Five, term. The committee would convene for at least two years. The PFMC would reevaluate the need for the committee after two years and determination would be made by the council. On ad hoc committee makeup, there would be 12 members, including staff. The first category A, fisheries and habitat representatives, there would be six, cumulatively include geographic and sector diversity. Each AB would nominate the representative and the PFMC chair would approve. Uh, one each from the HMSAS, the CPSAS, the GAP, and the SAS, as well as one from the EAS and the HC. B, four resource managers nominated by the appropriate Department of Fish and Wildlife or nominated by the PFMC tribal representative with PFMC chair approval. One uh, resource planning manager from California Washington and Oregon with expertise in offshore wind and marine spatial planning, and one nominated by the tribal representative on the PFMC. C, council staff, uh, one council staff person to be determined by the executive director and council staff, as well as one for GIS uh, mapping layers expertise. Uh, D, two co-chairs for the committee, are to be selected from among the members by the full uh, committee, one from among the six AB seats and one from among the four resource manager seats. And with a couple of uh, typos that I think are forgivable, that represents my motion. Okay, thank you. Kakar, that was be my next uh, question. And so uh, second by uh, Virgil Moore. Thank you, Virgil. Um, Karen, do you wish to speak to your motion? I do, uh, and there are a number of points that I would like to make. I will try and be brief, uh, but we've heard today that this is an exceedingly important issue to the council and to fisheries on the West Coast. And so I will take some time to describe why uh, this proposal uh, makes sense given what we've been hearing uh, for the last six months and more. Um, and I wanna open by saying that there has been a huge investment in successful West Coast fisheries by the council, by the federal government and by the state governments, the tribal governments. And this investment is also uh, born by the private businesses um, that include tourism, sport businesses, commercial uh, industries across the West Coast. That in this in investment is important to uh, incorporate into adding additional spatial uses in the space where those fisheries have existed for some time. And while this motion could be perceived as uh, being in opposition of offshore wind or in opposition of aquaculture opportunity areas. Instead, it's offered uh, with the intent that there are opportunities to 
minimize the impacts of development in areas that are important to fisheries, that are important to the ecosystem, and the, the uh, four states who support this motion feel that there is a way to achieve that minimization uh, through engagement with the council process. Uh, we feel that fisheries need a stronger voice in the process, both for the mapping that's planned for this summer, but then beyond that uh, process uh, to the definition of call areas and confirming that those call areas are designed with uh, fisheries in mind and are sensitive to minimizing impacts on fisheries. So in my four points, the first is really focused on the fact that in the marine spatial planning process, there are many voices who are in fact at the table. State agencies, federal agencies are at the table and that represents a huge amount of expertise in habitat science management um, and so on, economics. It does not include the fishers themselves, the fishing industry uh, itself. Instead, this group who has the largest stake in um, offshore uh, planning and development is instead part of the public. And so it is through the council process that we can organize and coordinate these voices and communicate our concerns about impacts to those industries uh, to action agencies. In March, the Habitat Committee agreed that their membership was not ideal for engaging in this process, but today we heard that they nonetheless are willing to represent the council in this discussion in order to meet the urgent need uh, that is, has been identified not only by the Habitat Committee, but by other advisory bodies. That said, there is recognition across many entities, including the Habitat Committee itself, that the membership is not ideal. And so this motion is intended to bring in a better composition reflecting the comments that we've heard today from our advisory bodies in the public. The second point I wanted to make has also been made multiple times today, which is that we are on a rapid timeline uh, and the PFMC is not in control of that timeline. Rather, the timeline is set by the processes uh, that we've heard updates about uh, today, both with offshore wind and aquaculture opportunity areas. And I do want to uh, call out to both BOEM and NOAA representatives who provided those updates today uh, that I very much appreciate their willingness to engage with the PFMC and meet with us uh, many times over the last six months to a year. And, and so this motion is not um, disregarding that willingness, uh, but it is acknowledging that the timeline is set by processes other than the council process. And the Morrow Bay 399 project is an example where public comment will be sought uh, this July and that public comment, I understand, will close prior to the PFMC having an opportunity to comment on that area. The third point I would like to make is about workload and we've also heard a lot about that today and there have been many discussions over the last several months, uh, council discussion in March about this. Um, the PFMC's role, primary role is MSA related tasks and we have a full plate. We have ongoing discussions about how we cannot continue with this amount of workload uh, effectively and in a timely manner, at least the way that we want to uh, participate. However, this issue of offshore development will have a profound impact on PFMC fisheries and industries, as well as the habitats and ecosystems and the scientific endeavors to understand the resources and changes due to impacts like climate change off of our shore. And so we don't have the choice 
to en engage or not based on workload alone. This is a critical issue. And there are ways that I've tried to build into this motion that help manage the impact on workload in, in terms of council floor time, in terms of the management teams, uh, staff expertise and, and uh, their time involvement in the process, but yet gives an opportunity for the fishery voices to be brought to the fore. The fourth point I'd like to make, and I'm almost done, is that this, this type of committee that I've proposed for the council to support today uh, and the input that they will provide will strengthen the marine planning processes overall. Um, this will serve as a focal point for action agencies to engage with and interact with hopefully to avoid some of the conflict that we have heard about, uh, for example, with offshore wind public process on the East Coast. These are processes that we do not want to repeat. We're looking for a better way to move forward. And in creating a committee and having that committee engage with BOEM for offshore wind or engage with other action agencies on other offshore development, we will create an opportunity for those fishing voices to have a voice in the process. It also benefits the PFMC in making sure that development offshore is careful, precautionary, strategic, and has correct information about our fisheries and our resources so that we understand the trade-offs that are being made if development proceeds. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you for the lengthy uh, motion and the lengthy rationale, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Okay, thanks, Karin. Questions for Karin? Uh, Ryan Wolf, Ryan? Thank you, Karin. Um, and thank you for uh, the motion, um, and also, um, as always, a very um, eloquent and um, uh, comprehensive rationale, which, which I appreciate here. Um, I wanted to ask a question. Um, I guess if you could scroll down to the committee makeup. Uh, obviously, from my perspective, there seems to be one resource manager notably omitted there. Um, and, uh, so I just wanted to ask a question about that. I mean, regarding why you, you would not see a NIMS representative on the Marine Planning Committee. And I, and I raised that for a couple of reasons. One, obviously, because of the aspects I think we could contribute, um, as well as potentially a single rep being able to coordinate with all of the rest of NOAA. Um, we are establishing a pretty robust uh, cross-divisional team on this, these issues in the West Coast region uh, in setting in the process of setting up that infrastructure now. So, so um, there is, is already a, a big interest in, at a regional level uh, on these issues and, and I could see some natural um, uh, kind of overlapping connections. Uh, second, as, as you noted in, in some of the discussion um, there is obviously these parallel processes and, and separate roles that NIMS has as a federal agency, especially when engaging with other uh, federal agencies. And I, and I think the more we're engaged in this, the more we're apprised of, of, of concerns uh, of the industry, of the community, of the council, um, that allows us to augment or, or to also um, extend and pass on some of those concerns through our own uh, separate parallel processes. And then finally, of course, as, as you've well noted from our um, from the AOA presentation today, from the executive order, from a number of discussions, that this these issues are very important to our current administration. So I could also see uh, that is another reason why it would be quite interested. Uh, so I guess my question is more along the lines of how would you see. If, if we're not a member of this committee, how do you see our engagement? There, there's, a, there's a very um, small reference above to a fluid group of subject matter expert, experts as appropriate, um, which includes NIMS. Uh, so maybe a little bit more clarification for how do you see a, a federal agency engagement on our end? Thanks. Thank you for the question, Ryan. It's an important one. and um, And I am not 
averse to suggestions for limited ad additions to this and friendly amendments. That said, I will describe why it is posed the way that it is. Um, the three managers from the three departments of Fish and Wildlife, you will note, are experts in, in offshore wind or marine spatial planning, not in fisheries or in PFMC or MSA. And so the intent here is to think about who within those management entities has responsibility for the state for the marine spatial planning aspect and who is engaged in the, uh, for example, state BOEM task forces on behalf of the states versus the fish and wildlife staff who are engaged in the PFMC process. So that's, that's one part of the explanation. The other part of the explanation is that uh, BOEM is not represented on this ad hoc marine planning committee either. Uh, and it was uh, deliberate that neither of the action agencies were included here. But again, it is not uh, critical that it remains so. Uh, but it was really in thinking through, is there some conflict of, of interest in having the action agency uh, on the planning committee itself? And, and so all of that aside, there is clearly a vast amount of expertise and advice that um, both the NIMS staff uh, can bring to this committee, as well as the PFMC engaged fish and wildlife staff from each of the state agencies. So in consideration of workload and consideration that this committee is meant to raise up the voices of the fishing industry, um, these managers proposed in this committee are more meant to connect those fishery voices to the process within each of the states so that they understand and can engage with that state level process. Uh, and uh, in, instead of engaging with NIMS or the Fish and Wildlife staff who are engaged in PFMC specifically. Hey, thanks, Carr. Um, Bob Dooley, Bob? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Karen, for this really complete motion. <clears throat> I, I, I got a question on process, I think, and how you, how you envision it. You know, I, I really, over the years, have valued uh, greatly the the process that, that that's been used in the GAP and several other advisory panels. That it's an iterative process, and it's not a, a formal public comment, it, unless it, you know, unless it needs to be reined in. But it typically they, they really rely on the on the the input of of industry and such. And and in that, this is going to be. I, I would envision dealing with several different geographic areas, depending on the call area and the fisheries involved and the, the expertise that, that the industry could bring forward and the information, that it would be really important to have that as a, an easy to engage in process. And um, is it, how do you envision it? That, that is a, would it be a formal, you know, a public comment or would you, do you envision this being an iterative process as you go along to the extent it can and keeping order? I understand that. But uh, more like the gap as opposed to more like the council. Thank you. Um, and through the vice chair, thank you for the, the question, Bob. I, th I think that because of the urgency in meeting a timeline that is not our own, my vision of this is that this committee would lead to suggestions to the council for formal comment. Um, that said, and, and in, in part, that was my reasons for, for my question to uh, Boehm today about the next opportunity for formal, formal comment we can have engagement with the, with the action agencies across the months, but there will be opportunities that will be very specific and very time limited where the PFMC will either provide comment or will not. 
And if we miss those opportunities, they will be gone. Uh, and so it's, it's, I think that we need to have something that's able to rise to that challenge of having a very specific time limited opportunity to comment and effectively communicate our perspective. Thanks, Gord. Uh, Phil Anderson. Phil? Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. And thank you, Karin, for bringing forward the motion and, and for all the thought and coordination that it, it obviously represents uh, that you have done. Uh, I have two, I have what, I have a question. Um, and then I have um, a perspective. Um, there is some description um, about uh, the council staff member um, and uh, actually it's kind of back up where you were, Sandra. Um, and there's, um, there's, there's an assignment there that gives me some discomfort. I don't know if it gives me enough discomfort to, to recommend some other language, but as I have said before, and most of you know, uh, my feeling that this council, we, we have the ability to direct the executive director. We do not have the authority to direct uh, that the executive director's staff and make assignments to staff. That is in, in the purview of the executive director. So I'm just, I'm a little bit, my, I'm twinging a little bit when I read the first sentence there under number two um, about exactly what the, the staff member is going to do, but um, I would defer to Chuck to, to make any further comments if he has concerns about the way uh, that is represented. That's uh, first. Um, the second um, is, and if you wouldn't mind scrolling down a little bit for me to the to the composition of the committee uh, portion. Thank you. You know, I've, I I have thought about this quite a little bit about uh, Ryan's point relative to having a representative on the committee from National Marine Fisheries Service. And I believe that it is important that we have a representative on there from National Marine Fisheries Service. Um, and, and while I understand and appreciate um, the expertise that the states are thinking about in terms of the, in, that the individuals will have who occupy uh, their seats and um, appreciate that. Um, when I back up, and lift up a little bit from all of this, you know, I, I, I go back to thinking about why are we so concerned about uh, this initiative? And to me, it's twofold. One, we are concerned about how this will affect our ability to protect the living marine resources that are off the west coast of the United States. And two, we are concerned about how this activity and these projects will impact the um, fishing industry and all that encompasses from the people who, who are on the boats to the people in the processing plants to our coastal community, that entire umbrella that's represented by the fishing community. Those in my mind is why we are so concerned and why we feel like we need to have a, a loud voice uh, in, in what is transpiring, what's being contemplated, what is on the horizon. The Ash Marine Fisheries Service and the Pacific Council have been partners in everything that we do relative to both of those primary elements. Uh, and um, uh, obviously, the, the, the uh, 
fishing industry is just as much they 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 are their stakeholders as much as they are the councils they have as much uh, concern uh, and stake in this um, in for those two uh, primary elements as the states do and and the tribes um, uh, and I meant to include the tribes in each one of those statements so uh, it is with that thought that I will offer an amendment to the motion that under 1b uh, we will the resource managers would include five um, uh, and include a representative from National Marine Fisheries Service. Okay, thanks, Phil. Um, that language, uh, that could reflect your motion to amend. If it looks clear to you, it's good with me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, uh, second by Bush Smith. And uh, Phil, I don't know if uh, you want to speak any more to your motion, but uh, that'll be the time. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And I think I have shared my thoughts with the council as to my rationale for offering this amendment. Okay. Um, questions for the uh, maker of the motion? Or to amend the motion? All right. And could I speak to one more point, please? <laughs> Please. You know, we do have situations that arise from time to time when the council chooses to take a position in a letter uh, that National Marine Fisheries Service finds themselves in a place where they need to abstain. Uh, and and um, as there, if letters come forward out of this group, there may that, you know, that may occur depending on who those letters addressed to. So um, again, I think they have the flexibility um, uh, and the committee will thereby, therefore have the flexibility to bring forward the kind of work products that we're looking for. Okay. Um, discussion on the amendment to the motion? Uh, Ryan Wolf, Ryan? Yeah, thank you. And thanks Phil for the motion. I appreciate it. I, and I, appreciate your the latter point you just raised as well and i think we would have that flexibility i think we've done that successfully um and have that committee in other areas um uh, and i would be confident we could do it here uh, i'm also appreciative of the comments that karen raised regarding the level of expertise and, and i do think uh, that NIMS could provide someone to this that was uh, linked in at a broader expertise level in our regional offshore wind, marine spatial planning, and national uh, actions too. So being able to provide both that expertise as well as, of course, um, the connections with, with the council and the fishery management process. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Further discussion? Okay, not seeing, I'll, uh, I'll call the question for the amendment to the motion. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Uh, motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Phil. Um, okay. So we're back to the original motion as amended, and I see uh, um, Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Question for Karin on the motion. Um, with regard to the composition of the uh, AB representatives, thank you, Sandra, for rolling up. Um, six representatives, one each from the HMSAS, CPSAS, GAP, SAS, and then one from EAS and HC. Um, thinking about our goal here, uh, which is to um, engage in this process with the view toward um, recognizing uh, the importance of our West Coast marine resources uh, to our uh, communities and, and those that rely on those resources for 
um, uh, utilization, recreation, uh, or enjoyment. Um, I am just wondering how we assure that there's adequate um, NGO representation uh, in this uh, composition. While it's possible that uh, these ABs may select a conservation rep uh, to be their representative, um, I <laughs> there's no certainty there. But yet, I think um, as uh, we develop our recommendations, um, they have a unique voice that we appreciate uh, hearing from in all of our considerations, but <laughs> in this one, uh, it's it's doubly important. So um, I'm just wondering what we might uh, do there uh, on how to uh, ensure that their input is um, incorporated. So let let me let me hear uh, your thoughts, and we'll go from there. Is that a question for Carl, Marcy? Yes. Okay, Carl. Yeah. So I'm I'm happy to share some thoughts and and welcome thoughts from others. Uh, obviously, as you've pointed out, there are NGO representatives on each of these teams. The motion focuses on raising up fishery voices specifically, but also that each representative um, should be um, nominated from within the advisory body to this Marine Planning Committee, uh, and that each representative should serve as a liaison back to that, that home advisory body, if you will. So the HMS AS representative, whether it's a conservation NGO seat or a, a, an industry seat, should voice uh, the perspective of that full AB in participating in the Marine Planning Committee, uh, serving as that liaison and, and bring the information back for further engagement by that advisory body. And so through this iterative kind of connected process, we, in my vision, have created a targeted, streamlined, nimble group that also connects back to the entire council ecosystem, if you will. Um, so that's the thinking. Uh, I've also, in this motion, asked the composition of this committee, this, this uh, ad hoc committee as stated here today, to come back to us in September with recommendations on how the committee uh, could be, should be augmented. Uh, and that could be uh, a particular comment uh, from the committee itself to the council in September. Uh, the most immediate need from my perspective is engagement in and, and responsibility for tracking the working webinars that are planned for July 22nd and 23rd. And for that, it's, it's the fishing voices, I think, that really need to engage and report back to us. Okay. Thanks, Carr. Um, Carr, your hands up. Uh, was that for to respond to Marcy or is that for a comment by yourself? It was actually for a comment, um, and it, it somewhat relates to uh, Marcy's comment and to Ryan's comment, which is that, you know, this, this committee, if it's 12 people, if it's 13 people, clearly is not going to be able to speak to everything that the council is and everything that the council has concerns about. Um, and so... I think the, the burden will definitely be on this committee to work with council staff to bring in experts as needed to talk with the committee on specific aspects, whether that's a member of the GMT or it's a NIMS staff person who isn't involved in the council process. It's really identification of the needed expertise bringing that expertise to the table to have 
strategic discussions uh, to inform the committee. And, and that is something that I hope will um, happen. Okay, thanks, thanks, Art. Um, Chuck Tracy, Chuck. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I just wanted to circle back. Uh, Sandra or Chris, could you scroll up to numbers two and three there? Um, just wanted to circle back with uh, Phil's question about uh, staff assignments. Um, so, uh, well, uh, from my memory, I think uh, number two started off with uh, 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 there will be a dedicated council staff officer to uh, do these duties. Could, could, could we get scrolled up there? Um, anyway, uh, I guess my, my thoughts there, yeah, there we go, led by a dedicated council staff member. I, I guess my first thought was that GLR council staff officers are dedicated, but, uh, but I'm not sure that's the, the meaning that uh, was implied there. Um, I, you know, and so I, maybe just to explore a little bit, uh, you know, dedicated, uh, as in, uh, dedicated strictly to this, uh, to this topic, uh, I, I would definitely have a problem with that. <clears throat> uh, dedicated as in uh, unchanging uh, um, or uh, as opposed to a sort of a tag team thing. Uh, I, I don't typically like to operate that way. And sometimes you might need that flexibility, but I guess I'm not too concerned with, with that aspect. Um, <clears throat> So, um, yeah, I, I guess I, I do appreciate uh, Phil's uh, comment and, uh, and uh, would like to uh, make sure that it's understood uh, where the council's authority lies uh, regarding council staff. Um, and, and then I guess I would also note that uh, <clears throat> under three, there's maybe a, another as assignment. Um, the council staff lead will build a broader network of dedicated specialists, et cetera. Um, so, <clears throat> um, again, that, uh, so uh, if, if you had just left off lead, I would uh, feel more comfortable because I don't think this necessarily uh, has to be a one person job. Uh, I think the council, my executive director, the deputy director, um, I think, uh, and whoever's might be assigned to uh, to lead this advisory body should it or this effort should it uh, proceed, um, are all people that could uh, contribute to that or take the lead in that, uh, depending on uh, <clears throat> you know uh, who's uh, uh, who you're reaching out to. Uh, sometimes it's, it's appropriate to have uh, staff from different levels making contact with. Uh, with other uh, entities uh, at, at a similar appropriate level, so I guess uh, uh, I guess I guess the bottom line here is that uh, I, do, I do want to make sure that uh, that uh, it's recognized that, uh, that uh, the executive director does have the authority over staff assignments and how uh, how things are accomplished uh, within the staff's purview. Um, what needs to be accomplished, uh, I understand that uh, being direction for the council. Thanks. Okay, thanks Chuck, good points. Um, I see uh, Pete Hasselberg, Pete. Thanks Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I guess this may be um, the executive director, Tracy Chuck just answered my question, but, uh, and, and I guess I'm gonna be a stickler for some of the rules here. Chuck, as I was looking through the existing ad hoc committees, we, we don't list um, staff as part of any of that membership. And I, I'm just trying to think back through the process when we've created them in the past, we simply leave it to you um, in your duties, just like an advisory body meeting, a, a sub panel meeting or anything else that you find the ways to, to staff um, 
those committees or those various um, bodies for us. And, and that's part of your duties. And I think that's what you're saying. Is that correct? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Mr. Hastner, that's correct. All right. Yeah, and, and I, and I well, maybe if I could just continue. I, I guess I didn't quite read this as if if you, if you were questioning whether the staff officer would be part a member of the committee. Uh, I guess I was not. If that was your question, not, I'm not sure if it was, but I, I guess no. I don't quite read that uh, being the case in, in how the motion's phrased. It, correct, uh, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. If I might continue, that that wasn't my question. It was just. Um, after the council, if it were to create or when they create an ad hoc committee, then as that committee is put in place, how the process continues. So you clarified that. I, I guess maybe I'm just foreshadowing a <laughs> possible amendment here. And so to also be a bit of a, a stickler on the rules, um, you know, I appreciate all the thoroughness and the work that's gone into this, but. Um, a question for Karen, uh, the maker of the motion, scrolling back down to the composition uh, or the, the um, that, that part right there. Um, the, under number one, the last part of that, um, I understand and, and I, I think I see the rationale for two care uh, co-chairs and where they come from. But again, that's, it's just a slight deviation from our process and, and it's a good thing we're virtual. Nobody can throw anything at me for bringing this up. But they're, they're selected from among the members um, by the, the committee and reading our um, operating procedures. Again, the, there's a, a, a process, names are brought up, but it's the responsibility of the chair of the council to appoint um, co-chairs or a chair and a vice chair. So maybe uh, the question there is, was there consideration as to how this would proceed? And I, I'm not thinking about, you know, going through a big process there, but as and looking up at under A, how that goes, there are the advisory bodies would nominate representatives, the chair would appoint them through that process, then the advisory bodies or appointees could also make that recommendation to the chair um, and, and we can still keep that uh, responsibility with the chair. And again, thinking of that, it's just not creating a situation where we, you know, weaken the effectiveness of our operating procedures by, by allowing deviations from it. So I, I think there was a question there. If any thought to that, um, or is it possible to consider a, a different way of doing that? Uh, through the through the vice chair, I I would be um, very amenable to an adjustment there. Thank you, and uh, Mr. Vice Chair. I see there's another hand up, but I was ready to. Um, uh, propose an amendment to this motion. Um, okay. Um, Phil stayed his hand down, so um, I think we'd be amenable to that, Pete. All right. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I'll go through this, uh, Sandra, or whoever's typing um, this up. So we need to scroll to the top so I can read the first part. Um, let's see, a little higher than that. Back to the top. Top or the issue about there um, under composition. So I move to amend the motion by number or first under item number two composition, strike the first sentence in that paragraph. A secondly, under number three, and I'll pause 
sentences while I read count sentences. In the second sentence, strike the word lead after the word staff. And third, now we have to scroll down to the bottom of this so I can read, apologize. Uh, keep going down. Under the section uh, one ad hoc committee makeup of item 1D, F or I'll strike the phrase selected from among members by the full AH MPC and replace it with the word appointed. You can have you please repeat that last part. Sure. Replace with the word appointed. Okay, Pete. Uh, it's in place. Um, let the that language accurately reflect your motion. Give me one second to read it. Um, the part there, second, under number three, um, that function in the second, strike that function in the second sentence. I think they were capturing my rambling. Under number three, strike the word lead after staff. I think it's clear where that is. Under section. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And um, looking for a second. Second by, by uh, Mark Rolick. Mark Rolick. Okay. Um, Pete, do you wish to uh, speak to your motion? Uh, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, this, I, I shouldn't have to, but I think those changes just better reflect our operations, um, how we do things, and um, in, the, in the case of the first part of that, less prescriptive in terms of what the, um, uh, the staff does and, and lead leaving that to the discretion of the executive director. And lastly, again, on the, on the last point about selection of a chair, of co-chairs or a chair and vice chair, um, simply not to um, diminish the power of our operating procedures by deviating them, but use the process we have. And I don't think this is gonna set up a longer meeting process that I fully trust that if the, under the um, guidance of the advisory body or the nominees and making that, that uh, our chair could make those appointments external of a council meeting that we wouldn't have to go through a process to do that um, because that would be done after, at some point after the appointments were made by the chair. That, that concludes it, thanks. Okay, next speak. Um, questions uh, for the maker of the amendment to the motion? Uh, Phil Anderson, Phil? Yeah, thanks, uh, Pete, for the amendment, and uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. I wondered if we could ask 
Sandra, just to scroll up a bit here, just so I can, uh, let's first go up to, to number one under her, uh, number two right there. So just so, so if this motion passed, that first sentence under number two would be stricken. And so that's what would be left. Um, and um, so there's there's no there's no uh, mention of the uh, council staff participation in the composition the way that would be left. Um, and and so I understand that. So if we could scroll down now and or see where that. Uh, not, not quite that far, uh, under number three. Um, so is it, the, is, is it in the fourth line there after the word staff, where it says, in addition, the council staff lead will build, is it, I'm trying to understand what, what which, is that where that was stricken? That's a question for Pete. Is, do I have that right? Uh, yes, that is correct. And um, that was done after I had heard uh, um, Executive Director Tracy explanation and um, discussion about that point that um, it, um, I guess it was descriptive of what staff could be, be, but did not describe it as a lead in the process. And my concern there, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, my concern there is it really didn't change. To, to, it didn't get us to where I thought we needed to be because now it says the council staff will build a broader, so it's left totally up to the council staff the way it reads which is not much different than where it was. And I think the point here was that um, the executive director um, will assist in building a broader network, blah, blah, blah. So, and then the executive director then of course has the purview to assign, assign a staff member to fulfill that function. So I'm, I'm not comfortable that we got there with that with the wording of that portion of the amendment. Okay. And um, I would need to consult with uh, Ms. Dr. Hansen on um, the appropriate uh, approach to make that change through an amendment to the amendment, if that is the way to do that. Dave? Uh, Dave, you're muted. Hi, Mr. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, uh, I had a communication from, uh, from Dave uh, earlier this afternoon that he had, uh, he had a something he had to deal with and could be stepping out. It's possible he left his connection open and is still uh, still unavailable. Um, so if that's the case, I, uh, I guess uh, maybe stepping into that role uh, for a bit. I, I think that uh, Mr. Anderson is correct in his assumption that, it, that uh, we would need to amend the amendment. Uh, I think that would be the proper uh, channel here. Okay. Um, Mr. Vice Chair, if I may, before I do such a thing, I would like to uh, request that we hear from the maker of the motion. Uh, I see that uh, Dr. Brady has her hand up and I, I don't want to make matters worse here. Okay. So. Um, uh, Cart? Thank you. I just got a frog in my throat. <clears> throat> um, I, I 
just wanted to offer an observation that the sentence, and, and I don't oppose an amendment here at all, um, the sentence does include the phrase as appropriate and as needed within it, which are relief phrases to a mandate. Um, but I think if the, the phrase or the word consider building a broader network were included, it might add additional flexibility, but keep the concept here, which is that there is a rich community of experts who could be brought in strategically to work with the committee. That's all. Thanks, Carl. Um, uh, Heather, I see your hand up. Oh, thank you, Vice Chair. I, I just wanted I'm I'm I might be um, understanding this a little bit differently, and I I think the point that I understood Chuck to make is that where we went wrong in this motion is by using the words the council staff because we don't tell the council staff what to do, the executive director does. And so potentially what I thought I heard Phil say is that the way to keep the intent here, but to be more appropriate is to say the executive director will build a broader network. And I'd, I'm not making a motion or anything because I don't know the rules and like, I don't want to, uh, <laughs> make a further mess of it, but I just wanted to throw that out there to make sure I'm understanding, uh, you know, how to correct this so we're not uh, okay. asking people to do things we don't have the authority to, to do. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. Oh, thanks, thanks Heather. Uh, and uh, Phil Anderson. Phil? Yeah, thanks, um, Mr. Vice Chair. I am going to propose an amendment to the amendment. Okay. Uh, but I can't do it unless <laughs> I know it. Sorry, Sandra, I got to look at the, at, and I'm on number three. I'm right where you were. Um, I, I would, uh, I would move to amend the amendment. in number three function second sentence delete the word the council staff and replace it with the committee and if there's any confusion it means the ad hoc ring planning committee is, is what's referenced there. Okay. So it's a committee function. The council is a part of the committee. The council staff person working on it is part of the committee, but it is the committee that with all the caveats that the current mayor of the motion put in the sentence. Um, I'm speaking to my motion. I'm out of, I'm, I'm, I shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> but I'll leave it there. It's My amendment is to delete the word, the council, the words, the council staff, and replace it with the AH dash committee. Okay, very good. Um, so language is good. So a second, seconded by Card Brady, and uh, I believe you've spoken to it. Uh, Phil, anything else you want to say? Nope. Okay. <laughs> uh, discussion. Questions for the maker of the amendment to the amended motion or to the amendment to the motion? Okay. I get it's all laid out. Okay. All those in favor to the amendment to the um, amended to the amendment, um, amended by Phil Anderson, uh, <laughs> signified by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, now the amendment uh, to the amendment uh, passes. Unanimously. Okay, 
So now we're back to the, um, um, the amended motion that, uh, that Pete put out that's been amended. And um, I would say there's a further discussion on that uh, amended, amended motion. Krista Swinson. Thank you, Vice Chair. I just want to say that I'm in support. I appreciate the conversation and the thought that has gone into the motion as it was originally produced, um, but also for the conversation, the questions, and the discussion that's gone around refining it here on the council floor. I also want to say thank you to all of the public and the advisory bodies who didn't just say, okay, they they're interested, but not uh, moving forward, so we'll drop it. They kept on um, bringing this forward, and um, I'm excited that we have, hopefully, if we all agree, or most of us agree, have um, something that we can work towards in a timely fashion. I am appreciative that this is timely in terms of the approach, and I am also appreciative that it is a known time commitment for those that are asked to serve on this committee, um, both in the, in the two-year component, but also that that gives us a chance to review as a council in timely intervals. And I lastly just want to say I'm appreciative that we have included a wide range of stakeholders. Um, but that we have not got such a large group that it will be difficult, I think, in terms of scheduling for the committee because time will be of essence, not just in forming the committee, but in responding to issues as they come up. And with that, I will close my remarks. Thank you. Um, thank you, Krista, but uh, a little premature um, because uh, our next vote is gonna be to uh, amend, uh, accept Pete's uh, amendment that's been amended uh, to the original motion. So well, I'm in favor of that too. So there you have it. Very good. Marcy, you're go. Marcy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. I'm glad that you just reminded us where we were because I, <laughs> I wasn't sure. Um, I would like to speak on the main motion when we get back there. So I'll hold my, my remarks until then. Thanks. Okay. Well, very good. Um, well, with that, I'm going to call for the question on the uh, pizza amendment to the uh, to the motion. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Um, the motion passed unanimously, which takes us to the original, uh, to Karen's original amended, which uh, a motion which has now been amended a couple times. And um, Marcy, do you wish to speak to the main motion? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And um... If you'll indulge me, I apologize. I do have another amendment. Um, going up to, to number two, composition, uh, add a sentence at the end. It says one conservation representative would be recommended by conservation representatives presently serving on existing council advisory bodies. Then down on, I guess it's down on number, scroll down, please. Keep going. But there we go, under the makeup. Um, uh, change 12 to 13 in item one. Uh, 
and then I guess it so I guess we can just put make this an, an E below that would be conservation representative and then uh, parentheses one recommended by conservation representatives presently serving on existing council advisory bodies. Thank you. Okay, I guess um, Chris needs to uh, pull this together into a, a motion so we can look at it. Um, Chuck, I see your hand up. You have a question? Thanks, Mr. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Just wanted to, before we get too far down the road here, I just oh, scroll back up, please. Just wanted to make sure that. That's okay. I just don't want to usurp the chair's prerogative of appointing the conservation representative. So I just want to see if recommended. Uh, yeah, I, I suppose that's parallel construction with nominated by appropriate well, Department of Fish and Wildlife representative, I suppose that's okay. I think I'm okay with that. Thanks for your patience. Mr. Vice Chair, I do have a suggestion to maybe make it a little about selected among, selected from among. Uh, uh, that would be my suggestion to Ms. Remco if she wants to consider it. That works for me. Chuck's suggestion works for you, or what you have before you um, works for you? His alternative phrasing of, so instead of would be recommended by, I think you said selected from. Is that what you suggested, Chuck? Yeah, selected from among. From conservation among, representatives yes. presently serving on existing advisory bodies. Marcy, can you please confirm that? Yeah, yes. One conservation representative would be selected from among conservation representatives presently serving on existing council advisory bodies. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Out of curiosity, if I could ask the maker of the motion, um, does that preclude a, um, a conservation representative uh, representing one of the advisory bodies? Uh, thank you for waiting for a second. <laughs> okay. Second by Ryan Wolf, I believe. Yeah, sorry, I had a question. question. Okay, right. I, I just want to be clear here before we get too far down the road. I, I thought we were already at 13 members um, based on this motion that we had previously amended to add the NIMS representative. So wouldn't this be 14? 
More seat. Great point. I, um, I, yes, thank you. I would have said yes, but it's your motion, so. <laughs> I, I did say yes. Yes, the yeah. the membership was at 13, and now it is at 14. Gotcha. Proposed to be 14. Okay. Okay, Marcy, does the uh, motion accurately, uh, on the screen accurately, accurately reflect, um, the language accurately reflect your motion? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Do you wish to speak to? Um... Ye yes, I do. Um, I think. Uh, I, I appreciate the response uh, that Karen offered us uh, with regard to her, um, to my initial question about NGO representation. And um, while, yes, the group could come back to us later and recommend that they add additional um, uh, gaps or fill additional gaps uh, after they have convened. Um, I'm sorry. I I, I need. I, I should ask for a second. It's my bad. Um, uh, Michael Clark, you have a question? Can um, can Michael uh, second a motion? Let's see. Question for Chuck. Yes. He... Okay. Yes. Yes, he can. He just can't vote on it. I just, I just want to make sure. So, okay, Marcy, I'm sorry. Uh, if you could uh, proceed. Sure. Um, I, I appreciate Karen's thinking uh, on the topic, and that she she had identified a, a possible uh, solution, in that um, the committee would um, look to its gaps and how uh, they might be filled uh, as the process develops, but. Um, I'm mindful that in our earliest discussions on this topic, um, we heard very loud and clear from our existing uh, conservation reps that this issue was uh, very important to them. And uh, I know that we certainly have um, conservation reps on each of our advisory bodies with specific expertise uh, in each of the uh, fishery FMPs that they sit on. But I do feel like um, when the advisory bodies get together and decide who uh, they're going to wish to represent them uh, on this committee, um, that there is a very strong likelihood that the selection will be a fishery sector representative. And I think uh, we heard Karen speak to that uh, in her response to my question in that, um, the the goal was for fishery uh, sector representatives, wh while we're looking to select a diverse group of them, um, this is their opportunity uh, to um, serve and uh, dive into this subject matter uh, on behalf of their uh, respective committee. So um, I do feel that it's important that um, because the likelihood will be that fishery representatives will be selected, that we make sure that this particular community um, has um, a seat at this table, um, acknowledging again that they were instrumental in um, raising the awareness and the need for the council to engage uh, in this topic. So with that, I propose that we add um, one, conservation member from uh, the existing uh, folks that are serving on our advisory bodies. And uh, I thought that um, they could get together and provide um, a recommendation and then that would inform um, a selection uh, by the council chair as described in the language on the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, Louisa. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and, and thank you for the motion, Marcy. It is, I, th I think, a good way to go. It's very considerate. I do want to say, however, that the very person that started this up, I will give much credit to uh, and got me to uh, push uh, this whole process back in September, uh, will be on the council for uh, uh, in September, 
and we'll certainly be involved. So I'm sure she'll appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Louie. Okay, for the discussion. Okay, and um, I'll call. I'll call. Um, I'll call for the question. Uh, all those in favor on uh, the amendment to the amended motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. <laughs> um, abstentions? I believe the motion passes, but I'm not sure how many were in no. Chuck? Uh, I, I did not, uh, I heard for sure one voice. I don't know if there's more than one and I don't know who the one voice was. Um, it, I, perhaps if you voted no, you could just raise your hand for uh, more. Yep, did sure. anybody else vote no? Apparently. Okay. There we go. Okay, and now um, we will go to the uh, original motion that's been amended a, a couple times here now. Any further discussion on uh, Karin's original motion um, it's before you? Seeing that, I'll call for the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, that one passes unanimously. Whew. Okay. Um, with that, um, I was asked if there's any further discussion on this agenda item. Thank you. Oh, Butch Smith, Butch. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I, I, I um, glad we did this. I. Thank the council for all their hard work, but uh, from being from a coastal fishing community and uh, having, you know, virtually the the people to lose the most not originally invited to the table is troublesome. Um, you know, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And I think somewhat this might have been the case. This didn't go so smooth eight, nine years ago when this was you know, back on, back on the, on back then. And it's already started out not going so smooth now. So I, I think this, um, committee, um, at the very least is going to have to be respectfully forceful and hit the ground running. So we're not all on the menu because nowhere in the ocean off the West coast, you, set one of those things or 600 of those things to cover one Bonneville dam, are you not going to accept, uh, affect somebody's fisheries? Um, and so I just would like to remind the, the council of that and the committee of that. And, and I don't have a very good taste in my mouth from eight, nine, 10 years ago uh, from this process. And so um, once again, I want to thank Carmen and all the hard work by the, by the committee, but I think this committee um, is going to have to be pretty forceful to kick open that door and 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 be heard. Um, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, for the opportunity. Thank you, Butch. Okay. For the thoughts, discussion? All right. With that, um, Todd, I'll look to you. If we've a complete, or uh, Carrie, I mean, to, to find, uh, how we're doing here. Uh, yeah, I'm still here. Um, if there are no other motions or discussion or guidance, um, then, you know, the council has heard lots of discussion and advisory body reports um, and, uh, and the state report and the director's report. So, um, you know, you, you've provided the motion. It took a while to work through it, but it's pretty clear. And um, so, you know, I think that, if there's nothing else, you have completed your duties for this agenda item, which was to review activity and provide guidance in their process and schedule for future um, council engagement. Well, very good. Well, thank you everyone for their uh, hard work and diligence and patience. And uh, we got through it and we gained 
most of our time back, but not quite all. With that, um, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to uh, hand the gavel back to you. Uh, thank you very much, Vice Chair Pettinger. Well, we do have one other item today. Uh, it's an administrative item, but at uh, quarter to six, it seems rather late in the day to start a new uh, a new agenda item. So I think what we will do is break uh, for uh, the evening, and um, and then tomorrow we'll pick up with the regional operating agreement. We may or may not have a short closed session after that tomorrow. I guess we'll have to think about that overnight. Uh, and then we'll go on to the rest of the agenda for day last. Um, does that make sense, Executive Director Tracy? Yes, Mr. Chair. All right. Any last words from anyone? Okay, 